Chapter 28 of Autobiography, Memories, and Experiences, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography, Memories, and Experiences, Volume 2, by Moncure Conway. Chapter 28, Part 1. Discussions in London Concerning Slavery and the Negro My Testimonies Concerning Slavery A Disclosure About the Confederacy Commemoration of John Brown Thackeray George Cruikshank Charles Dickens My Journalistic Work The Shakespeare Tercentenary at Stratford-on-Avon Howard Staunton Mrs. Shakespeare's Second Marriage Illness and Death of Our Child, Emerson Excursions on the Continent A Visit to Dr. Strauss Chervenus A Week at Ostend Residence at Notting Hill Professor Carnes J. S. Mill Helen Taylor The Paradoxical Ideas of Carlyle on Slavery impressive by reason of his absolute veracity and remoteness from the partisan arena were quoted by men not free from partisanship one sunday evening i was taken by tom hughes to a room where the elder macmillan received his friends conversation began on the american situation and some participants spoke to me sharply thereupon hughes broke out on my assailant with a severity from which the company could not recover herbert spencer said to me in a low voice a good many intelligent people do not hold the same views of the negro and his position as those of the abolitionists i was invited to join the newly formed anthropological society and did so but found that it was led by a few ingenious gentlemen whose chief interest was to foster contempt of the negro one of these dr james hunt published a pamphlet entitled the negro's place in nature huxley pointed out to me privately the fallacies of hunt and i made speeches in the anthropological society but it became plain to me that anti-slavery sentiment in england was by no means so deep as i had supposed i felt certain that I could name half a dozen great English writers, read and honored throughout America, who by a public declaration could have shamed our government out of its pretexts for not dealing genuinely with its only real enemy, slavery. With the hope of effecting something in this direction, I wrote the book printed at the end of 1863, Testimonies Concerning Slavery. From this work, never published in America, and long out of print, I quote a paragraph of the introduction. I have long believed that the friends of liberty can help America much more by rekindling their old watchfires, which sadly need fuel, than by advocating this or that measure or man that may be for the time associated with the struggle. What America needs now is not a sultry indulgence, but a bracing criticism always supposing that criticism to be made in the interest of liberty and not of slavery. It is related that at the federal repulse at Charleston, a negro who bore the flag crawled a long distance amid a storm of shot and shell, dragging his wounded body, but still holding up the flag. When he regained his companions, his only words were, I did not let it, the flag, touch the ground once. Let the voices of all true men keep it ever before the rulers of America, that her banner is far nobler, so long as a negro holds it up with devotion, as too pure to touch the ground, than if it should wave over every fort and city of the South, tainted with compromise or soiled with slavery. I had privately told this story of the negro and the flag to Browning, and he told me he had repeated it in several companies, I afterwards regretted having printed it, for Browning would probably have made it into a lyric. John Bright was pleased with my testimonies, and did much to promote its circulation. Indeed, all of my personal friends were satisfied with it. 
It was the best I could do at such a distance from America, and under circumstances that rendered it impossible to correspond with my friends in Virginia. But I do not now read the book with satisfaction. It contains a chapter on the Negro, which I sometimes think of reprinting. But so far as the war is concerned, the book by no means represents the conclusions reached by studying facts afterwards revealed. While writing my testimonies, I received the following. Sir, I have not the honor of your acquaintance, and therefore my signature would be of no value. The substance of this note, however, may be important to you. A short time since the representative of the southern states in Europe submitted to the governments of France and England propositions for the practical abolition of slavery, on condition of recognition and material assistance, viz., that the children of slaves born after a given period should be free. This, which is the only possible way of abolition, may now be withdrawn, but the information may be useful to you, and I therefore enclose it. Yours truly, Libertas. I paid little attention to this anonymous note, but it was recently recalled to me by a manuscript in possession of the Du Bellay family, Paris. Mr. Du Bellay, whose widow, named Moncure, is my relative, was a native of New Orleans and a barrister. He happened to be in France in 1861, and though holding no commission from the Confederacy, devoted himself to its interests in Europe, his command of French enabling him to assist the Confederate agents. Mr. Du Bellay left a narrative of negotiations in Paris at that time, shown me by his family. Of Mr. Du Bellay I never heard until thirty years after the war, but he records that he urged upon Slidell in Paris, and on other foreign agents of the Confederacy, the necessity of immediate emancipation. He also wrote to the Confederate government in Richmond, declaring that as the war would certainly end slavery, even were the South victorious, they should at once utilize emancipation. On December 2, 1863, a public meeting convened by the Emancipation Society was held in the Whittington Club Hall to commemorate the fourth anniversary of the execution of John Brown. The chair was taken by William Mallison, who, in his opening speech, related the mythical story that on his way to the scaffold, Brown stopped and gave a kiss to a little Negro girl. The meeting had been convened to listen to an address from myself, and this was published by the Society. In it I said, Brown's plan was the best his eye could scan, but it would only have done in Virginia what he had already done in Kansas, free a few slaves. But God's plan was a different one from that. It included the placing of the angel justice side by side with the fiend oppression, that the world should see them ere the foot of the one was planted on the neck of the other. I am now certain that no god had anything to do with the affair except the phantasmal god of war worshipped by Brown, and that the biblical captain who revived that deified wrath inflicted on America's sequels of slavery worse than the disease. Bayard Taylor told me that he once visited the studio of Baron Marochetti with Thackeray, who pointed to a sculpture of St. George and the Dragon, and said, Every man has his dragon. Mine is dining out. What's yours? The same, replied Taylor. Carlyle, who had known Thackeray from his youth, told me that at times he, Thackeray, having some urgent work on hand, escaped from invitations, callers, and letters, and went off from his house without leaving any address. One night a messenger came to him, Carlyle, from a public house nearby, with a request from Thackeray for the loan of a Bible. I sometimes saw Thackeray. His hair was so white that I supposed him old until it was announced at his death that he was only fifty-two. The death of Thackeray, December 24, 1863, caused universal distress. The day of his burial at Kensal Green Cemetery, December 30th, was beautiful, and a large throng surrounded his grave. Starting out on foot for the cemetery, I overtook George Cruikshank, whom I well knew, and we walked together. 
he was much shocked at the death of his friend, for there had been no premonitions. Thackeray had cheerfully bid his family good night. In the early morning his servant entered his room and placed beside him the usual cup of coffee. Entering later, he noticed the coffee untouched. Thackeray died of an effusion on a brain that weighed fifty-eight and one-fourth ounces, the average weight of the masculine brain being less than four pounds. George Cruikshank received my compliments for his vigor at seventy-two, with his usual discourse on the advantages of teetotalism. He was a small, thick-set man, with a pale face so singular that it might have been strikingly homely if it had not been intellectual and benevolent. I am getting to know this road well, very well, he said. Many a fine fellow has been buried at Kensal Green, but never a finer or a truer than make peace Thackeray. How little did they know the man who thought him a hard, cold, and cutting blade. He was much more like a sensitive, loving little girl. I never was more impressed than at this moment with Cruikshank's genius for seeing. His phrase interpreted certain lines under Thackeray's eyes, lines of wondrous tenderness, as if their light were flowing out to all in whom he looked. Here is one picture I have in my mind of him, said Cruikshank. He was coming from Ireland across the channel, with his wife and children, one an infant. There was a fearful storm all night, and the channel horribly rough, and Mrs. Thackeray was seized with a brain fever, and through all that terrible night, from shore to shore, sat Thackeray, motionless, bearing the infant in one arm, sustaining the wife with the other, utterly unconscious of the prevailing terror, for there was danger. His poor wife never recovered from brain fever, and was worse than lost to him forever. Cruikshank had been Thackeray's teacher when the author aspired to be an artist, but, he said, he had not the patience to be an artist with pencil or brush. I used to tell him that to be an artist was to burrow along like a mole, heaving up a little mound here and there for a long distance. He said he thought he would presently break out into another element and stay there. Cruikshank spoke of his venture in 1841, The Omnibus, of which Lehman Blanchard was editor and Thackeray the chief contributor. It would be more pleasing to think of Thackeray as resting by the side of Douglas Gerald, but Gerald was not buried at Kensal Green. I remember well the day when we were standing beside the grave of the poor suicide Lehman Blanchard at Clapham Way, and Gerald said he wished to be buried at a spot hard by, which he pointed out, and there he was buried. Poor Blanchard. Cruikshank did not go on with his memory of Lehman Blanchard, who, unable to recover from the shock of his wife's death, killed himself two months after it, February 15, 1845 for at this time the hearse passed us, and my companion's lip quivered and his eye grew moist. John Leach came up. The two artists looked into one another's eyes and shook hands, but no word passed. Nearly every literary man in London was present. I particularly remarked the emotion of Charles Dickens. After the funeral I walked away with Robert Browning, and we were presently joined by Dickens, to whom the poet introduced me. Dickens warmly admired Browning, and I was told he once said to a friend that he would rather have written Colombe's birthday than any of his novels. As my road lay in another direction, I mounted an omnibus and sat beside the driver, who inquired if Charles Dickens had been at the funeral, adding, I would just like to see that man. When I told him Dickens had passed on ahead, he lashed his horses, but Dickens had disappeared, and Browning was with Tom Taylor, but the driver was partly consoled by seeing the author of his favorite play, The Ticket of Leave Man. Dickens was a wonder. The more I saw of London, the more I loved and honored the London Dante who had invested it with romance and peopled its streets and alleys with spirits, so that the huge city could never more be seen without his types and shadows. He had his limitations, no doubt. Had he been born in France, where genius is free to deal with every side of human life, Dickens might have been greater. To me he remained the chief marvel of his time, 
I felt some satisfaction in telling him that Oliver Twist, Little Nell, and other children of his had been far back in the forties our beloved friends in a Virginian village of which he had never heard, that I had myself lost my position as a model schoolboy and been flogged for jumping out of the school window and playing truant in order to see him alight from the stagecoach in Fredericksburg and that his description of the fearful roads by which he journeyed thither hastened the building of a railway of dickens readings no description can convey any adequate impression he was in himself a whole stock company he seemed to be physically transformed as he passed from one character to another he had as many distinct voices as his books had characters he held at command the fountains of laughter and tears Dickens' voice, in its every disguise, was of such quality that it reached all of those thousands in St. James Hall, and he stood before us as a magician. When he sat down it was not more applause that followed, but a passionate outburst of love for the man. Dickens was a unique man. He had graduated from Grub Street to the palace, and his writings insinuated themselves equally into the hearts of rich and poor learned and literate the year eighteen sixty four had opened happily for wife and myself the mason incident had cleared away and letters came from america full of the old friendship my testimonies concerning slavery was circulating largely and also my article on benjamin banneker the negro astronomer reprinted from the atlantic monthly by the ladies emancipation society my congregation was rapidly growing our means increasing we found our best amusement in strolling along the quaint shops and through the zoological gardens with our two children my journalistic work was not under orders but selected by myself my duties were thus always congenial and at times delightful for one week in the april of eighteen sixty four i moved in an enchanted land it was at stratford-on-avon during the celebration of the tercentenary of shakespeare that poet with all his miracles hardly imagined more beautiful masks than those amid which we moved during those fair days a grand pavilion for theatrical performances had been raised vast tents for concerts and a gallery containing all the great shakespearean subjects ever painted with the thirty famous portraits of the poet all these were open for the throng of pilgrims from every part of europe who day by day nay hour by hour were charmed away from the hard contemporary world of ferdinand and miranda by the pageants of prospero now we were listening to the songs of shakespeare set to music of the early english composers then to mendelssohn's sommer nachstrom one night we laughed at buckstone's andrew agucheek on another saw beautiful stella colis shine on juliet's balcony like a star and every night some exquisite play the grand old mayor flower at the hill his son charles at avonbank near the church and his son edgar in the village kept open house there were daily banquets pretty barges laden with pretty ladies floated among the swans on the avon excursions were made to anne hathaway's cottage and to charlecote hill scene of the legendary deer stocking incident there was a grand dinner with a shakespeare text for every dish and wine and toast there were five discourses about shakespeare in the old church by bishops trench and wordsworth and finally there was as magnificent a fancy dress ball as was ever known everyone being in a shakespearean character the gentry from all warwickshire and from other counties and many from london france germany were present and the dance went on till dawn during all this festival i sat in the ancient red lion inn for a large part of each night save when on duty as malvolio at the ball surrounded by the relics of washington irving writing my description of the wondrous affair for harper's monthly a daily letter was due to the morning star in london one or two to the commonwealth in boston but i found writing a joy and grudged every moment that sleep claimed from my real dreamland 
I made during the fete the acquaintance of Howard Staunton, the acute editor of Shakespeare, and almost the only unbiased critical investigator into the personal life of the poet. Staunton was then about fifty, with a ruddy English color and clear-cut features. His step was elastic, his movement quick, and being myself a good walker, we enjoyed rambles together. I told him how much I had valued his standard work on chess, but he had long given up the game. It not only took up too much time, he said, but I found that it demoralized players. Men have hated me and said mean things about me merely because I beat them at chess. Staunton had long before reached the conclusion I had just come to that Shakespeare's widow had married Richard James, but I warned him that if he touched the romantic sentiment investing Anne Hathaway, he might suffer as much as if he had beaten the accepted writers at chess. We examined the register of burials in the church, and felt certain that the carefully bracketed names were those of one and the same person. August 8, Mrs. Shakespeare, Anne Uxor Ricardi James. The register, it is said, is not the original one, but this only makes it more certain that the copy is exact, for at a later time no one would have ventured to bracket the wife of Shakespeare with another Anne, and certainly no clergyman or clerk would have omitted to add Uxor Guglielmi Shakespeare to his widow's name, while being so particular about the wife of one Richard James. Staunton had made a search in the old town records after the James family, and found that it was a well-known name, but belonged to people of much lower position than the Shakespeare's. He had found one item which suggested to him that the Richard James whom Shakespeare's widow married was a Stratford shoemaker and a pious ranter. Staunton invited me to visit him at his house in London, where he would show me the notes he had made on the matter. But I was prevented from doing so, and he died not long after. But knowing well the exactness of Staunton, I have adhered to his theory, of which, indeed, I find some confirmation in Shakespeare's dislike of Puritanism, and still more in the epitaph of his daughter, Mrs. Hall. No such words would have been inscribed on her grave had she not been among Pharisaic people. Witty above her sex, but that's not all. Wise to salvation was good Mistress Hall. Something of Shakespeare was in that, but this wholly of him with whom she's now in bliss. End of chapter 8, part 1「Chapter twenty eight part two of Autobiography Memories and Experiences Volume two This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography Memories and Experiences Volume two by Moncure Conway Chapter twenty eight my return from the fairyland beside the Avon was into a cloud. I found my wife sitting with anxiety beside our little Emerson. Knowing how important was the fulfillment of my contract as commissioner of the Morning Star at Stratford, she had not telegraphed me of the child's illness, the sequel of measles, not immediately dangerous. My wife was a believer in homeopathy, and our invalid was attended by Dr. James John Garth Wilkinson, well known in our Concord circle by his book, The Human Body and Its Connection with the Human Soul. He was a grand sort of man, with a powerful will, and his devotion to the child gained our gratitude. It was a long illness, but some improvement came in May, and our doctor advised us to go into the country. We went to Wimbledon, where our friends, Mr. and Mrs. Henry Whitehead, took us as ledgers in their charming homestead, Warren Farm. Here, Emerson steadily improved, and we had fair prospect that he would recover. But where is there any escape from man's supplement to nature's destructiveness? Near the middle of July, 
the military review and rifle practice began at Wimbledon, and the cottagers were given notice to leave. We concluded to try Brighton, but the change was fatal. Oh, how we nursed that child! My wife was nearly worn out. Night after night I paced the room with my sweet child in my arms. As the homeopathic doctor in Brighton had been a personal friend of the Reverend F. W. Robertson, I supposed him competent. But what was my horror at his intimation that he had consulted the spirits about the remedies? Here were we, Ellen and I, haters of war, who could not be left in our quiet Wimbledon Vale by the infernal bullets, and with all our dislike of spiritualism, had fallen into the hands of a spiritualist physician. In the evening before the morning of burial, my wife desired some flowers, and I went out to buy them. It was late, and I could find no florist shop open, but there was one grand establishment where I supposed I could find residents who would promise to let me have the flowers very early in the morning. A large glass conservatory was lighted, and I hurried to the door and knocked. Knocked again and louder. There was no answer, and straining my eyes against the glass of doors and windows, I found that the seeming illumination was all from the street lamps outside. Within was silence and emptiness. A dread came upon me. Was I looking into little Emerson's grave and finding that all the bright hopes, all the visions of immortal life, were but projections from earthly lamps on emptiness? Somehow, I felt that in the illusion under which I had fairly battered at the door, there was a sort of mockery. In the early morning, between seven and eight o'clock, I went out and managed to get the white flowers. I find a note by my wife. Saturday, 6th of August, we placed his body in the ground near F. W. Robertson, on a high hill overlooking the sea, and a little stone cross above, twined with ivy. So even then we were trying to cling to the cross. Ralph Waldo Emerson had once called on us, after we had a house in Concord, and seeing my two sons, he said of his namesake, Little Emerson is beautiful and winning, but I think you will get more satisfaction out of the elder boy, Eustace. So it proved. The words of Shylock are far-reaching. The curse never fell upon our race till now. I never felt it till now. I had caught a glimpse of sullen spite in nature, glaring through her veil of violets and tinted skies. It was not merely the child's premature death that was unpardonable, but the prolonged, cruel incidents of it. The sweet little one, he was nearly three years of age, did not indeed suffer much physical pain from the hydrocephalus that caused his death, but during the four months preceding death, August 4th, he was so sadly puzzled by his inability to walk, the cessation of our merry strolls. I hear now his little voice saying, I wish I could get well, or seeing our distress, Kiss me, kiss me again, Mama. Day by day, hour by hour, the child was more and more deeply entwined with our heartstrings. And poor little Eustace, in his sixth year, who had so petted Emerson, wandered about helplessly. My vacation began with August, and we started off with our one child for a tour. We went to Paris and tried to forget our grief amid the manifold beauties of the city. We passed over to Germany and Switzerland. The thin and worn condition of my wife, which had been giving me anxiety, 
began to disappear, but we really found no consolation for our hearts. We could only weep silently together. I received a letter from Browning in which he said, If I, who cannot restore your child, would, he who can, will. It made us both love the poet more, but our visions of immortality must have unconsciously grown dim. I had with me a letter from Dr. Brabant of Bath to Strauss, and to meet him we visited Heilbronn. It was welcomed by Strauss and his attractive daughter. He had for some time been separated from his wife, a brilliant but incompatible actress. We went on a long walk beside the Neckar, and he inquired about Parker, Emerson, and the English liberals. I asked him whether he knew of any work worth reading concerning immortality. He said, after some reflection, No, it appears to me a purely anthropological problem. And on that point, no more was said. Strauss was in his fifty-sixth year. There was, as yet, no gray in his dark hair. His features were fine his mouth especially delicate, as if related to his sweet voice, his dark eyes candid and tender. He pointed out to me, near an ancient church, traces of the holy fountain which gave Heilbronn its name. He said, with his gentle smile, The theory of the priests is that the fountain ceased to flow when I came here to reside. After my memorable day and evening with Strauss, we travelled to Heidelberg to visit Gervinus, whose English was fluent enough to enable me to enjoy his conversation at the breakfast to which he invited me. We reached Frankfurt on Goethe's birthday, and found the city decorated. We explored the Goethe birthhouse, a museum, and tried to forget our pain amid the festivities. We enjoyed our sail on the Rhine under a beautiful sky. We visited grand cathedrals and art galleries in Germany and Belgium, and on the last day of August, 1864, arrived at Ostend. Finding our London friends, Mr. and Mrs. William Neal, and their little son Harold for our child to play with, we remained a week at Ostend. I there wrote a sermon for the formidable day when I must again stand before my sympathizing congregation. I also wrote down some notes concerning persons met on my little tour. I find it written concerning the conversation of Strauss, quote, I feel oppressed at seeing nearly every nation in Europe chained by an allied despotism of prince and priest. He studied long the nature of this oppression, and came to the conclusion that the chain was rather inward than outward, and without the inward thraldom, the outward would soon rust away. The inward chain was superstition, and the form in which it bound the people of Europe was Christian supernaturalism. So long as men accept religious control not based on reason, they will accept political control not based on reason. The man who gives up the whole of his moral nature to an unquestioned authority suffers a paralysis of his mind, and all the changes of outward circumstance in the world cannot make him a free man. For this reason, our European revolutions have been, even when successful, mere transfers from one tyranny to another. He believed, when writing the Leben Jesu, that in striking at supernaturalism, he was striking at the root of the whole tree of political and social degradation. Renan had done for France what he had thought to do for Germany. Renan had written a book which the common people read. The influence of the Leben Jesu, 
had been confined to scholars more than he liked, and he meant to put it into a more popular shape. Germany must be made to realize that the decay of Christianity means the growth of national life and also of general humanity. As Strauss could speak little English, and my German was not equal to profound themes, we now and then resorted to Latin words. What I have just written was gathered from our conversation, and must not be taken literally but what he said to me about immortality, that it was a purely anthropological problem, is exact, for on that I had meditated every day since I left him, and again as I looked out from Ostend over the shoreless sea. It was at Ostend, strolling amid the happy promenaders on the dig, bathing on the translucent waves, observing the happy peasantry, above all the crowds of merry children on the beach, that our spirits found some relief and repose. The old Belgian town took hold of our affection. We made some acquaintance with the market women and tradespeople. We found the seaside luxuries wholesome and cheap. And in after years, being not permitted to bathe together on English beaches, we found happy vacations in dear old Ostend. From my wife's diary. September 11th. Monk preached for the first time since our loss, and broke down completely. September 21st. My darling's birthday, Emerson. A regular cloud and sunshine day. Eustace says he guesses God got the rainbow for Emerson. Returned to London. We found pleasant lodgings at 28 Notting Hill Square. The house was kept by a childless couple, Heppel, who were not only kind, but amusing. The husband passed all his time in genealogical investigations, and we had not been in the house a month before he had traced us both back to royal families. Our new residence had been selected in that region in order to be near our friends of Aubrey House. To our delight, our friends, Professor Cairns and his wife, took the only other apartment to let in the house. This admirable man was thoroughly instructed in American affairs. He knew our constitutional history and the causes of the anomalies and compromises which had led to the war. He was well acquainted with all the legal, economic, and international questions involved, and being with all a man of sweetness as well as light. I could consult him about all my articles written for either country. Professor Cairns was a tall, handsome man, younger than his published works had led me to suppose. Though sadly afflicted with rheumatism, his countenance was always beaming with humor. His lovely wife was gracious, witty, always cheerful, and my wife found her friendship a great resource. The intimate friends of Cairns were his confreres in economic studies, John Stuart Mill and Professor Fawcett. Now and then we all went to dine with Mill and his stepdaughter, Helen Taylor, who lived in a pretty house at Cray. In personal appearance, John Stuart Mill resembled Edgar Allan Poe, his delicate mouth almost feminine, which twitched nervously at times, and the small chin were in contrast with the breadth and height of his brow. Although Mill was more eager to listen than to talk, we managed to throw the burden of conversation upon him, and never failed to go away enriched by his ample knowledge and ideas. Many a new view in philosophy, religion, and sociology grew in me from his casual suggestions made without the slightest doctrinaire spirit. When led to speak of eminent contemporaries from whom he differed, 
he did so with a look of deference there was pathos in his expression when he spoke of carlyle and said then carlyle turned against all his friends emerson he had met in eighteen forty eight and though he had no liking for any transcendentalism held him in great esteem on the evening of our first visit to mill professor cairns and the ladies drove to the station and our host walked with me he turned the conversation on emerson and i told him how when i was a youth in virginia sharing the conventional notions of those around me a sentence quoted from emerson in a magazine had awakened in me a new thought and aim which ultimately revolutionized my life mill paused on the road and said that is something that should be engraved on a man's tomb although in his countenance there was a tinge of melancholy it was serene and there was some twinkle in his eyes when he uttered an epigrammatic criticism on one or another politician who had acquired popularity or power he was a man of delicate sentiment elegant manners and affectionate nature by the personal care he had given to the culture of his stepdaughter a care maternal as well as paternal she was able to appreciate his philosophy learning and his unique personality some of the most instructive conversations with mill and helen taylor related to their observations of the french people and their religion in the provinces they felt that the central figure of the madonna was more elevating in their humble homes than any form that protestantism could offer helen taylor told me that once when they were in scotland she called on a poor woman who had lost her little son the mother was inconsolable and said what troubles me is they will be all menfolk up there and won't know how to do for him i had heard that when mill and helen taylor visited the parthenon where there was some discussion as to the spot on which the statue of athena had stood the young lady moved to a certain point and said i believe it stood here Curtius and his party heard of it and reached the same conclusion i asked her about it and she said her reason was that if it had been a catholic church the virgin would have stood at that spot End of chapter 28「Chapter 29, Part 1 of Autobiography, Memories, and Experiences, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand Autobiography, Memories, and Experiences, Volume 2, by Moncure Conway, Chapter 29, Part 1. Meeting with Robert Browning was like a fine morning. His whole handsome countenance smiled, not his mouth merely or even chiefly, and his greeting was to tell something pleasant. For some years I lived in Delamere Terrace near his house in Warwick Crescent, and sometimes joined his walks he had been friendly with me from the first having read an article i had written in america about his poetry the large three-volume edition of his poems had just appeared when i arrived eighteen sixty three and i wrote two extended reviews of it one in the westminster review the other in the englishwoman's journal he recognized the papers as indicating loving study of his writings i was able also to do him some practical service finding that he had no adequate arrangement in america for the publication of his works or those of mrs browning i offered to undertake that matter for him and succeeded he showed his gratitude by presenting me with a copy of the original edition of his first poem pauline which many years later i found was one of the five or six copies discoverable browning was much interested in america mrs conway who had been requested to act in london in the interest of the concord bazaar for the benefit of the freedmen hinted to browning that an autograph of his would be valuable thereupon he took out a large bundle of papers 
manuscripts of his early poems sordello was in a separate wrapper he removed the parchment wrapper of the poems and showed us the sentences greek latin english with which it was covered this parchment wrapper was duly forwarded to mrs horace mann but who was the purchaser i know not it would be a relic of interest to the browning society in london before sending it to america i made a copy which i conclude to insert here the figures affixed to each quotation refer to the translations that will follow a la pan tomaton que penita one en aquí saman osa volometha two saturday may twenty seven eighteen thirty seven tuesday june eighteen eighteen thirty seven july thirty eighteen thirty seven august seventh january fifth eighteen thirty eight march sixth twenty seven february twenty third eighteen forty theta delta epsilon alpha exore mactasia conatate emet aftas gramasi dignimene zeta ypsilon theta iota logosi vrotis three e vois philetheme tacantenes alie son de andres ego de den onye melon esome four thethnicos zo thengomenos stomati five o anna upotesio lisome arhomenos uthe apapavo menos al ei protonse ke estonte en te me sisin aiso simi de clisi ke estala thithu six tu fulminibus frange trisulcis seven panthi tha thanatun afinis nos anthropisin eight hutus anthekemi metanthropon theos nine ego quid ater adri novicinus et quid albus peci iapix ten then i said i will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and i was weary with forbearing and i could not stay here in the greek first corinthians fourteen eight nine os paraxini herontes ethin pu atu iketha la tevontes ethin limena utu igraphontes vivliu telus tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow on browning's parchment the sentences were irregular some of them curving about to find room one passage was all in capitals and run together like a single long word the accents were hardly decipherable no translations nor references to sources were given the difficulties of presenting the document in any useful way were so great that i had nearly concluded not to attempt it but a friend submitted it to a scholar not to be baffled by difficulties namely to professor w k prentice of princeton this ingenuous and learned gentleman sent light through the whole thing as my reader will find by bringing together the figures i have above appended to browning's lines with those that number professor prentice's notes here subjoined one this is translated by wharton sappho ode two seventeen but i must dare all since one so poor and this is probably what the line meant to browning but it is quite uncertain whether these are the words of sappho herself or of longinus who quotes the ode or partly of one and partly of the other consequently it is uncertain what the words really mean and they are omitted from most editions of sappho longinus on the sublime chapter ten is the only source for this ode two we conquered as we wished three six hours are quite enough for toil those thereafter expressed in writing say live to mortals anthologia palatina ten forty three anonymous four rejoice thou in thy youth dear heart soon there will be others but i dying shall be black earth theogenes eight hundred seventy seven f five for now the course from out the sea hath called me home dead yet speaking with a living tongue theogenes twelve thirty but this distich was written originally as athenaeus ten four hundred twenty seven b says of a conch shell which was used as a horn to call the poet home perhaps to his dinner six o lord thou son of leto child of zeus thee never will i forget beginning nor when i make an end but even thee first last and midmost will i sing then hear me thou and grant me good theogenes one through four seven 
shatter thou with three cleft thunderbolts. 8. But the thought of the immortals is altogether secret unto men. Solon, Frag, 17. 9. And thus would I appear a god among men. 10. I know what Hadria's gulf is when it darkens, and what mischief bright Eopix doth make. Horace, Charon, 27, 18 through 20. 11. As travellers rejoice to see, how far have they come? And mariners to see port, so scribes to see the end of the book. In 1863, and for a number of years thereafter, Robert Browning was by no means the famous man he afterwards became. Complaints of obscurity in his writings were still heard among literary men. Tennyson, to whom Browning introduced me, told me he thought his poems powerful but too rough. Anthony Freud had a similar feeling. Browning had then more admirers in Boston than in London. William Henry Channing and I had an enthusiasm then shared only by Dante Rossetti. Channing told me that the obscurity of Sordello lay in the fact that in the original edition there was no punctuation at all. He had taken his pencil and punctuated the book, and it was comprehensible enough. A Browning Club was suggested in my article, 1864, in the Englishwoman's Journal. When Dramatis Personae appeared, the first review of it was written by myself from the proofs Browning gave me for the Morning Star. I found fault with the closing verse of Gold Hair for its apparent sanction of a dogma, human depravity, and he thought I had missed his meaning. A review which I thought grossly unjust appeared in one of the quarterlies, and I wondered who could have written it. A man who sometimes invites me to dinner, said Browning. Carlyle objected to all rhymed and measured poetry, but he must have made some reservation in favor of Browning. The men did not meet often, but were always cordial. I never heard Browning speak of Carlyle but with homage except on the appearance of his shooting Niagara. One evening, when I was with the Carlyles, the talk fell on the Brownings, and the same night I wrote down my recollections. Carlyle. I remember Browning as a fine young man, living in the neighborhood of Croydon. I liked him better than any young man about here. He had simple speech and manners and ideas of his own. A good talk I recall with him when I walked with him to the top of a hill which had a fine prospect. When he published Paracelsus, I did not make much of it. It seemed to me to have something sensational, as they say, about it, but that and his other works proved a strong man. Miss Barrett sent me some of her first verses in manuscript. I wrote back that I thought she could do better than write verses. I saw little usefulness in them. She wrote me then saying, What else can I do? Here I am held hopelessly on a sofa by spinal disease. I wrote, taking back all I had said. Her father was a doctor late from India, harsh and impracticable. His lightest utterances must stand out hard as the laws of the Medes and Persians. He saw her a moment every day as a physician, then she was left alone. Then she read some compliments of Browning's to her poetry. Mrs. Carlyle interposing, Oh no, Mr. Browning never wrote a word about her. Carlyle, Ah, well, you shall tell it all revised and corrected when I get through. Then she wrote something about him, comparing him to a nectarine. Mrs. Carlyle, oh, Mr. Ballantine, a pomegranate, M.D.C. And from Browning, some pomegranate which cut deep down the middle shows a heart within blood tinctured of a veined humanity. Carlyle, I stand corrected. Well, Browning becomes interested in that and other poems and resolves to find her out. He has no clue to her except an acquaintance with her wealthy uncle, John Kenyon. He writes to John Kenyon asking for an introduction. How was it then, madam? Mrs. Carlyle. Mr. Kenyon was absent. As soon as he returned, he wrote a note to Mr. Browning saying that his niece was a confirmed invalid, never saw any one, nor left her couch, and that an introduction was impossible. Carlyle. Ah, yes. Meanwhile, Browning, hearing nothing from Kenyon, determined not to stop on ceremony and went to Dr. Barrett's house. The servant man had been taking too much beer, thought Browning a doctor, and admitted him. He went into the study where Miss Elizabeth was reclining. They had a conversation, liked each other, and she made arrangements for him to call again. He did so, and the spinal disease passed away. The spell-bound princess was reached by her knight, took up her bed, and walked. One day went all the way to Marleybone Church, where they were married. Then they could not face the angry father, and went to Italy. Kenyon supplied the money, and when he died, left them more. She was never suffered by her father to see him again, not even when he was dying. She caught sight of him through an open door. Now, madam, you may give the history and chronological order. 
upon which miss carlyle dressed up a few points in his narrative in our talk mrs carlyle said she had tried to read sordello but could not tell whether sordello was a book a city or a man the house of the brownings in warwick crescent was of rather dark interior and the mixture of old italian tapestries and furniture with modern things was not attractive the family consisted of robert browning his father his sister miss browning and his son barrett whom they call pinna this youth petted a white owl which indeed had a high place in the affections of the whole family old mr browning was extremely interesting dante rossetti contended that there was something semitic in robert browning's countenance and although there was less suggestion of that origin in his father's looks plausibility was lent to the supposition by the fact that he had been a clerk of the rothschild and also by his hebrew learning the original name browning he told me had been de bruni i was told by an old friend of the elder browning that he was a good deal of a humorist he was clever in drawing pleasant sketches and caricatures of his friends and writing amusing verses beneath them i found his conversation particularly instructive in folklore the old gentleman's brain was a storehouse of literary and philosophical antiquities he seemed to have known paracelsius faustus and even talmudic personages personally he was modest with his learning a perfect gentleman miss browning was in every way attractive and with a wit and tact that appeared more french than english browning was a cautious believer in clairvoyance there was a famous medium in london mrs marshall whose performances puzzled me browning attributed them to clairvoyance he had no faith in the theory of spirits and a dislike of spiritualists in general of hume in particular hume i had met at the house of mr and mrs spencer hall where he recited a comic piece in verse and could appreciate the portraiture of mr sludge the medium after browning had enraged the spiritualist by that poem i mentioned to him in a note a story which had been put into circulation in america and which i wished to stigmatize in one of my letters to the cincinnati commercial it was that at some seance in italy where hume was present the spirits had placed a wreath on the head of his wife instead of on himself which made him jealous and angry he wrote me what you call the ridiculous story of hume's spirit passing me by to crown my wife and so gaining him my enmity was told by hume in a spiritualistic journal and i remember that the article containing the story invited me to say what i pleased in reply had i condescended to reply it would have been simply to the effect that i could desire no better evidence of hume's nature and practices than this lie which no doubt seemed to him exactly the thing to believe browning said to mrs conway that when people talked about his wife he had a sort of jealousy of her being spoken of by persons who knew little or nothing of the kind of woman she was one day when i was in his library browning took down his wife's bible hebrew greek and english and pointed to her notes on the wide margins which were numerous and critical including a number of more exact renderings what is that for learning he said when queen victoria desired to meet carlyle and the dean and lady augusta stanley arranged the matter march fourth eighteen sixty nine robert browning sir charles and lady lyell and mr and mrs grote were also invited in a letter to his sister too intimate to be copied here in full carlyle remarks with some humor that the queen said to browning are you writing anything browning had just been publishing the longest poem ever written the poet told me by the way that after the publication of the ring and the book he met carlyle and told him that if he had now reached the public it was by telling his story over ten times it was like bawling into the ear of a deaf man after that introduction to the queen browning was courted by the aristocracy he was above all an artist and knew well the philosophy of emerson's quatrain quit the hut frequent the palace reck not what the people say for still where'er the trees grow biggest huntsmen find the easiest way but i always felt that his serious friendships since those of his youth had mainly been with americans he spoke with much feeling of margaret fuller from her plague-stricken ship poor margaret wrote my wife a letter after a long time it reached us but so blurred that we could make out very little the paper so foul that we burnt it he loved to talk of the hawthorns who had lived near him in florence and of the motleys and the stories americans with good introduction were received with open arms he came in one day and found my wife sitting with his sister and said to her with a glow of satisfaction that he had just blackballed an editor who had tried to stir ill feeling between america and england he enjoyed some of our american writers admired our women and liked our sparkling catawba to which i had the pleasure of introducing him in the days when old longworth made wine fit for any poet end of chapter twenty nine part one
Chapter 29, Part 2 of Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, Volume 2, by Moncure Conway. Chapter 29, Part 2 The friendships of his youth were sacred to Browning, and they were chiefly with those who had built up the peculiar character of my South Place Chapel. The first review ever written of him was by my predecessor, W. J. Fox, M.P. To Eliza Flower he wrote shortly before her early death in 1846. I never had another feeling than entire admiration for your music, entire admiration. I put it apart from all other English music I know, and fully believe in it as the music we all waited for. Of your health I shall not trust myself to speak. You must know what is unspoken. I always believe she was Browning's first love. I believe that the advanced rationalism for which our chapel became distinguished in Mr. Fox's time was primarily due to Robert Browning. In his early youth he was precociously skeptical and undermined the faith of Eliza Flower's sister, Sarah, now known to the world as Sarah Flower Adams, author of Nearer My God to Thee. From their home at Harlow, Sarah wrote November 28th, 1827, a strange letter to Mr. Fox, whose daughter, Mrs. Bridell Fox, gave me the subjoined copy. You did not ask me to write, and perhaps will be a little thankful for what you are like to receive, a regular confession of faith, or rather the want of it, from one whom you little suspect guilty of the heinous sin of unbelief. It reads like half-jest, Never was I more serious. My mind has been wandering a long time, and now it seems to have lost sight of that only invulnerable hold against the assaults of this warring world, a firm belief in the genuineness of the scriptures. No, not the only one. I do believe in the existence of an all-wise and omnipotent being and that, involving as it does the conviction that everything is working together for good, brings with it comfort I would not resign for worlds. Still, I would fain go to my Bible as I used to, but I cannot. The cloud has come over me gradually, and I did not discover the darkness in which my soul was shrouded until in seeking to give light to others my own gloomy state became too settled to admit of doubt. It was in answering Robert Browning that my mind refused to bring forward argument, turned recreant, and sided with the enemy. And when I went to Norwich Music Festival, oh, how much I lost! In all the courses and praise to the Almighty, my heart joined and seemed to lift itself above the world to celebrate the praises of him to whom I owed the bliss of these feelings. But the rest of the Messiah dwindled to a mere musical enjoyment, and the consciousness of what it might once have been to me brought the bitterest sensations of sadness, almost remorse. And now, as I sit and look up to the room in which I first had existence, and think of the mother who gave it, and watched the window of the chamber in which she yielded hers in death as in life a fervent Christian. That thought links itself with another. How much rather would she had never been than to be what I now am. I have a firm belief in a resurrection, at least I think I have. But my mind is in a sad state, and before that goes, I must endeavor to build up my decaying faith. How is it to be done? I want to read a good ecclesiastical history. I dare not apply to Papa. I dare not let him have a glimpse at the infatuation that possesses me. 
had he been less rigid in his ideas of all kinds of unbelief it would have been better for me but i have had no one either to remove or confirm my doubts and heaven alone knows what uneasiness they have given me i would give worlds to be a sincere believer to go to my bible as to a friend in the hour of trial feeling that whatever might befall that would never desert me and defying the world to rob me of its consolations my life has been like a set of gems on a string of gold a succession of bright and beautiful things without a dark thread to dim their luster but it will not be always thus it is not thus now and some resources i must have against the evil time which is beginning to set in the very study will be a delight even if it has not the desired result the consciousness that i have not examined as far as in me lies weighs heavily upon me and to you i now look to direct my inquiries tis a bold step and i wonder how i could bring myself to it i have often longed to speak to you but that i could not do and now it seems as if i could not bear to speak to any one but i want quietly to read in my own room what why any books that you would deem suitable i shall soon be at home london and if you will lend them and let me read them my mind will at all events be relieved from whatever portion of guilt may mingle in its present uneasiness i hope this will not worry you i would not be one to add to the annoyances that visit you but that you have a sincere regard for me i now believe and how it is returned let this confidence which you possess unshared by any one beside bear testimony i long to come home harlow is not what it once was and it has added to the feeling of loneliness which has been coming on though i may often be mirthful i am not always happy but i am in a sad mood this morning and to-morrow may be brighter in the heavens and in the heart so i will not write any more than one thing and that you know already that i am yours affectionately sally burn and forget not me and those books but the letter and low spirits mr fox had been up to that time a liberal unitarian but his opinions had by no means reached the phase indicated in the above letter his rationalism however took a new departure a year or two later and after a careful study of his works and those of sarah flower adams i am convinced that her doubts or perhaps his efforts to remove them did away with his faith in a biblical revelation thus robert browning as i believe had something to do with the preparation of my chapel for the free thought which now characterizes it i believe the sisters flower inspired both pauline and pippa passes long before i knew the relations between browning and those ladies i had felt that pippa's voice told the secret of the poet's experiences at a meeting of the london browning society may twenty third eighteen eighty four i said my first meeting with pippa stands apart in memory unique indescribable like falling in love but deep answers only to deep seven years later i learned how the singing of eliza had enchanted his heart and that before he was sixteen his unconscious influence like that of pippa had wrought far-reaching effects on and through sarah whose genius was just flowering in my memorial discourse on the death of w j fox june twelfth eighteen sixty four i alluded to a favorite anthem of his from browning's paracelsus and it was sung by the choir i stoop into a dark tremendous sea of cloud it is but for a time i press god's lamp close to my breast its splendor soon or late will pierce the gloom i shall emerge some day i afterwards heard that browning was present it was sarah flower adams who with the assistance of mr fox compiled and largely composed 
the South Place Hymn Book, published in 1841, and set in it those lines from Browning. I also find some record of experience in the quotation from Jeremiah on the old parchment cover of his poems, Supra. In her heart, too, the old fire burned after its light had sunk, and along with the lines from Paracelsus appeared for the first time, 1841, her famous hymn, Nearer My God to Thee. She pressed the lamp close to her breast, but its splendors could not disperse the gloom of agonies of the world. For in the same year that her famous hymn was written, she wrote also her wonderful poem, Viva Perpetua, in which Vivia says, There are some mysteries, I scarce begin to thread them, but from out them up springs love, flies through them like a bird along a grove, and sings them to forgetfulness in joy. But one e'en now doth come to hold her mute, oppression yet doth crush with iron foot. Our power is so much weaker than our will, but love omnipotent. In these lines Sarah Flower Adams laid her finger on the defect of all theological theism. Robert Browning, no doubt, tried to limit the skepticism he had awakened, but his familiar argument that good comes out of evil did not reach the theistic dilemma. Infliction of pain for good purposes may be the necessity of limited power, but how is it pardonable in unlimited power? Sarah Flower Adams aspired to her God, not everybody's God. But everybody is now singing the hymn so many years heard only in our chapel. And perhaps not one who sings it realizes that it was written by a disbeliever in Christianity. I do not think that Browning continued his old relations with W. J. Fox, M.P., whom he described to me as a man of genius apt to put out his talent to work for him. He may have shared the feeling of some that Eliza Flower really died, like Ottilia and Goethe's elective affinities, of a struggle between her moral sentiment and her passion for W. J. Fox, long separated from his wife. The affection of the minister for Eliza Flower had given rise to much gossip, and after entering Parliament, her friends thought him more distant. He never spoke a word against Fox, but said little about him, and now I believe that this silence was due to the painful memories with which the orator was associated. In our walks, Browning generally broached the religious topic. As the minister of South Place, I may have been unconsciously a sort of ghost from his past. I do not remember that he ever referred to the Bible as an authority, but he had read it critically. In one of his later poems, I noted that he quotes, In a beginning, God made heaven and earth. In the original Hebrew, there is no article before beginning, and in the beginning is misleading. Browning followed the Talmud, according to which there were several beginnings which were disapproved by the deity, but at length, a beginning, which he pronounced exceeding good, that is, exceeding the previous ones. My own belief is that the meaning can only be preserved by reading in beginning. Browning was not conventionally orthodox, but it was a necessity of his genius to project a divine drama into the universe. He hated to give up anything scenic, even a day of judgment. In one of our talks, he said, If a man can summon his workmen and tenants at the end of the week or the year and settle with them, why should not God so summon mankind at the end of life? So hard did he try to believe. I once asked him how anybody was suffered to doubt about a truth of such stupendous importance as immortality. Because, he said, such certainty would not be consistent with the discipline of life. Were there no doubt, faith would not be faith. Yet he never explained why omnipotence could not effect all the disciplines without the ignorance and without evil. 
but i doubt if browning conceived of any omnipotent being he was only clear in criticizing my skeptical positions and i could never get him to define his own positions there was no mysticism about him no accent of the pietist nor of the moralist and it appeared to me curious that this man of the world should make more of theology than of ethics to my expression of that surprise browning answered moral character and action depend so much on circumstances that it is almost impossible for men to judge each other fairly he was of course equally tolerant in religious matters but so animated in discussing them that i have known him to stop on the pavement to impress his point this interest in speculative religion may have been to some extent an inheritance but not from his father who appeared to have little interest in theology the family had belonged to the congregationalist or independent denomination and browning sometimes went to the little chapel of mr foster in camden town one evening this minister very liberal preached on nature and browning meeting him at the door said it was interesting but i should have preferred that instead of describing nature you had told us the impression made by nature on you but it was only in private that i recall any sign in browning of interest in religious subjects in society he was always the man of the world and he frequented society a young american admirer told us she had found him dinner ed to death another tell went that on being verbally invited to dinner he made a note of the date and then said of course you mean next year there never was a more delightful table talker but with all this he never appeared to me really english he had not the ruddy complexion due to his large fair face he was so cosmopolitan he had such taste for beauty in woman often undraped in his poems and such passion for the greek language that i suspect there may have been some brunidian clan in ancient hellas browning was a fair amateur sculptor when i first called on him with my letter from curtis he was modeling a fine head of keats browning had few intimate literary friendships he liked to talk with george eliot and lewes but was rarely at the priory on their sunday evenings when others were usually present he had more friends among the london artists he cared little i think for english politics and his interest in the affairs of france and italy appeared to me rather that of a spectator looking down on the arena i could never discover whether he sympathized with mrs browning's admiration for napoleon the third but once at my table when mazzini was mentioned he said with genuine feeling poor mazzini william mallison an intimate friend of mazzini and enthusiast for his cause was troubled by the exclamation but i had often reason to recall it with sympathy and its indication of remoteness of browning from the rush and roar of european politics his interest was in individual minds and characters and not in people herded together either in political or sectarian masses above all he appreciated and loved the eternal feminine and merited the warm friendship he enjoyed of ladies my first experience of an old-fashioned english inn was in tennyson's country it was at freshwater and from my tidy room in the albion i had a delightful outlook over the bay on my way traveling in an old stagecoach i heard a good deal said about a romance in the neighborhood a young officer of high family had formed an engagement of marriage with a pretty servant girl the match was opposed by his family but he persisted no clergyman in the island could be found to perform the marriage service and one had to be imported for the purpose there were circumstances in the life of the servant girl which led the neighbors to take deep interest in her she was refined and educated and the tennysons acknowledged her as a friend and were present at the wedding on arrival i sent from the inn my letter from browning and received an invitation from mrs tennyson to dine at farringford at eight 
I thus had a good afternoon for strolling on the cliffs, though such is the perversity of my own nature that I soon get tired of external nature unless I meet her in the excursions of Wordsworth or some other poet. So the best part of my afternoon was passed at the home of Mrs. Cameron, already well known to me by her artistic photographs. She was the first person in England to make the large portraits and copies of pictures, and was a much-valued friend of the Rossettis. Mrs. Cameron was the widow of a distinguished officer in India, where she was much admired in society, being not only handsome, but of fine intelligence. She had at that time been an amateur in photography, and after her husband's death concluded to increase her means by the improvements she had discovered. When I visited her and had admired her portraits of Tennyson and Sir Henry Taylor, she spoke of Tennyson as her best friend, and alluded to the great service he had recently rendered to her. I then learned that the romance I had heard about on the coach had occurred in her house. The servant girl, so called, whom the officer had just married, had been an intimate of her own family, and she related to me the brief story which she declared she had no objection could be made public. She was once walking in the streets of Cork when a lovely child offered to sell her flowers. Struck by her appearance, she made some inquiries, and finding that the child was an orphan and without relatives to object, she took her into her own family and had her carefully educated. She turned out to be in every respect a lovely girl worthy of any position. Mrs. Cameron presented me with a picture of the bride who was certainly refined and beautiful enough to be set in the poetry of Tennyson, where I think I have met her. She was finely educated and was accomplished in music. All of this went on while the Camerons were in affluence. When Mrs. Cameron, who had no children of her own, became a widow in reduced circumstances, the grateful adopted daughter insisted on doing the work of a housemaid. The freshwater legend was that the young officer had seen her sweeping the steps in front of Mrs. Cameron's pretty cottage. In fact, however, the young man, who had acquired some distinction by a philosophical essay, had visited the Tennysons and on his way back called to get Mrs. Cameron's portrait of the poet. The graceful young girl met him at the door, and being a man of some genius as well as taste, he asked Mrs. Cameron about her. Mrs. Cameron told him that she was taking care of the house because she was grateful, but was a real lady. She regarded her with as much honor and affection as if she were her daughter. The Tennysons were greatly pleased by the betrothal, and when, on account of the objections of the officer's aristocratic relatives, the village clergyman refused to perform the ceremony, Tennyson brought one from a distance, and I think the wedding festival was at his house, Farringford. The Tennysons withdrew from the village church, and the clergyman was becoming unpopular. Although I have placed this visit to Mrs. Cameron in June 1863, I am not certain that it may not have been on one of my later visits. For the Isle of Wight and Lymington, while Allingham was there, were my favorite haunts, and my adventures were duly chronicled in my South Coast Saunterings in England, Harper's Magazine, where, however, the times and seasons of my adventures are not noted. When I was there, the officer had shortly before taken his wife to India, where his career was philosophical rather than military. He founded at Calcutta a positivist church. I was the only guest at Farringford. Mrs. Tennyson was attractive and lighted up the table by her cordiality and pleasant voice. After dinner, the poet took me up to his study, where he sat smoking his pipe having given me a cigar, and talking in the frankest manner. Among other things, he told me of the people who waylaid him, the incidents being sometimes amusing. Two men, for example, having got into his garden separately, one climbed a tree at the approach of the other. The other, seeing him, called out softly, I twig, and immediately climbed another tree. 
and yet he declared that no man was more accessible to any one who had any reason for wishing to see him. So I, for one, certainly found the hospitalities of Farringford having been offered to me beyond my willingness to accept them. It had been a stormy evening, and the night was of pitchy darkness, when I started out, against invitations to remain, to go to the Albion. Tennyson insisted on showing me a nearer way, but in the darkness got off his bearings. Bidding me walk close behind him, we went forward through the mud, when suddenly I found myself precipitated six or seven feet downward. Sitting in the mud, I called on the poet to pause, but it was too late. He was speedily seated beside me. This was seeing the laureate of England in a new light, or rather hearing him under a novel darkness. Covered with mud, groping about, he improved the odd occasion with such an innocent run of witticisms and antidotes that I had to conclude that he had reached a condition which had discovered in him unexpected resources. His deep bass voice came through the congenial darkness like mirthful thunder, while he groped until he found a path. "'That this should have happened after dinner,' he exclaimed. "'Do not mention this to the temperance folk.' Next morning I was punctual to an appointment Tennyson had made to take me around his manor and favorite cliffs. Mrs. Tennyson met me with the explanation of our fall. She had directed the gardener to make an addition to a walk in the garden, which required a deep cut of which Mr. Tennyson had not been informed. She expressed more regret than was necessary, but smiled at the drollery of her husband's account, and declared the place should be named Conway Walk. Tennyson was in every way different from the man I expected to see. The portrait published with his poems in America conveyed some of the expression around his eyes, but not the long head and the long face. Moreover, of all the eminent men I have met, he was the one who could least be seen before he had spoken. His deep and blunt voice and his fondness for strong Saxon words, such as would make a Tennysonian faint if met in one of his lines, his almost Quaker-like plainness of manner, albeit softened by the gentle eye and the healthy humanity of his thought, did not support my preconception that he was the drawing-room idealist. When in speaking of Robert Browning with high estimation, he yet wondered at a certain roughness in his poems. It rather amused me, for Browning put the utmost daintiness, while Tennyson put all of his roughness, into his talk. He did not seem to me a typical Englishman, despite his passionate patriotism. He said but little about the war in America. I think Browning in his letter may have intimated to him that I was much concerned about the slaves and friendly to England, for he evidently restrained himself in his resentment of the abuse of England in America. Such resentment I considered natural and just, so there was no controversy in that direction. It was the day after I had written my letter of June 10, 1863, to the Confederate Mason, but I cannot remember our conversation about that, nor indeed about anything. In his library, Tennyson put me in an easy chair, then went on telling good antidotes. These are not about his contemporaries, but concerning personages of a great generation, but I admired him most out on the cliff. When he had accompanied me along the sea on my way to the station, then turned and walked slowly back, I gave a look at him from a hundred yards' distance, and he appeared to me the ideal Prospero, summoning around him the beautiful forms that will never fade from his isle. Tennyson wrote me a letter in response to my book, The Sacred Anthology, a copy of which I sent him. He wished me to print an edition of smaller size, which one could carry on his walks. He was astonished to find that the non-Christian peoples were so exalted in their religion and ethics, and no doubt startled to find out how many ideas in his own poems had been anticipated by Oriental poets. In later years I had reason to deplore the extent to which Tennyson was ignorant of the non-Christian people in England. In November 1882, his drama, The Promise of May, was performed at the Globe Theatre in London, 
and although I should have been distressed as a free thinker had the audience applauded Tennyson's notion of our tribe, I was troubled at the utter failure of his religious play, knowing how he would be hurt by it. I was not there the first evening when Lord Queensbury made a scene by protesting from his box against the calumnies against secularists. It was suspected by some that Queensbury had been enticed by the manager to make a scandal, for it was the means of crowding the house the second night. Lord Queensbury had taken a box for this occasion also, and invited Mrs. Conway and myself into it but promised he would not make any demonstration. A Sunday had been intervened between these first two representations, and several utterances had been cut out, among them what the girl said of her lover, Yet I fear he is a free thinker. This had been greeted on the first night with loud laughter. But no chord in the public breast was touched. The pathos and the effect of bathos the audience grew serious only when humor was attempted, and roared with laughter at the solemn parts. The laureate had evolved his typical free thinker in his library. Had he, instead of wandering about incognito among farmers, as once he did, made some excursion among the secularists in London, he would have discovered that though the skeptic may be unhappy, he is the last man to make others unhappy. It would be impossible to find more affectionate and tender-hearted and benevolent men than Darwin, Huxley, Tyndall, and other eminent unbelievers. Free thinkers have as much devotion as the orthodox, though it is lavished on human beings. The play revealed Tennyson's weak point as a poet. He could not invent a plot. He was the inspired storyteller, but the story had to be given. His Ulysses, Princess, Arthurian idols, all his great works are the exquisite telling of old tales. Of his four dramas, neither had the least chance of popular success. But The Falcon, The Cup, and Queen Mary had plots of classic origin, and being finally mounted and acted did no injury to the poet's fame. In The Promise of May, the laureate attempted a plot of his own, and it turned out to be a mixture of police court seduction case and a curate's sermon. It is doubtful whether any play with a theological purpose had been put on the stage since Marlowe's Barabbas. That play represented a Jew evolved out of Marlowe's inner consciousness who went about committing every kind of crime from the pure love of it, in the following century, that play was travestied by Cyril Tourneur in The Atheist. Shakespeare had answered Marlowe's Barabbas with Shylock, showing that the Jew was a man impelled by human motives. If Tennyson's play had appeared two centuries before, it might have been a sort of reply to Cyril Tourneur's Atheist, showing that the unbeliever had at least humanly conceivable motives for his deeds. A further comparative study was suggested by the fact that Marlowe was personally an atheist and that many were made skeptics by Tennyson's In Memoriam. Tennyson, as his poem Despair shows, waged war against the orthodox dogmas that seem cruel as much as against atheism. A friend of his told me that he was once at a dinner company at Farringford when in the evening they all went to a window to witness the burning of dry brushwood in the garden. There were in the company a Roman Catholic baronet and his wife. And Tennyson said loudly, Lady, how would it do to throw a man into that fire to burn through eternity? That's what you believe is going to happen to me because I don't believe the creeds. The lady was embarrassed, but... Tennyson was excited and persisted in the attack until her husband took him by the arm and said, Ah, she doesn't pretend to know anything about such things. End of chapter 29, part 2
Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, Volume 2, by Moncure Conway. Chapter 30, Part 1. When, at the close of 1863, the Committee of South Place Chapel had urged a permanent settlement, we agreed to remain for six months. The ladies of Concord and Boston had appointed Mrs. Conway to collect contributions in England in aid of the colored freedmen. While she was successfully occupied with that work, and I was writing articles for English and American papers, we felt that we were serving our country as well as if residing in it. I had been preaching at South Place pretty regularly for five months before my regular ministry began, February 1864. The Society had originated under the American Apostle of Universalism, Elhanan Winchester, during the French Revolution, which he interpreted by the Book of Revelation and the society now passed to another American who had come over to interpret the new revolution in America. During its threescore years and ten, the society had passed from Winchester's rudimentary universalism through phases of faith leading to the humanized theism of W. J. Fox. In rewriting my old discourses, I discovered how conservative my theology had been in Cincinnati, even when the seceders went off to found their Church of the Redeemer. At South Place, the old sacramental vessels were preserved only as relics. The communion table was used only for the flowers set there every Sunday. One relic, the fine gown worn even by W. J. Fox, I was the first to discard. There was a pleasant vestry in which was always placed a decanter of port or sherry for the preacher's refreshment. The high pepper-box pulpit and the straight-backed pews remained until 1876 when the whole interior was renovated. It is a building of excellent acoustical qualities with deep galleries and can seat nearly a thousand. The congregation contained no working men, so called, and the few artisans in it were persons of fair education. The members were mostly middle class people of literary tastes and trained in families whose vital religion was the new Reformation. This Reformation of varied phases, some elusive, while those affecting freedom of thought steadily prevailed had been fruitful in individual characters. I was the pastor of the veteran radicals even when they were too infirm to attend the chapel. James Watson, whose memory extended to the prosecutions of Thomas Paine and his friends, and who had himself been in prison for selling Paine's works, was a serene man of such clear mind that I could hardly realize his age. William Lovett, the old chartist, who wrote several useful books on sociological and educational subjects, was a charming old radical to talk with. I conducted the funerals of Watson and Lovett and cherished the souvenirs sent me by their families. A large engraving of Romney's Payne and a portrait of Madame Derismont, Fanny Wright. London was a different city in those days from what it had become only twenty years later. In 1864, the Soho region was still phenomenal for villainy. It was something to be seen, and I remember passing through the besotted streets under guard of a policeman. But fifteen years later, Wentworth Higginson, who was visiting us, related with sorrow the destructiveness of time on old institutions. He had gone alone through the whole Soho district, but alas, without having his pocket picked even of its half-visible handkerchief. Field Lane, where Dickens located Fagin's school for pocket-picking, 
was in eighteen sixty four a place still suggestive of such dens an uninhabited old shanty was pointed out as the very house of fagin and i tried to make out the itinerary of oliver twist and the artful dodger the seven dials where sots drank their gin in rooms still retaining traces of a fashionable past was a place to avoid but the district of st george's in the east was a show-place of orgies it is near that region that swedenborg was buried in a pretty churchyard i have sometimes sat beside his tomb and watched the children seeking in that green garden asylum from the miserable scenes outside and wondered that the great mystic should have seen his first visions in the thick of london city a little farther amid the docks i saw a ritualist clergyman celebrating on good friday the stations of the cross a small procession of his congregation st peter's followed the draped cross and at its several stations paused to sing hymns but an english rector in monkish dress and the intoned ceremonies enraged the crowds which jeered at the ritualists across the thames i found and entered the old tabard inn from whose yard the pilgrims used to start for canterbury on it there was a bit of some carven figure out of which the imagination might restore the head of either a horse or a pilgrim the gallows still had its place outside the grim old bailey prison on what was i believe the last public execution that of the men of manila concerned in the flowery land murders i went out in the early morning to observe the crowd but intending to avoid the spectacle of the law's imitation of the murderers but even then hours before the event every street and alley leading to the prison was crammed the crowd was brutal many of both sexes being already tipsy with some difficulty i reached a point near smithfield where the executions by fire and stake deemed civilized in their day supplied the right moral point of view for the scene of legal murder as i was surveying the mass of people the church bell began to toll the boisterous throng was smitten silent and far away i beheld the white-robed victims swinging in the air the men hung there from nine till noon during the first years of my ministry at south place the means of reaching it from camden town were inconvenient after i had reached the underground railway at portland road it only took me to farringdon street from that point i made my way on foot through smithfield then an open common smithfield long consecrated in my sentiment by the ashes of its martyrs became more sacred as the arena where the unchurched heretics and their opponents carried on their debates every sunday there were separate groups each surrounding its leader but generally they all amalgamated around the central combat between the atheists and the orthodox the whole thing was picturesque no ordinary pulpit eloquence could fascinate me so much as the vigorous unadorned argument of men whose freedom showed what fruit is born by wooden stakes quickened by fire and blood i was drawn into the smithfield conflict it appeared grievous that the atheists should be offered no alternative but the dogmas of their evangelical antagonists and one morning i advanced from the outskirts of the crowd and challenged the statement of the chief unbelieving orator bradlaugh my statement made in a friendly spirit from an unorthodox point of view and presenting a new kind of theism commanded respect from the heretics but vexed the orthodox afterwards i left home early on sundays to participate in the debate before going on to my chapel i derived help for my ministry from these open-air meetings i was feeling the pulses of london realizing what problems had been evolved by the conditions of that great world and gaining knowledge of the task before me 
I felt it as an affliction when the police began to make the outdoor disputants move on. It was at once pathetic and comical when the more pertinacious of the speakers were occasionally seen walking backwards and gesticulating at their moving audience, as if followed by a mob. Finally, the huge meat market was built, and the glorious liberties of Smithfield became a memory. Not far from us in Camden Town lived the vigorous free thinker and reformer George Jacob Holyoke, the last man imprisoned in England for atheism. In my Cincinnati dial, November and December 1860, I printed an article concerning him entitled Sketch of a Leading English Atheist. Holyoke at fifty had apparently not suffered much by his six months' imprisonment and his many editorial and lecturing labors. He was rather boyish in appearance, and his almost feminine voice in public speaking conveyed an impression of immortal youth. The lady who wrote the sketch of Holyoke, published in my dial, Miss Sophia Dobson Collett, resided just opposite us in Lansdowne Terrace. She was deformed but happy. Her refined countenance was full of intelligence and vivacity. Her culture, both literary and musical, was wonderful. She had attended the concerts of Mendelssohn in London, knew the novellos, and could identify every character in Miss Shepherd's famous Charles Ochester. It was from her that I heard of Miss Shepherd's rumor, never published in America, in which figure Beethoven, Rodamont, Disraeli, Diamid Albany, and Louis Napoleon, Porfirio. Miss Collett had known Emerson and heard all of his lectures in London in 1848. Emerson remembered her and asked me about her. Although she wrote the sympathetic sketch of Holyoke, she did not share his opinions. She had sat under the ministry of W. J. Fox at South Place, had been intimate with Eliza Flower, the composer of South Place Music, and Sarah Flower Adams, its hymn writer, and had herself written several hymns and tunes sung in the chapel. She occasionally came to South Place, but had not passed with the congregation into its rationalistic phases of belief, and her spirit had found its support in Frederick Denison Maurice. My wife formed a fast friendship with the sweet neighbor and was able to enliven her existence. She had a strong desire to meet Robert Browning and Thomas Hughes, and we secured them for a Sunday evening dinner where she and Browning had a talk concerning their old friends. Miss Collett's brother, C. D. Collett, editor of the Diplomatic Review, had been the musical director of South Place in the days of the Sisters Flower, when its choir was regarded as the finest in London. He retained this position for a time after my arrival. Increasing deafness caused him to resign, but he kept a seat in the gallery near the choir and was there every Sunday. He always stopped to speak to me and one morning told me that he had not for a year been able to hear a word from the pulpit. Gradually the music, too, became inaudible to him, but still he sat there, his daughter beside him. One morning, when the blonde and picturesque old gentleman did not appear, I knew that his end must be near, and so it proved. I received a letter from Horace Greeley, dated April 17, 1864, reproaching me sharply for not returning to join in the presidential campaign. In it he said, There was no year of our great trial which was not one of intense agony to me, as to thousands beside, who would gladly have been buried in the darkest corner of Siberia, only that we knew that would not do. And we are still in the whirlpool, with no assurance of a safe deliverance. It is by no means certain that the Copperheads will not choose the next president, being enabled to choose him because many are in Europe who should be here in the thickest of the fight. 
This letter from one I held in high esteem troubled me. I replied that I did not see how, in America, I could do more than I was doing. I was writing to the Tribune occasionally, regularly to the Commonwealth and the Cincinnati Gazette, writing three or four letters every week, bringing the views of eminent European friends of America and emancipation to bear on our situation that i was receiving assurances from phillips and others that my letters were doing good service that should i return the discussion of my mason correspondence might be revived to the detriment of our cause but that nevertheless if he thought otherwise and would guarantee me a place where i could write and speak freely i would return horace greeley returned no answer but I was engaged as the regular London correspondent of the Tribune. The cause in which I was interested was liberty. I would not have advocated bloodshed even for emancipation, though anxious since war had come that it should be the means of destroying slavery. I would have considered the Union, apart from emancipation, not worth one man's blood. I was thus too different from other Americans even from my anti-slavery colleagues to be directly useful in the republican campaign i had no faith that war could achieve any permanent benefit to white or black or to any nation while the president and the people recognized only the military method of pacification and emancipation there was thus no place for me in militant america london had cordially offered me what my native country had not a field for the exercise of the ministry for which my strange pilgrimage from slaveholding virginia and methodism to freedom and rationalism had trained me so despite horace greeley's reproach reason bade me stay where i was wanted for tasks to which i felt that i could bring some competency so it was that having gone to england for a few months i remained more than thirty years end of chapter thirty part one recording by lucretia b chapter thirty part two of autobiography memories and experiences volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography Memories and Experiences, Volume 2 by Moncure Conway. Chapter 30, Part 2. Unitarianism in England possessed characteristics which promised better for a freelance than the more organized denomination in america this was largely due to the influence of two men john james taylor and james martineau mr taylor though not aged and his faculties still in full vigor had retired from the pulpit he was however much occupied by duties relating to the liberal movement which he had largely molded and i could not venture to see him personally as often as his kindness warranted but his warm interest in the call for aid to the american freedmen in america which my wife had in hand brought me into sufficient contact with him to realize the sweetness of his heart and the elevation of his mind his serene spirit had risen above all egotism and pride james martineau was very different from taylor the leader of unitarians malgre lui he was alarming most of their preachers by his far-reaching researches involving negations whose corresponding affirmations were not yet clear i find among my notes one dated october twenty sixth 1864 went to the unitarian ministerial conference at mr ierson's church islington mr martineau opened the topic after tea 
it was how far the phrases applied to christ in the new testament for example lord saviour prince etc were really characteristic of christ and had any meaning for us now it was the most powerful piece of theological statement i ever heard he proved conclusively that these names all referred to the idea of a kingdom of christ begun after the alleged ascension the great characteristic of modern theology was he said a shifting of the scene of christ's power and influence from heaven to earth from a future to history consequently those phrases and titles have no religious meaning for us now it was very sweeping mr aspland j j taylor solly coupland means etc spoke i was the only one out of the fifteen present i believe certainly the only speaker who heartily and entirely agreed with martineau in addition to this memorandum i remember that in closing the discussion martineau said he must decline to answer any of the arguments that had been adduced from consequences the fact that the fallacious titles and phrases were used in their own unitarian hymns and literature and that all these might have to be expurgated could not be legitimately weighed against the claim of truth and fact though a leader of unitarians martineau was not a leader of unitarianism he had in his mind an ideal english church though for the moment it consisted of himself and his chapel it was to gather under its wings all the religious minds and make the nation a fountain of living waters for all races without any doctrinal christianization of them he was jealous of everything that tended to detach the unitarian spirit and critique from the general religious life of the country or organize it into a distinct church it was here that his contempt for consequences had serious effects on one occasion when there was reported at the annual meeting of the unitarian association a large bequest left it martineau declared that the money would tend to entrench in a sort of fortress a spiritual movement that should be perfectly free the sectarian wing of the association was strong but the personality and moral genius of martineau prevailed i doubt whether in christian history there can be found another instance of a religious association rejecting a large bequest of money none of martineau's large works convey the right idea of his peculiar power while unequalled as a preacher his attempts at systematizing what cannot be systematized are chiefly useful as proving the impossibility of any science of religion as a sympathetic minister he could console the sorrowful by pointing out the means of distilling some good from things evil but when he has to carry this out into all its corollaries the generalization breaks down martineau vainly attempted to carry into theism the optimism essential to it and admits that suffering is refining only to the already refined his great works on ethics and religion with all their beautiful pages and their learned surveys of human evolution must remain as monuments of the failure of theistic philosophy to meet the evil and agony in nature the last sermon i had heard in america was from ralph waldo emerson after theodore parker went silent his society in boston listened to emerson whenever he could be secured when he was to give the sunday discourse the hall was crowded with the most cultured people in boston and its suburbs and some came from salem lynn concord familiar as i was with his lyceum lectures they could not with all their charm prepare me for this inspiration this fountain of spiritual power 
this pathos and this was the man who was lost to the pulpit because the unitarian church preferred the sacramental symbols of a broken body and shed blood in ancient judea to the living spirit rising above all symbols great as emerson was in literature his hereditary and natural place was in the pulpit which his essays did indeed leaven under whatever sectarian forms but only along with more admixture of chaff than of honest meal with emerson's wonderful sermon still ringing in my ears i went to hear james martineau his chapel was a relic of the time when among dissenters there was a cult of ugliness fine architecture and stained glass being decorations of the scarlet woman in the gloomy little chapel i waited until the man should appear whose endeavors after the christian life had brought me help in my early solitude when martineau presently ascended the pulpit i was impressed by his noble figure but when his face shone upon us through the gloom when his gracious and clear voice was heard i said this is a potential emerson it is an emerson not banished from his pulpit but held fast thirty years as a unitarian leader this first sermon was disappointing in that it lacked warm blood but i heard martineau again and again and discovered that he was a new type of preacher that he was deeper than his books and i must take heed how i heard he was presently to me the great preacher he did not work the miracle we witnessed when emerson reascended the pulpit that cannot be done in a gown beneath which wings must be folded but this minister was meeting the spiritual need and hunger of best men and women in his audience of three or four hundred none had come except by inward attraction they did not come for god's sake for conformity or nonconformity but were individual minds taking to heart things generally conventionalized there sat sir charles lyell who had established a new book of genesis and who with his distinguished lady kept abreast of religious studies there was miss frances power cobb author of intuitive morals there was the preacher's son russell martineau the hebraist whose veracity prevented his acceptance of a place among the revisers of the authorized version eighteen eighty one being forewarned of the retention of certain consecrated mistranslations there were students of the unitarian divinity college now manchester college oxford trained to become its teachers such as estland carpenter and drummond but it would be a long catalogue that should name the distinguished men and women who found their nurture or their nourishment in that small chapel and who in the beauty and exaltation of martineau's discourse did not envy the cathedrals their fine arches and flaming windows a seat was always ready for me in the pew of sir charles and lady lyle it added to my happiness to witness that of these eminent friends in listening to the discourses of martineau each of which invariably surpassed the previous one on one occasion as we walked away together sir charles said quote, what strikes me with wonder is that so many people crowd to listen to the immense quantity of stupid sermons preached every sunday while it is possible to hear such a discourse as that End quote. when as time went on i gradually knew more about those gathered around martineau and the widely different opinions developed under his teachings this seemed an especial sign of his art he was preeminently the pulpit artist emerson's remark that there was more progressiveness and more enthusiasm 
in unitarian ministers of orthodox antecedents than in those of unitarian birth is true they whose freedom has involved struggle carry heat into their ministry but this is at some cost the career of martineau born among liberal thinkers suggests that the better service may be done by those who have had no personal quarrel with the dogmas they clear from the paths of others less smoke mingles with the flame of their lamp it was a relief after so many weary years of strife and polemics in america to have no further need to preach about slavery and dogma i was not in an aggressive spirit and got on fairly well with the right-wing unitarians in england occasionally preaching in their chapels two or three familiar with my heretical course in america kept a suspicious eye on me i was invited to the annual festivals of the association and at their first soiree after my settlement was called on for a speech i meant my remarks to be particularly friendly all round but something in them or possibly in himself excited old dr aspland who spoke with severity of the presumption of rationalists in supposing their opponents less candid than themselves dr aspland was a venerable white-haired gentleman with a ruddy broad benevolent countenance he was a historic figure in english unitarianism and without knowing the cause of his rebuke i received it in silence i had for several years been passing into religious states derived purely from my own experience at one point or another things caught from some master slipped from me and new thoughts or thoughts of thoughts had surprised me even after i had parted from the traditional christ i had preached at cincinnati a series of sermons on characteristics of christ in one of which i was uncritical enough to speak of the healing miracles as attributable to the power of a perfect man combined with the potency of faith in those healed i had for years been too much absorbed in slave emancipation to study books on my shelf demonstrating the late origin of such narratives when in london i was able to pull myself together i found that my flesh and blood jesus was as yet really a vision i had been too busy for a thorough critical inquiry into the evidence even of his historical existence the man i now had in mind was not a mere dead jew nor was he on the other hand an ideal human character i was prepared to find in jesus could he be proved historical at all a man with some faults but the preliminary question was what had we to do with jesus at all the answer then appeared to be nothing except that he and his supposed teachings had become in the religious development of christendom a sort of language through which alone the people could be reached but to acknowledge this was to recognize that he was in some sort a providential man not exactly supernatural but raised up by god for a certain mission nothing could have been a more comfortable christology in religious london in the years following darwin's great discovery the origin of species had been published only a few years but already the demands of orthodoxy on faith were lowered insistence on detailed dogmas was relegated to the conventicle the educated forces of both church and chapel unitarian or trinitarian were concentrated on the task of defending their common foundation belief in the divine existence and government when john morley was spelling god with a small g a hallelujah could be raised for herbert spencer's spelling unknowable with a big u 
it was a great day for theists especially for those who ascribed to jesus any exceptional place in the order of the world it is now strange to me that in those early years in london i did not recognize in the collectivist deism a mere ism some years before i had declared at cincinnati that jehovah was a war god to be classed with mars but it was long before i realized the meaning of confucius in saying quote, to worship a god not your own is mere flattery End quote. i called myself a theist without reflecting that a worshipper of mumbo-jumbo was equally a theist but i can now see repeated in my experience in quasi embryonic changes the spiritual history of the early believers who lost their friend and brother jesus by his absorption into a giant omnipotence impartial source of good and bad really my theism had brought me unrest the experience that gave birth to my fable of the monk and his christ vision chapter eighteen had made way for another that reversed the story i had clung to a vision of the god instead of the man and my living jesus was leaving me as if saying since thou hast stayed i must flee i could not worship the creator of this predatory universe an unmoral cosmos evolving all evils and agonies and at the same time genuinely love a man because of his abhorrence of the cosmic horrors and all inhumanity for a time i tried to satisfy my heart by projecting my lost jesus into the cosmos deity he was a father he was love he was the supreme light i still made melody in my heart with the dear old hymns thou hidden love of god whose height whose depth unfathomed no man knows and come o thou traveller unknown whom still i hold but cannot see but how can one's heart sing thou hidden cosmic love without laughing till he cries no i could not feel what my dear professor clifford called cosmic emotion and in this unrest moved with conscious purpose where i had before unconsciously moved on my earthward pilgrimage there was one notable difference between england and america with regard to the ethics of heretical thought in america it had become axiomatic among unorthodox scholars that their convictions must be boldly avowed but in england the intellectual men even in the middle of the nineteenth century generally regarded it as the truer morality to keep to themselves novel and disturbing ideas or discoveries after the revolutionary publication of darwin in 1859 the press and pulpit were so filled with controversies that it was hardly possible to observe the admonition against casting pearls before swine tennyson who substantially agreed with martineau's views regretted their publication and even matthew arnold in his first heretical steps censured colenso for not writing in latin with regard to tennyson it should be said that his favor for exclusively esoteric expression of skeptical ideas was due to his tenderness for human minds and hearts and his dread that they should lose the consolations of childlike faith as he had lost them this martineau recognized but wrote to tennyson's son quote, i cannot see that we are entrusted with any right of suppression when once profoundly convinced of a truth not yet within others reach End quote. indeed i believe that martineau was the first scholar of high social position who entered on a ministry quite uncommitted to any sect 
and absolutely consecrated to the search for truth but martineau had entered into this outspoken role through the scientific threshold his ancestors were men of science and he himself began his studies with the intention of becoming a civil engineer it was the imprisonment of richard carlyle and his wife for publishing the religious works of thomas paine and the general peril of free inquiry and printing that induced the young aristocrat to leave his scientific plan and devote himself to religion carlyle was talking one evening of socinianism he never called it unitarianism and said he had once or twice met martineau but not enough to form any judgment about him most men of his acquaintance who went as far as martineau went farther they were apt to keep silent in such matters Quote, i remember well he said going to your chapel to hear the famous mr fox he was eloquent it was like opening a window through london fog into the blue sky but i went away feeling that fox had been summoning those people to sit in judgment on matters of which they were no judges at all in this carlyle was mistaken the audience at south place being in chief part educated gentlemen and ladies who were centers of influence quote, i remember well continued carlyle when strauss's life of jesus appeared in england that a number of men i knew who had long held the same views but never dreamed of publishing them were shocked some who agreed with him could not forgive him for publishing his views and called it a punishment when he married an actress and was divorced End quote. in speaking of martineau again carlyle said he had once travelled with two or three friends from scotland to london the conversation was mainly on religious and philosophical subjects and of a critical and destructive kind quote, martineau sat in a corner of the compartment leaning back with his eyes closed during the talk but i am well persuaded that he heard every word that was said End quote. william johnstone fox member of parliament is the most notable instance with which i am acquainted of a man of genius so entirely concentrated on the issues of his own time that his fame had passed away with them he was for nearly twenty years the most famous orator in england neither bright nor cobden could be compared with him but in eighteen sixty four ten years after his public career had closed the people generally who had idolized him hardly knew that he was living and the new generation had no knowledge of him fox was residing with his wife at three sussex place regent's park where we sometimes passed an evening with him he was a picturesque figure there in his elegant drawing-room his white hair parted in the middle fell in wavelets beside his serene and broad forehead and his countenance held a rosy tinge still his seventy-eighth year he talked much of browning whom he knew when he browning was hardly out of boyhood and whose poems as well as tennyson's he was the first to review with praise browning he said used to spout poetry when he was a boy in talking of our south place hymn book i ascribed a tune to the wrong composer it was not by him said mr fox but did not give the true name which i afterwards found was eliza flower jealousy of eliza flower had caused a separation between mr and mrs fox and i concluded that her name was not now mentioned by them the orator under whose voice vast crowds in all the halls of england had bent as froude said as forests beneath the storm was not without some of the old fire and the charm was still in his voice his love of art and beauty which had educated unitarians out of their lingering notion 
that godliness was akin to ugliness was visible in the decoration of the room and even in his velvet coat which harmonized with his armchair he listened with pleasure to the stories i told him of emigrants from his congregation whom i had known in america and also to what longfellow had told me of his visit to south place when he entered a stranger to all present they were singing his psalm of life the first time he had ever heard any poem of his sung as a hymn longfellow was charmed by the sermon which was on shakespeare after the service he spoke to the preacher and went home with him to dinner all of which mr fox remembered he spoke with admiration of margaret fuller whom he had entertained also of emerson and theodore parker mr fox was still able to pass an occasional evening with mr and mrs william mallison his old friends mr and mrs peter taylor and my wife and myself were always present we sometimes played spanish merchant or perhaps whist then read a play of shakespeare each one of us taking a character the play was selected in order that we might listen to the sonorous voice of fox in some favorite character i well remember the impressiveness of his interpretation of the king in part one of henry the fourth it was indeed a precious experience to know the man who was the chief orator of the corn law agitation who helped to found the westminster review and at whose feet in south place chapel had sat hazlitt thomas campbell john stuart mill douglas gerald lee hunt sergeant talford john forster crab robinson browning macready the novellos hanels brabants brays howitz cowden clarks harriet martineau helen fawcett sarah flower adams and her sister eliza flower my old friend mr lyon told me that during the corn law agitation so many pious dissenters were enlisted that the meetings were apt to be solemn some of the young people wished to have dancing in the halls after the speaking was over but were afraid of offending the pious this was mentioned to fox who after an eloquent speech rose again and cried i am in favor of free trade in hops thenceforth the gatherings often ended with hops mr fox died on june third eighteen sixty four i assisted his old friend the rev mr mallison at his burial in brompton cemetery on june twelfth a memorial service was held in our chapel and my discourse listened to by his old friends and printed by the society seemed to link me to the intimate history of the progressive movement he so long led but by the historic chapel itself i was linked to a far larger movement the great and solemn procession of the generations of martyrs aspirants leaders who suffering and laboring for beliefs not ours yet by their fidelity and freedom rendered possible in london a congregation holding truth super sacred their monuments were close around us our chapel was built on hallowed ground dean stanley told us of an english bishop who visited the graveyard of city road temple and asked the sexton if it had ever been consecrated yes was the reply by holding the remains of the servant of god john wesley nearby are bunhill fields consecrated by the dust of the saints of descent the homes of moore and of milton smithfield with its ashes of martyrs and nearer still the cemetery of the quakers where amid many graves but one is marked this by a small headstone bearing the name of england's greatest religious genius george fox from these graves arose a cloud of witnesses to surround me when in the course of my ministry 
occurred our memorial services in honor of some of their successors w j fox lincoln cobden dickens maurice mazzini mill strauss livingstone lyle clifford george eliot dean stanley darwin longfellow carlyle emerson louis blanc harriet martineau mary carpenter colenso renan tennyson huxley End of chapter 30, part 2. Recording by Lucretia B. Chapter 31, part 1 of Autobiography Memories and Experiences, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, Volume 2, by Moncure Conway. Chapter 31, Part 1. Peter Alfred Taylor, MP for Leicester, though not an impassioned orator, was an eloquent speaker, and the only thorough Republican of high position and wealth i ever knew in england he was a leader in the agitation against the game laws and the sabbath laws and against tithes he and his wife mentia a lady of finest culture and literary taste made their beautiful mansion aubrey house a centre of liberal thinkers writers artists a veritable salon at their receptions i met young writers and artists who afterwards became famous and Mrs. Taylor formed there a pen and pencil club, at which our sketches were read or exhibited. A privately printed volume of the essays is treasured by the survivors of that delightful club. Peter Taylor freely gave money to the leagues defending the anti-slavery cause in America, and to those of the liberators of Poland and Italy. It was the treasurer of the Italian agitators especially, and Mazzini, passed nearly every evening of his sojourn in london at aubrey house radical leaders of other countries also visited aubrey house but i thought mazzini slightly jealous of any competition with italy in english interest he evidently thought that the initiative of world renovation belonged by transcendent necessity to italy i met mazzini continually his circle was my own his fellow exile venturi had married miss ashurst a sister of the wife of the honourable james stansfield m p mr stansfield got into trouble by receiving letters for mazzini this was necessary even though the letters were addressed to mr flower fior di mazza mazzini had yet another name for london in my address book eighteen sixty three i find Signor Ernesti, Joseph Mazzini, to Onslow Terrace, Brompton, South West, between 11 and 6. We must not write to or ask for him under his real name. In the poor little lodging house he had two small rooms. At one time he was so poor that a few friends quietly made up a testimonial. There was a Mazzini cult, and to some extent my wife and I shared the enthusiasm although we did not include in it any passionate interest in Italian unity. It was impossible to resist the personality of Mazzini, and I thought even his accent added to the charm of his conversation. He appeared to me an illustration of Heine's belief that the beauty of Italians is due to the sublime works of art surrounding their mothers. His life had been, as Peter Taylor said, one long sacrifice, and there was in every feature and especially in his great dark eye a melancholy rarely relieved even by a smile we were all surprised when early in eighteen sixty four our radical friend james stansfield was appointed by palmerston junior lord of the admiralty soon after that the greco regicide plot was announced mazzini called on me and declared that greco was a mere decoy of napoleon the third to arrest the republican propaganda of garibaldi and himself 
Stansfield said that he did not suppose there was anything seditious in the correspondence. Mazzini, being sometimes absent from London, needed a friend to receive his letters, but offered his resignation, which was not accepted. During the discussion in the House of Commons, Sir H. Tracy read an old letter of Mazzini concerning Galenia's declaration to him of his purpose to kill Charles Albert. Mazzini discouraged him, but said his letter. He ended by convincing me that he was one of those beings whose purposes are a matter between their own consciences and God, and whom Providence from time to time lets loose upon earth, like Hermodius of yore, to teach despots that the limit of their power rests in the hands of one single man. Galenia, a brilliant man, I had met in America, where, however, he had again gone, 1864, as a Confederate sympathizer to write for the London Times. So much was I hypnotized by Mazzini that I was ready to gloze over all this, nor did I doubt that the Greco plot was a trick of Napoleon the Third. But if so, it was a mismove. English people were not so much concerned about the security of the Emperor as about their males. Italian enthusiasm revived, and Garibaldi was invited to England. There was a great sensation about this visit of Garibaldi. The Palmerstonian or right-wing liberals were allies of Napoleon III, since the commercial treaty obtained by Cobden. But they could not offend the radicals by preventing the visit. It was decided that the aristocracy should monopolize Garibaldi and keep him from mingling with the radicals, and especially from consultation with Mazzini. He had accepted an invitation to pass several days at Albury House, and there I met him. He saw with delight for the first time a portrait of Cromwell. It represented the protector refusing the crown, and Garibaldi knew English enough to exclaim, Noble fellow, noble fellow, not to accept it. Garibaldi, Karl Blind assured me that he was of German extraction, and that his name combined Gar, war, and Bold, bold, was nobler in looks than Cromwell but his boldness was confined to the battlefield. The eye of Napoleon III was on him, there at Albury House, where he was surrounded by Mazzini, Venturi, Safi, Karl Blind, Freiligrath, Ledru Rollin, Louis Blanc, and other great refugees. But he was drawn away by the aristocracy to be fated. The grandeur of the popular reception given him in London had attracted the attention of all Europe, but not less the demonstration in Covent Garden Opera House, where the aristocrats imprudently carried him. He was treated like an emperor in that city where Louis Napoleon had lived so long in obscurity. Enormous flowers decorated his private box, where lords and ladies in official robes surrounded him. Worse than all, the opera was Massaniello, and a furore was excited by the line, O Santo Arda di Patrio Amor. The prospect of seeing Garibaldi pass on a triumphal march through the United Kingdom was intolerable to Napoleon III. All he had to do was to suggest a possible withdrawal from the Free Trade Treaty. John Bull's heart was thus touched, and Gladstone, who was managing the matter, determined that Garibaldi was too ill to continue his visit. The opera of Massaniello made way for a diplomatic performance of a famous scene in the Barber of Seville, with the modification that, whereas in the play, Don Basilio is genuinely persuaded by the lovers that he is ill, Garibaldi never felt in better health than when the commercial lovers, Napoleon III and Britannia, suddenly hustled him out of England. When tricks are done on our side, how easy it is to pardon them. I could not forgive Gladstone or Napoleon III, but could recognize legitimate stratagems, if not quite noble, in devices of liberators. Mazzini told me that when he and Garibaldi occupied Naples, the priests wished to excite hostility to them among the people by a disappointment on the fate of St. Januarius. The annual liquefaction of the blood of St. Januarius attracts great crowds, 
but it had been announced that the blood would not liquefy that year. But Garibaldi and Mazzini, both unbelievers in Christianity, informed the priests that if the blood did not liquefy as usual, St. Januarius Church would be perpetually closed. So the blood liquefied on time, and the miracle was thus turned into a divine sanction of the Republic. In Rome also, during the brief existence of the Republic there, came a fate at which the people were accustomed to see the dome of St. Peter's illuminated. Mazzini, hearing that it had been prophesied by the priests that the Republic would end that and other celebrations, commanded the officials of St. Peter's to do exactly as usual, and on their refusal appointed special officers who took care that nothing should be omitted. Mazzini said he believed he could do more towards removing popular superstitions by securing the foundations of free government than by offending the common sentiment of the people. About Garibaldi there remained something childlike to the end, when, after the Crimean War, Savoy and Nice were about to be annexed to the French Empire. Garibaldi hastened to Turin and presented himself to my cousin, John Moncure Daniel, United States Minister. He said that he had come to ask him to annex Nice to the American Republic and throw over it the powerful protection of the American banner. He declared himself proud of being a citizen of the United States and said that his fellow citizens of Nice loathed the French. My cousin, Frederick Daniel, secretary of legation under his brother, tells me that a good many Italian misinista visited the legation, and that the minister told them that while he sympathized with their cause, he could do nothing for them. In 1865, after the Union cause had triumphed in America, Mazzini spoke to me and wrote to me urging the duty of the new emancipated America to enter on her mission of universal liberation. In one letter, May 25th, he wrote, Dear Mr. Conway, the heroic struggle in your native land is at an end. Ought it not to be the beginning of a new era in American life? The life of a great nation is twofold, inward and outward. The nation is a mission, a function in the development of mankind, or nothing. A nation has a task to fulfill in the world for the good of all, a principle it represents in a mighty struggle which constitutes history, a flag to hoist in the giant battle, to which all local battles are episodes. Going on in the earth between justice and injustice, liberty and tyranny, equality and arbitrary privilege, God and the devil. The non-interference doctrine is an atheistic one. To abstain is to deny the oneness of God and of mankind. There is a time, a period, during which the implement must be fitted up, the power for action organize that period requires abstention you have gone through that period it was right that the founders of the united states should say to them abstain from all european concerns it would be mere selfism if they took that rule as a permanent one you are now powerful with a tested power you have asserted yourself you have by the abolition of slavery linked yourselves with the condition of europe the four years list of noble deeds achieved by you all must be a christening to the mission of which i speak you have shown yourselves great you have therefore great duties to perform you must represent the republican principle which is your life not only within your boundaries but everywhere whenever it is possible to do so europe the republican europe expects you to do so you can be a leading power amongst us therefore you ought to be such a power all this is far higher than any consideration of safety still even that consideration is something what you have done and the applause of all struggling countries have alarmed all the european monarchs depend upon it they will not leave you at rest the imperialist scheme the spanish scheme the austrian scheme will go on the Mexican affair is a program. You must interfere if you want to avoid being interfered with. You ought to grasp the opportunity. Your prestige is immense. You are in one of those decisive moments given by victory which was, 
on a smaller scale before Garibaldi after he had conquered Sicily and Naples. He might have achieved anything had he not yielded to monarchy's bidding. You may now achieve anything. League yourself with all your Republican national parties. Let your representatives abroad be instructed to put themselves in contact with us and to give a word of encouragement to our efforts, a pledge of alliance with our future. Go to Mexico, go quickly, ensure a victory, defeat the usurpers before they have reinforcements. Let your proclamation say that you go, not for conquest's sake, but in the name of a principle, because you feel called to check the interfering progress of despotic monarchical schemes, and help us to act simultaneously both in France and Italy, against Austria and against the Empire. A sum of fifty thousand, of thirty thousand dollars, a steam frigate sent, of course not officially, at our orders, will enable us to ensure triumph not only for ourselves but for yourselves too why am i saying this why do we not collect money in our own countries of course we can but it would take six months one year and everybody will know it and every monarch will be on the alert now if you go to mexico action on our side ought to be sudden and simultaneous I write these things to you because you have friends in the United States to whom you may perhaps communicate these ideas and who may find it advisable to embody them into facts. If so, the transaction ought to take place secretly and quickly. Ever faithfully yours, Joseph Mazzini. I quote from another letter dated October 30th, 1865. Dear Conway, you ask my opinion about the colored men's suffrage question. Can you doubt it? You have abolished slavery. You have as a crowning to your glorious struggle, as a religious consecration to battles which otherwise would have only been deplorable events, decreed that the sun of the Republic shines on all, that he who breathes the air of the Republic is free, that, as God is one, so on the blessed soil where liberty is not a mere happened hazard fate, but a faith and a gospel, the stamp of mankind is one. Can you mutilate this great principle? Can you cut it down to the monarchical half-freedom standard? Proclaim the existence of the half-man, enthrone a dogma of half-responsibility, constitute on the Republican American land a Middle Ages class of political serfs. Is there liberty without the vote? Is not political liberty the sanction, the guarantee of civil liberty? Is not the vote the stamp of self-asserting human nature through the mortal world, as the right of labor and property is its self-asserting stamp through the physical world? Will you turn, by denying this, your democracy to an incipient aristocracy? Will you decree that color is moral subalternation? Ignorance is, indeed, but you did not choose educated intellect as a test for the electoral right. Had you done so, objections might arise on a different ground. But you could not be accused of betraying the very principle you have been proclaiming of applying a different rule to two sections of God's children, of saying these colored men will be called on to be the armed apostles of national union and to give their life for it, but their life will not be represented in the councils of the nation. End of chapter 31, part 1. Chapter 8, part 2 of Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, Volume 2, by Moncure Conway Chapter 31, Part 2 The Mazzinists supposed that Robert Browning sympathized with the strange delusion which inspired his wife's poem, Napoleon III, in Italy. This I doubted, and I felt that Mazzini held corresponding delusions. With my abhorrence of war, 
I could not espouse his scheme for European conflagration with the United States for participant and his letter of May the 25th 1865 was not communicated to anyone and here appears for the first time I was rather embarrassed in this matter as minister of South Place Chapel I was intimate in the circle of Mazzini's particular friends Mazzini was to them not only representative of the European Republic yet in dreamland But a sort of high priest of the religion on which it was based His faith in it was absolute Resting not on scientific premises, but on a vision of the eternal reasonableness of things One day when we were alone I ventured to press a little on his theism for I was beginning to realize that it was of a type that included the sword as a means of establishing the divine Republic I Suggested that his theism seemed to verge on optimism if God created all things and governed the world His worshippers might claim the existence of the papacy as its sufficient authority He said that in that direction one might indeed be driven into Pyrrhonism but went on to appeal to the spiritual institutions and the facts of moral consciousness as the supreme truth This of course did not meet the dilemma Because it left no tribunal to decide between the moral consciousness of Mazzini and that of the Pope Nor between the method of warfare common to both and my own principles against war my friend miss Ashurst Biggs once reproached me for inconsistency in not entering into the cause of Italian Liberty with the same zeal as for Negro Liberty I Surprised her by saying that although after war had unhappily broken out between North and South I had sustained the side that seemed likely to liberate the slave and remove our country's source of discord I never advocated Negro insurrection and had opposed coercion of the seceded states Mazzini's theism was not shaken by the consideration that under God his Republic had been given by Garibaldi to the monarchy But mine was shaken by the assassins transfer of the Negro race in America into the hands of an ignorant slaveholder Andrew Johnson made president by the bullet of Wilkes Booth going about with his unctuous phrase when it pleased Almighty God to remove Abraham Lincoln was enough to make every earnest soul an atheist so far as that deity was concerned nevertheless when such a soul started out to discover a deity totally free from complicity with the assassin he would find it difficult to discover one and probably take refuge with a deity whose predetermined violences were on the believer's own side my experience is that long labor against injustice done to a race not our own has a tendency to diminish reverence for things consecrated by nationalism having lost my early devotion to the sacred soil of virginia having learned to look upon disunion as flinging open the portals of freedom and justice for a race not my own i could not share mazzini's creed about the sacredness of rome and the importance of italy's Reintegration to the everlasting purposes I began to inquire in each case not about boundaries without souls But whether the individuals inside them enjoyed freedom When Mazzini died 1872 the feeling among us all in London was profound My friend Peter Taylor MP wrote me a heartbroken note in which he said his friends I among others Pleaded with him to leave the fight and live his last few years among us in peace and literary activity only We said you have put your country on the road to progress you have gained independence The rest is a work of time of more time than is yours Disappointment and apparent failure will attend the first steps We failed because he was no egotist while there was anything not achieved and while he had power to move he could not rest Had he consented to end his political life before he yielded his mortal life He would have received this side the grave the laurels that now will adorn the cemetery On the day of Mazzini's death I visited Carlisle 
and told him I should hold at South Place a memorial service in honour of that man. Carlyle talked freely about him, and I wrote down as nearly as I could what he said. I remember well when he sat for the first time on the seat there, a more beautiful person I never beheld, with his soft flashing eyes and face full of intelligence. He had great talent, certainly the only acquaintance of mine of anything like equal intellect, who ever became entangled in what seemed to me hopeless visions. He was rather silent, spoke chiefly in French, though he spoke good English even then. It was plain he might have taken a high rank in literature. He wrote well as it was, sometimes for the love of it, at others when he wanted a little money. But never what he might have written had he devoted himself to that kind of work. He had fine tastes, particularly in music, but he gave himself up as a martyr to his aims for Italy. He lived almost in squalor. His health was poor from the first. He took no care of it. He used to smoke a great deal and drink coffee with bread crumbled in it, but hardly gave any attention to his food. His mother used to send him money, but he gave it away. When she died, she left him as much as two hundred pounds a year, all she had, but it went to Italian beggars. His mother was the only member of his family who clung to him. His father soon turned his back on him. His only sister married a strict Catholic, and herself became too strict to have anything to do with Mazzini. He did see her once or twice, but the interviews were too painful to be repeated. He desired, I am told, to see her again when he was dying, but she declined. Poor Mazzini! I could not have sympathy with his views and hopes. He used to come here and talk about the solidarity of peoples, and when he found that I was less and less interested in such things, he had yet another attraction than myself which brought him to us. But he found that she also by no means entered into his opinions, and his visits became fewer. But we always esteemed him. He was a very religious soul. When I first knew him, he reverenced Dante chiefly, if not exclusively. When his letters were opened at the post office here, Mazzini became for the first time known to the English people. There was great indignation at an English government taking the side of an Austrian against Italian patriots, and Mazzini was much sought for, invited to dinners and all that. But he did not want the dinners. He went to but few places. He formed an intimacy with the Ashursts, which did him great good, gave him a kind of home circle for the rest of his life in England. At last it has come to an end. I went to see him just before he left London for the last time, passed an hour, and came away feeling that I should never see him again. And so it is. The papers and people have gone away blubbering over him. The very papers and people that denounced him during life, seeing nothing of the excellence that was in him. They now praise him without any perception of his defects. Poor Mazzini. After all, he succeeded. He died receiving the homage of the people, and seeing Italy united, with Rome for its capital. Well, one may be glad he has succeeded. We wait to see whether Italy will make anything great out of what she has got. We wait. On March the 17th, 1872, the audience assembled in South Place Chapel to do homage to Mazzini included his most eminent friends, but I could say nothing about Italy. I could only speak of the fidelity and personal greatness of the man, for I was already beginning to realize that the method of violence for any high aim was a gigantic mistake. I saw that all Mazzini's self-sacrifice had gone to strengthen the throne of Napoleon III, and to bring on that war in which his ideal of Italy had been crucified between Napoleon III and Bismarck. On hearing of the outbreak of the Franco-German War, Mazzini, who read Shakespeare, exclaimed, A plague on both your houses. Among the refugees in London, from the revolutions of 1848, the most resourceful was Karl Blind. He possessed some means, had a good mastery of English, and was an excellent writer in German. 
he was the london correspondent of every radical journal in germany also of one in vienna his letters keeping them abreast of general literature and science in england meanwhile his erudition in german philosophy he was of course a free thinker and his knowledge of teutonic mythology and folklore enabled him to write useful articles in english magazines he brought with him to london his wife and her two children ferdinand and matilde who adopted the name of blind in eighteen sixty six the family was overwhelmed and all the world startled by the attempt of ferdinand to shoot bismarck and his suicide the young man had been finely educated both in England and in Germany. His sister Mathilde gave me some account of him. After his graduation, he made a tour through Germany to study the different kinds of scientific agriculture. Mathilde showed me a letter from her brother to a friend in Germany, in which he declares that Bismarck is steadily leading Germany into war, and as he is too high for the law to reach, he can only be dealt with by an individual. One passage in Ferdinand's letter is very remarkable, being written in 1866, and I quote it literally. As I wandered through the blooming fields of Germany, that was so soon to be crushed under the iron heel of war, and saw the numbers of youths pass by that were to lose their lives for the selfish aims of a few, the thought came quite spontaneously to punish the cause of so much evil, and even if it were at the cost of my life. The wild deed which struck so close to my friends, not simply the blind family, but the families of their eminent fellow exiles, did them only evil. It called out many classical anecdotes and quotations in honour of regicide. The theory of the radicals, that Bismarck was saved by wearing a coat of mail, did not affect the masses in Europe. Young blind had sacrificed himself to give Bismarck the halo of a man of destiny. The Republican leaders were thrown against the sharp horns of a dilemma. They must either justify Ferdinand or disarm the revolution. I may mention here a strange incident that occurred thirteen years later when I was residing at Hamlet House. An agreeable young gentleman came from Ohio with an introduction from an eminent friend there. He talked pleasantly, and my wife invited him to stay to dinner. He told us a good deal about our Cincinnati friends, and I asked what I could do for him. He said that he desired to make the acquaintance of Carl Blind, and I gave him my card for introduction. After a few games of billiards, he left for his hotel, and I never saw him again. Two days later, Carl Blind came to my house, pale with agitation, and told me that a man sent to him by me had proposed a scheme for killing the Prince of Wales. Horrified, we drove swiftly to a hotel which he had mentioned to me, but he was not there, and apparently had not been there. Blind regretted, as I did, that he had not at once arrested the man, instead of ordering him out of the house. He had a notion, I believe, that he was a guest in my house. At any rate, he was lost in the multitude, and though we took advice, nothing could be done. In answer to my report to my friend in Ohio, a letter said that the young man had previously been in an insane asylum, but his friend supposed him cured, and that the physicians thought that a foreign tour might entirely restore his physical health. He had been a peaceful patient, and his suggestion of assassination was unaccountable to them. The blinds entertained a good deal. Mathilde possessed beauty, and from the first was distinguished for her literary culture. Her acquaintance with the languages and literatures of Germany, France, and Italy was marvellous. The delight of Mazzini in her society seemed to some of their political friends to be of importance to the affairs of Germany and France, for Mathilde was well acquainted with such matters, and keenly interested in them. Her poems are full of thought, and had she been writing in her native language, I feel certain that she would have reached wide fame. Her brother Rudolph, an artist, their beautiful half-sister, Otilia, now Mrs. Hancock, the entertaining conversation of their mother, 
combined with Carl Blind's ability and knowledge, made their house a sort of salon. There we used to meet the admirable Freiligrath and Ledru Rollin, and if any interesting man came, especially from Germany, we were sure to meet him at one of those Sunday evenings in Winchester Road. End of chapter 31, part 2《Chapter 32 Part 1 of Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret S. Bayat. Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, Volume 2 by Moncure Conway. Chapter 32 Part 1 it is my conviction that between 1860 and 1880 the English Parliament reached its high watermark of ability, whether considered individually or collectively. This may be considered a senile delusion, though I should consider it a childish delusion to consider the Parliament opening with the twentieth century equal to that of thirty years before. The figures surviving from the past struggles mingling with those of the later generation in the House of Lords, gave me a new sentiment about the hereditary house. Especially impressive was Lord Brougham's thin, bent form, moving amid the scene of his historic labors, and it was pleasant to observe that every peer of whatever party greeted him as he passed. The liberal leader in the House of Lords, Lord Granville, had a handsome and beaming countenance, strikingly like that of the poet Longfellow. His speaking was pleasant and to the point. Lord John Russell was so famous that I was surprised at his small stature. There was a story that he once wrote a poem in which the highest flight of imagination was in the line, the red rose and the yellow orange. But Lord John was by no means so prosaic as the humorists made out. His speeches, always uttered from long experience and wide information, were never dull. No debater in that house, however, could be compared with the conservative leader, Lord Derby. Darwin might have written on him a study of political evolution. Every clear-cut feature, every hair on the shapely head, every tone of his penetrating satire feathered with well-bred grace, indicated a leader organically made for his place. I heard his famous speech attacking the government in February 1864. Sidney Smith was never more brilliant than Derby in his description of Lord John Russell's foreign policy. He pictured him as bottom, wishing to play every part, quoting the phrases of Shakespeare with consummate art, and ended with, The noble Lord's motto seems to have been meddle and muddle. Nil quod non tetigit, et nil tetigit quod non conturbavit. It was all said in the impetuous style that made Bulwer describe him as the Rupert of debate. Lord John Russell's face bore a sardonic smile during the vivisection, but there was something anaesthetic in Derby's gracious manner and tone. To the banter, Russell only said it was, of course, very fine, as it all came from Shakespeare. The debates in the House of Lords interested me as presenting the reactionary and the liberal interpretations of the British Constitution and of English history. The interpretations were not contrarious, but recognizable as the two wings which had steadily borne the nation through the storms of centuries. The speeches generally indicated the close study of a leisure class, and absence of that influence from the aura popularis which affects men depending on popular suffrage. These lords, assured of their position, without any interest to elbow any one in order to rise higher, reminded me of the old race of Virginian statesmen, living on their estates, supported by the labor of their slaves, they had leisure to give their attention to large subjects. The speeches of Pendleton, Crump, John S. Barber, Robert E. Scott, Travers Daniel, to which I used to listen, 
were marked by wide information, not merely political, but literary and historical. There was comparatively little of the spread-eagle bombast of the demagogues. The English radical threats of sweeping away the House of Lords did not excite my sympathy. Opposed as I am to the American bicameral system, I knew that in England its only alternative would be an elective, always a rotten borough senate. The only conceivable value of a second chamber is an independence of the popular breath which might enable it to check popular passion. What nonsense we are brought up in about the horrors of hereditary legislation! All legislation is hereditary. How do the American masses get their votes? By birth. On February 10, 1866, I had a place in the House of Lords to witness the opening of Parliament by the Queen. Since the death of the Prince Consort, she had been in deep retreat, and this first step towards a resumption of her functions caused universal satisfaction. The peers and peeresses prepared to welcome her with an enthusiasm and display now historic. Lord Granville had secured for me a fine seat among the peeresses, and I believe that every gem, necklace, coronet, robe, and decoration belonging to the nobility of England was worn that day. The fullest of court dress was worn by the several hundred ladies, and the scene billowy with necks and shoulders. For once I saw the ideal legislative assembly, the ancient Witenajemat, with best men and women in consultation. There were whispers of disappointment when the Queen appeared. The fine robes and insignia she ought to have worn were displayed on a table near her, save for some slight badge and the kohinoor on her forehead she was still in somber raiment she was the only homely woman in the house and her homeliness emphasized by her somber dress was the more pronounced by contrast with the beautiful and superbly costumed princess of wales instead of reading her address to parliament as usual it was read by the chamberlain through it she sat, as if carved on the throne. When it was finished, she arose, bowed slightly, kissed the Princess of Wales, and disappeared through the back door. As my political philosophy assigned to a monarch the sole métier of being charming and ornamental, and thereby holding the chief place secure from usurpation by presidency, this withdrawal of the Queen from her functions impressed me as a danger. There was a vigorous Republican agitation going on in England, and it was frequently said that the practical extinction of the court had demonstrated the uselessness of the throne. I remember being at a dinner of the Urban Club, St. John's Gate, of which I was a member, when young Mr. Babington, a kinsman of Lord Macaulay, refused to rise to the toast to the Queen, avowing, when his conduct was challenged, his republican opposition to monarchy. There was a noisy discussion, but a goodly number defended Babington's right to so express his opinion. It became plain to me that the Queen was not then popular. The republican organizations were enfeebled by Andrew Johnson, and died under Grant's administration. It was really an American movement, and I knew well that republicanism in England would mean an imitation of our quadrennial revolutionary presidential campaign and our bicameral congress. The French say, the better is enemy of the good. In so-called political reform, the better often destroys the good without succeeding to it. Congress was an inferior body to Parliament, and I felt that it was because neither senator nor representative possessed the personal independence of the peer and the commoner. The superiority of the peer especially consisted in his not having to keep his eye on the hustings, while his subordination to the commons in any trial of voting strength made it all the more necessary that his argument should be sound and lucid. But there was already a danger that the House of Lords might lose this independence through intimidation by the menaces of the increasingly enfranchised masses. I used to meet the accomplished Lord Dufferin, a constant friend of the Union cause in America, 
and asked him whether it would not be wise for the lords to demand a law definitely securing their right to throw out a measure twice, the said measure to become law without any action of the upper house, if the commons should pass it a third time. Lord Dufferin declared he would strongly favor such a change, and he had no doubt a majority of the peers would rejoice in it. But subsequent observation convinced me that the commons would never agree to it, as a good many of them, in order to please their constituents, sometimes vote for a measure they secretly hate because they know the lords will throw it out. The House of Lords has thus often served as a scapegoat. Several of the peers mingled in the debates with a tone that seemed to recognize the approaching democracy. The Duke of Argyll, Lord Kimberley, and several bishops were somewhat restless, as if they would prefer to be in the fray of the other house. But as a rule the lords presented the aspect of having reached the happy isle. There was never any sarcasm or bitterness in their encounters. A palpable hit that drew no blood was the aim of each antagonist. At the table of the Duke and Duchess of Argyle, at Argyle Lodge, Kensington, I first met a number of lords who, like themselves, were deeply interested in the anti-slavery cause. Afterwards I met other aristocratic families, several members of which came to South Place Chapel. I discovered that Bunyan's line, He that is down need fear no fall, has a corollary. He that is so solidly up that he neither fears a fall nor aspires to climb may illustrate humility as much as he who is down. It is not snobbery but common sense which recognizes the superiority of the English aristocracy to the English middle class. Arthur Clough hinted this with his Chartist and Irishman. Is not one man, fellow men, as good as another? Faith, replied Pat, and a deal better too. The English race has spread through the world doctrines of equality, while at home their aristocratic institutions have inevitably bred an inequality not simply of position, which might be outgrown, but of character and manners. All the social tiers beneath the aristocracy strive upward, and by their pushing ambition, their snobbery, their contempt for the class beneath them, they are elbowing each other to get ahead, they are apt to become vulgarized. It is the fatal necessity of the aristocracy in reaching social supremacy by birth and without any trick or snobbery to create inferior classes beneath them. But one must be blind not to recognize the superiority of the average nobility in elegance, repose, simplicity, freedom from pretense, and tact in establishing without airs of patronage pleasant relations with persons of any and every rank. However democratic the upper middle classes may become, they rarely rid themselves of snobbery. Gladstone was once summoned as a witness in a case that concerned the Duke of Newcastle. Asked whether he was intimate with the Duke, he replied, as intimate as our difference in rank permits. Gladstone was Prime Minister, and the Duke inferior to him in everything but birth. It was with extreme interest that I witnessed and watched the competition of Disraeli and Gladstone as to which should outbid the other in lowering the franchise. Disraeli had set out to educate the Tories, as a phrase ascribed to him went, and had plainly taken the unjust steward of the parable as his model. Seeing that Gladstone, by the aid of John Bright, would surely enlarge the popular franchise, and that if the Liberal Party got all of the credit of such enlargement, the Conservative Party must be permanently excluded from power, he changed all the accounts between the old Tories and the masses, and was duly received into their habitations. Lord Derby refused to commend the ingenious steward. He described Disraeli's large step towards democracy as a leap in the dark, and soon after resigned his leadership. The retreat from official life of the most brilliant man in the House of Lords marked the close of an epoch. 
On the other hand, the most brilliant commoner on the liberal side, the right honorable Robert Lowe, refused to take Gladstone's leap in the dark. I never heard in the House of Commons a more powerful speech than that of Lowe in parting from the chief to whose government he belonged. He knew that his place in the cabinet was to be filled by the leader of the independent benches, John Bright. But John Bright felt that some line must be drawn in lowering the franchise, and spoke vaguely of a residuum. Robert Lowe, amid the breathless stillness of the house, turned towards John Bright, and, alluding to the opera of Don Giovanni, said that the heavy footsteps of the commandant's statue had been heard, and the stony figure now entered, saying, "'John, you have invited me to supper, and I have come.' Alluding to the proposal for an educational test, he said, "'I suppose we must teach our masters to read.' All through the speech there were felicitous touches, but the main force was in the prophetic, though quietly uttered statement of the revolution that was being wrought merely for the sake of transient party interests. Lord Shaftesbury revealed to me the large residuum of intolerance lurking within me. My dislike was not caught from Carlyle, who, in a latter-day pamphlet, spoke of him as the universal syllabub of philanthropic twaddle, but from the way in which his mere rank was utilized by the whole world of English cant. Pious and evangelical meetings advertised his expected presence as theatres might draw with a star actor, but those who went to worship a live lord in the beauty of holiness found no star unless on his breast. There were occasional instances in which the popular snobbery was enlisted in behalf of charities, but these were apt to be mixed with some pietism, and weighed but little against his obstruction of the right and the need of the unchurched people to enjoy their museums and galleries on Sunday. In this long struggle against the offering of human sacrifices to the Sabbath, I was for many years engaged and had a belief that Shaftesbury was not honest in persuading workingmen that their weekly day of rest was endangered by an enlargement of their freedom on that day. But during the conflict of the ablest women against Shaftesbury's factory acts, I concluded that he was merely weak-minded. The workmen were using his soft heart and softer head to rid themselves of the competition of female labor by telling doleful tales about the way in which women were overworked and their children suffering. In vain we pleaded that there were a million more women than men in the country, that they had to support themselves, and that they could not do so if they were prevented from selling their time and their toil on equal terms. Working men's selfishness succeeded through Shaftesbury's sentimentality, and multitudes of women were excluded from factories because forbidden to work full time. If either of the fates had anything to do with giving Lord Derby such a lieutenant in the Commons as Disraeli, she must have been in a jocular mood when it was done. If Derby was the conservative leader by structural evolution, Disraeli was the chief Tory commoner by sport of nature. No one could look at him without seeing that his natural place was to be acting Mephistopheles in Her Majesty's Theatre, rather than that of the political cynic in Her Majesty's House of Commons. Derby believed in something, but beneath every affirmation of Disraeli there was an undertone of skepticism. He once said to W. J. Fox, M.P., my predecessor at South Place, I am much misunderstood. My fort is revolution. His literary career began with the revolutionary epic. He carried his cynical Christianity to the extent of propounding the unanswerable theory that Judas deserved canonization, since he had performed a disagreeable function without which the scriptures could not have been fulfilled, and there could have been no salvation for mankind. Such was the leader that the bishops had to follow 
while he must have laughed in his sleeve at them. He denounced the mass in masquerade of ritualism, but dated a note, Monday, Thursday. A professor told me that, having on some occasion to see Disraeli, he was received in the library, and Disraeli, pointing to his books, said, Most of them are the classics and theology, my favorite studies. But, said my informant, it is certain he could not read the one, nor understand the other. With all this, I found myself enjoying Disraeli's eminence and influence. There was something so picturesque in a Jewish lad bringing the royal family and the aristocracy to his feet. He had done it, too, in the wise and gentle way of Solomon, who reigned forty years and won foreign kingdoms by unbroken civility and friendliness. Professor Fawcett, who entered Parliament with a reputation for radicalism and for a special antagonism to Disraeli, told me that Disraeli was the first to extend his hand and welcome him into the house. He was gracious to opponents, and his success as a leader was largely due to his greater eagerness to bring forward the young and modest members of his party than to display himself, in this being notably distinguished from Gladstone, who overshadowed even his own cabinet. He also had the sense of humor in which Gladstone was so sadly deficient. Disraeli's speeches were more plausible than profound, but, despite an occasional soupçon of affectation, they sparkled with genius and were delivered with ease and grace. Whenever a speech of ornamental character was needed, Disraeli was the only member of either house who could utter it perfectly. It was said that the high old Tories were jealous of the enthusiasm of the Queen for him, gained by the pretty things he said at times concerning her and her family. When the Princess Alice of Hesse died of diphtheria caught by a kiss to her dying child, Disraeli, in his touching speech, alluded to the incident as one that deserved to be engraved on an intaglio and it was said, Lord Salisbury whispered, Blood will tell. But it would have been better for Lord Salisbury if he had possessed some taste for such gems. Disraeli was also Solomonic in his appreciation of the influence of women. His wife was very homely, but in her pallid, almost weird face and deep-set eyes was visible the power that made her his good genius. His attentiveness to her in company was beautiful. He sympathized with every effort to advance women, and at a drawing-room meeting held to advocate a measure pending in Parliament to enfranchise women where I was present, it was authoritatively announced that Disraeli would vote for the measure. Miss Frances Power Cobb arose and said, Mr. Gladstone, however, has declared that he will oppose it, and this government opposition will be fatal to us. Let him be known as William the Woman-Hater. Soon afterwards the Tory ladies formed the Primrose League, from Disraeli's favorite flower, and though an opposition Liberal League was formed, it was feeble, and the Liberal Party has suffered ever since through the alienation of eminent women by Gladstone. The women had with infinite toil secured a majority of Parliament partly through Disraeli's adhesion, for their enfranchisement, which was to be added as a rider to a bill for the extension of the franchise introduced by Gladstone. But Gladstone declared he would withdraw the bill if the rider were added. The members of his cabinet who favored the rider, even Fawcett, left the House when the vote came on, and with them many private members. The woman's suffrage was lost after it was achieved, the defeat being apparently final. But I have gone ahead of my chronicle. Gladstone was not Prime Minister of Parliament at the time when I first began to recognize its greatness, but Palmerston, the cynical old politician whom every radical was bound to dislike, but could not help regarding with interest. In fact, he was such a historic figure that it seemed unfair to measure him by any standard that had grown up with young England. Old as he really was, he was so full of life 
and was so mentally active that his small figure and rosy cheeks, quick movement and fashionable dress, conveyed an impression of youthfulness until he spoke. Then one perceived, not by his voice but by his thoughts and phrases, that he belonged to a past generation. He had an air of being unable to understand that a parliament had grown up able to rebel against his control. It was a considerable part of Richard Cobden's task to watch Palmerston. I remember on one occasion the old premier trying three times in different forms to bring forward some evasion of the speaker's ruling. Each time Cobden interrupted him with a point of order. Palmerston sat smiling and occasionally turning towards his vigilant critic with a droll sort of you-be-damned look, for he evidently knew that on a point of procedure Cobden was always right. The bizarre career of Disraeli was even surpassed by that of Palmerston. He had incurred charges of treason, of forging public documents, of sanctioning the murderous outrages of Sir John Boring on the Chinese, of selling his influence to Russia for its payment of a gambling debt of twenty thousand pounds, and appointing a disreputable fellow, Hart, who secured the money to be consul at Leipzig. He had been dismissed from the premiership on a complaint of the Queen that he withheld information from her and altered measures after she had signed them. These charges were poured into my ear by anti-Palmerstonists, but only one interested me, that of the Queen. It rather pleased my Republican ideas that Palmerston, having offended the Queen, should three years later become her Prime Minister. My boyish memories of the parental index expurgatorius, which included Bulwer's novels, invested that famous author with some romance. He was curious enough in appearance to have stepped out of his own fantastic, strange story. His head was a sort of caricature, the jutting forehead and deep-set eyes being as a sort of make-up. The amusing day in the House of Commons was that set apart for the annual motion to enfranchise women. It was under the care of Jacob Bright, though his famous brother John steadily voted against it, and silently. Beresford Hope always led the opposition to its foregone result, and evidently took pleasure in tormenting the ladies behind their grating by making fun of them. I remember his description of the bill to enfranchise the failures of the sex. Another annual was the motion to legalize marriage with a deceased wife's sister. For a time the Commons passed it every year, and the Lords regularly refused approval. I remarked that after such disapproval the House of Commons never sent it up again during the same session, and may add that I reached the conclusion that the Commons never insisted on this bill, because they did not wish it passed by the Lords, as it might have been had they returned it twice. The Lords, and especially the Bishops, were well pleased to have the bill sent up every year, as it enabled them to boast of their power to veto the House of Commons. But it was all a sham affair. The friends of the measure in the Commons did not demand a second vote in the same session, because they knew they would not get a majority. This is the only measure quoted in support of the Lord's right of veto, and many foreigners are deceived by it. No measure sent up by the House of Commons three times in the same session can fail to pass. Gladstone's measure of home rule for Ireland, whose defeat by the Lords excited so much wrath, would have become law had his government not known that the Commons did not mean it to become law, and that they would not have given it a majority the first time, but for their certainty that it would fail in the upper house. End of chapter 32, section 1Chapter 32 of Autobiography, Memories, and Experiences, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Autobiography, Memories, and Experiences, Volume 2, by Moncure Conway. Chapter 32, Part 2. Gladstone was the most famous orator of England to the outside world, but this reputation was largely due to his limitations. He uttered innumerable commonplaces with an air of profundity. He never worried the average man by any original thought or idea, and he pleased the great mass by speeches that were in large part preaching. The preaching was always orthodox, and it was just that mixture of Anglicanism, Evangelism, Puritanism, and Philistine moralism which supplied three-fourths of the pulpits, both church and nonconformist, with quotations. Of all the great laymen, he was the only one left who seriously defended the orthodox dogmas. Other statesmen might utter compliments to Christianity without going into particulars. They might value the Christian system as a national institution, but the defense of the orthodox dogmas in detail had long been only professional and salaried, but for Gladstone. And now that he is dead, it would be hard to find any Englishman of recognized scholarship and competency, not in orders, who would defend orthodox dogmas. Although Gladstone's parliamentary sermons did not of course go into articles of faith, he printed numerous theological tracts of the kind, and his speeches were sufficiently suffused with the moral accent related to dogma for responsive chords to be touched in church, chapel, and conventicle. Gladstone's lack of humor raised more laughs than most people's humor. I heard him speak on the reduction of the tax on pepper, and he so ensouled pepper that it seemed to be flying about the hall, and one must cry, pepper for the masses. An Oxford professor told me that just before a formal meeting of the faculty of Lincoln College, it was learned that Gladstone was on a visit to the master of Christ's College. They wished to have him at the meeting and get a speech out of him, but the difficulty was that they had no subject to discuss. But one professor remembered that there had been some question whether about twenty old books that had always been on a shelf in a corridor should not be removed to the library, and they resolved to make that motion, though quite unimportant, an excuse for getting up a discussion. Gladstone came with his host and took the discussion seriously. Gentlemen, he said, it was remarked by the distinguished professor who raised this important discussion that he did not wish to take the responsibility of changing the location of these volumes without receiving an order from the entire faculty, and it seems that the faculty hesitate to take the responsibility. Gentlemen, there have been times when the faculty of Lincoln College has assumed great responsibility, and I trust that it is still prepared to assume great responsibilities when changes become necessary. We live, gentlemen, in times when emergencies arrive. And so on proceeded Gladstone, with solemn periods for fifteen minutes, about a matter which the professor supposed would bring out some witty anecdotes, but had not expected would afford them just the kind of amusement received. Gladstone was not beloved. He was a strong statesman, without being a great man. He was so entirely occupied by official duty that no room seemed to be left for those apparently small, but really vital personal sympathies and relations which belong to real greatness. I was several times in evening companies where he was present. When he entered, it was as if in state. All talk and mirth were suspended, and we stood around and bowed to him and his wife and his escort, he returning our bows all around, as if we were some delegation. He would move near the hostess, introductions would follow but there was no free and easy chat with individuals. Happily, he did not remain long on such occasions, and the young people were enabled, without much interruption of gaiety, to cherish a remembrance of the grand old man. He was an institution. How can one love an institution? A member told me that he asked another liberal why he disliked Gladstone. The reply was, Oh, he is always so damnably in the right. No doubt I shared at that time the strong feeling of the Italian, French, and German refugees, and their circle in London, 
against Gladstone, on account of the treatment of Garibaldi. But both the statesman, as well as my humble self, was to have a good many instructive experiences, and in the course of time, when I saw Gladstone save England from four wars, and even mobbed and literally hustled with his wife from their house into the street, because of his resistance to a warlike project against Russia, I recognized in him the true representative of English humanity. Richard Cobden fairly fulfilled my ideal of a parliamentary leader. There was in his look, his clear eye, in the mingled dignity and graciousness of his manner, the flash as of some unsheathable Excalibur guarding the nobler from the baser England. I used to watch him from my seat in the Speaker's gallery while discussions were going on, such as those involving the United States, and recognized a man without egotism whose every word was that of one knowing the special strength entrusted to him. He fitted exactly a story Emerson told me. When Cobden was in the thick of the struggle against the Corn Laws, one of his little children asked, Mama, who is that gentleman that comes here sometimes? Never was there a more affectionate domestic character. Soon after my arrival in England, I had the pleasure of breakfasting with Cobden in his rooms near Westminster Hall, and wondered at the extent of his knowledge of our affairs in America. Mill, Cairns, F. W. Newman, and Fawcett were among the few I met in England who had closely studied the constitutional history of the United States, but Cobden knew also the details of our situation. He had traveled in the United States, north and south, and personally knew the leading men in both sections. He had seen a good deal of Jefferson Davis, who was even then, he said, thinking of war as a probability. One thing Cobden said astounded me. He had once traveled with Jefferson Davis and McClellan together, and Davis whispered to him that in case of a war, that man is one of the first we should put into service. The proceedings in the House of Commons on the day of Cobden's death, April 3, 1865, were affecting. I had a place in the Speaker's galley, and that which impressed me especially was the way in which the grief of the whole house did away with formalities. As the deep-toned Westminster clock slowly struck four, the members moved in silently as if summoned by a knell, the ministers following. Not one spoke to another. As they sat in silence with their hats on, I felt as if once more in a meeting of friends. At this moment all eyes were turned to the door as the greatest of friends entered, John Bright. With head bowed under his sorrow, John Bright walked to his place, by the side of which there was a vacancy never to be filled. When Palmerston arose, there rang through the hall something like a cry, followed by a deep hush as the white-haired old man, who had seen the leading men of more than two generations fall at his side, began to speak, his voice quivered and recovered itself only when it sank to a low tone that was deeply pathetic. Having recounted the instances in which Cobden had been signally useful to his country, each instance followed by the refusal of proffered honors and emoluments, he said, Mr. Cobden's name will be forever engraved on the most interesting pages of the history of this country. When Disraeli arose to speak concerning the man whom he had met only in combat, his touching tribute made me feel how irresistible is the force of a right and true man. No mere politician could ever have brought a lifelong antagonist to stand by his grave and say, I believe that when the verdict of posterity is recorded on his life and conduct, it will be said of him that, looking to all he said and did, he was without doubt the greatest political character the pure middle class of this country has yet produced, an ornament to the House of Commons, and an honor to England. Then, as if trying to lift a great burden, arose John Bright. Twice he tried to speak, and his voice failed. At length, with broken utterance, he said a few words, the last being, After twenty years of most intimate and brotherly friendship with him, I little knew how much I loved him until I had lost him. As the large, manly orator, 
spoke these simple words, plaintively as a child, his tears came thick and fast, and a wave of emotion passed through the house and galleries. Six months after the death of Cobden died Palmerston. When Palmerston begged Cobden to enter his cabinet, the answer was, I am necessarily your lordship's antagonist. After forty years the England of Cobden seems tending to absorption in the England of Palmerston, but in 1865 the two were distinct as positive and negative poles. In his eighty-one years Palmerston had followed England. When England wore shoe-buckles and queues, he wore them. When England shed those old leaves, he shed them. A Tory, when England was Tory, a Whig, when England was Whig, a liberal now proposing reforms, now paralyzing them. He was faithful to his motto, Flecti non frangi. Braver men who would not bend were broken, but Palmerston was in miniature his nation, which in its history had not been broken because it could bend. His funeral brought out all the surviving splendors of the old regime. I followed the cortege from Cambridge House, and saw him buried in Westminster Abbey, between Pitt and Fox, with Canning at his feet, and the statue of Chatham rising above him. When the hearse, with its forest of plumes, started from the enclosure of his mansion, it was followed by the solemn royal coaches, but the procession was made gay by the procession of gaudy mayoral coaches, brought from Edinburgh, Liverpool, and other cities and by the forty costumed corporations. Like some huge primeval saurian, with glittering scales passing to its fossil bed, the Palmerston cortege slowly crawled to the abbey. The Prince of Wales, Edward the Seventh, and the Duke of Cambridge entered with the dean, and half the nobility of England were present. The procession had come through sunshine, but just as Lord Thin was reading about the trumpet that was to sound, a storm broke over the abbey, which became so dark that the clergy were nearly invisible. The rain fell heavily, the wind howled about the old walls, and in that darkness the body was lowered, gold rings instead of dust falling on the coffin. It was grand to hear the voice of the invisible organ coming out of the darkness to accompany the choristers singing, His body is buried in peace. When the grave was covered over, the sun came out again lighting up the monuments, but the vast swarm of people outside had been dispersed by the storm. No saint in history ever had so magnificent a funeral as this worldly old lord. That evening I passed with Carlyle, who told me many interesting incidents and anecdotes about Palmerston, ending with the words, Farewell, old friend, many a man of less worth will be seen in your place. But how slight was the excitement caused by the death of either Cobden or Palmerston, compared with that which filled Great Britain when President Lincoln fell. The fete of victory in America had extended to England, and at Aubrey House there was a grand dinner company. John Bright was present, probably his first appearance in company after the death of Cobden. Before the dinner had ended, the butler came in and whispered to Peter Taylor, who sprang to his feet, and said the newsboys were crying the murder of Lincoln. We all arose, the gentlemen rushing to the street to get the papers. It was between nine and ten in the evening when we received confirmation of the appalling news. After the death of Lincoln, my tribute to him appeared in the June Fortnightly Review. Personal Recollections of President Lincoln I said all that it was possible for me to say in appreciation of him as a striking personality. In Fraser, for June, my article went into the political situation entailed. I had high hopes that Andrew Johnson, who had shown some strength of character, might prove a better president to carry out emancipation than Lincoln, for Lincoln had fallen on the very day when he had celebrated the fall of the Confederacy by repeating promises to the white South alone that filled anti-slavery people with anxiety. There was fear that we should find him thereafter ready to amnesty slavery itself. Abraham Lincoln, ten years before his election to the presidency, was for a short time in Congress. His brief career there was marked by one proposal and one utterance, 
the proposal was that there should be added to a measure for abolishing slavery in the district of columbia a provision for the rendition of their owners of slaves escaping into the district which otherwise might be crowded with negroes seeking asylum there he was the same man when see chapter twenty three he said to our deputation suppose i should put in the south these anti-slavery generals and governors what could they do with the slaves that would come to them his notable utterance in congress was his description of military glory as that rainbow that rises in showers of blood that serpent eye that charms but to destroy when he became president lincoln wrote privately to a quaker your people have had and are having very great trials on principles and faith opposed to both war and oppression they can only practically oppose oppression by war but the very state that fired on fort sumter had candidly indicated to the new president before that event how both secession and oppression could be vanquished without war representative ashmore of south carolina said in congress the south can sustain more men in the field than the north her four millions of slaves alone will enable her to support an army of half a million president lincoln had only to use the war power thrust into his hand by slavery to proclaim those four millions free the boasted commissariat of the southern army would have existed no longer when every northern camp was the slave's asylum slavery the titurima causa would have needed every southern white to guard it repeatedly was this urged on the president along with the fact that every loyalist slave might be paid for with a month's cost of war in his message to congress december eighteen sixty three the president said of those who were slaves at the beginning of the rebellion full one hundred thousand are now in the united states military service about half of which number actually bear arms in the ranks thus giving the double advantage of taking so much labor from the insurgent cause etc the president had precisely the same right to take four million of black laborers from the insurgent cause as one hundred thousand with the millionfold advantage of preventing the war altogether after three hundred thousand soldiers had been slaughtered thousands of families draped in mourning commerce by land and sea paralyzed hostility towards england and france engendered thousands of fugitive slaves thrust back into slavery and billions of money wasted the president came no nearer meeting oppression with liberty than to put his livery on one hundred thousand negroes set them to cut the throats of their former masters and sow new seeds of race hatred the evils of slavery as a domestic institution were mere pimples compared with the evils of war the greater evils of slavery were that it kept the country generally in a state of chronic war now and then breaking out into acute eruptions such as the murderous robbery of mexico and the outrages of kansas when secession seemed to be slavery withdrawing from its aggressiveness anti-slavery men welcomed it when the firing on fort sumter seemed to be another war on liberty we felt that liberty had to be defended even when it was plain that the war was being waged by the president not for liberty but solely for the union the probabilities that it would somehow eradicate the root of discord from the nation rendered it necessary to support the northern side there being no prospect of stopping the war but slavery originated in war and in eighteen sixty four it became clear that the war which we were trying to turn against slavery was protecting it habeas corpus was suspended free speech suppressed men were drafted and torn from their families by violence to fight the south slaves were armed and put on much less than the pay given white soldiers and in eighteen sixty four the first attempt to reconstruct a rebel state louisiana was by forcing the loyal negroes to work for their old masters all rebels albeit for paltry wages the disloyal whites were to have suffrage but not the blacks the prospect was that in all the reconstructed states slavery was to return as serfdom most of the letters received from my american friends were full of despair and one from senator sumner was pathetic 
Washington, July 30, 1866. Dear Mr. Conway, if I have not written to you before, it was because my engagements left me no time, and now that Congress has closed, I can do little more than make my apologies. I thank you for your vigilant testimony to the good cause, which has suffered infinitely, first through the terrible tergiversation of the President, and secondly through the imbecility of Congress, which shrank from a contest on principle. If Congress had willed it, we would have carried a bill for political rights as well as for civil rights, and on precisely the same argument, that it was needed in the enforcement of the prohibition of slavery. I tried hard, but could not bring Congress to this duty, but I do not give it up. The President is singularly reticent, but his prejudices are strong. With Seward as counselor, nobody can tell what he will forbear. His policy has been arrested by Congress, but this has been by a deadlock, rather than by establishing a contrary system. Meanwhile, all true Unionists from the South testify alike. Unless something is done, they will be constrained to leave their homes. On this the testimony is concurring, whether from Texas or North Carolina. Governor Hamilton has left Texas, but cannot return. Other Unionists are following his example. I have succeeded during this term in creating a commission for the revision and consolidation of the statutes of the United States. I have also carried through the Senate bills that have already passed the House for the introduction of the metric system of weights and measures, and to these I stopped in the Senate their bad Banks bill repealing our neutrality statute after it had passed the House unanimously. These are incidents of the service which I mention with personal satisfaction, and now for the future, God is with us, I shall fight the battle to the end. You will also. Ever sincerely yours, Charles Sumner. After all, the metric system was never adopted. But what mattered such things at a moment when the United States was being driven daily towards the fearful precipice? The pathos of Sumner's letter was the evidence in it that he had been excluded from the arena. All he could now say was, God is with us. It had troubled me much that in September 1863, Senator Sumner had delivered in New York an arraignment of England, which seemed to me unjust, and still more in 1864, that he had not arraigned President Lincoln for his policy in Louisiana. This policy Senator Sumner defeated after Lincoln's re-election. But during his strange nine months' silence, I expressed my lamentation that the President should have, for the time, overborne the voice of our Abdul in the capital, for the fidelity of whose heart there could be no misgiving. Four months after the President's assassination came the following letter from Senator Sumner. Boston, 15th August, 1865. My dear sir, I honor you so much for the dedication of your genius so completely to the cause of human freedom that I cannot be angry even when I think you do injustice to a fellow laborer like myself. It was a mistake to imagine that I have ever intended to support the bank's reconstruction policy. My hostility to it was declared often to General Banks and to the President himself. Down to the last moment, I was not without hope that I might induce the President to change his mind. On one occasion he said to me, I cannot answer your argument, but I think it can be answered. No, not if you take till doomsday, I replied. And when I found the President persevering, I determined to oppose his Louisiana scheme. You know the result. People from New Orleans say that General Banks now declares that all the rebel states, not omitting Louisiana, must be kept out of the Union for some time to come. There was another moment, more interesting if possible, than that of Louisiana, where I thought you did me injustice. It was in the autumn of 1863, when, as I knew, we were on the brink of war with England. Throughout the month of August, Lord Russell had point-blank refused to stop the rams. On the 4th September, Mr. Adams wrote, This is war. On the 10th September, I spoke in New York according to the information in my possession, feeling that possibly at the last moment I might obtain a hearing, and determined, at least, 
that if war came my speech should portray the character of the relations england would have assumed it was an anxious painful moment and i spoke according to my conscience as well as knowledge knowing well that i should expose myself to misconception and to reproach but resolved to make my appeal the rams were stopped two days before my speech was made if you will kindly look at that speech you will see that it was no perfunctory effort of haste or passion but that it was done carefully and solemnly that at the time our peril from england was greater than from france and that therefore england occupied more attention that curiously and here is a curiosity of diplomacy louis napoleon who has always been against us has carefully avoided stinging and offensive letters so that positively we have nothing to object to france except one the concession of belligerency two the proffer of mediation and three the mexican invasion while hardly a packet came without an offensive dispatch from lord russell and you will see that in my speech i did not fail to expose the conduct of louis napoleon fully and strongly so that the french translator did not dare to reproduce that part of the speech this being so i was astonished and pained when i found myself charged with having said nothing of france and done injustice to england i cannot do injustice to england i know her and love her too well but i have always opposed at home all complicity with slavery and when i saw england by that most unhappy and utterly indefensible concession of belligerency prelude to the tragedy of our war without which it would have been very brief i felt unhappy as when daniel webster supported the fugitive slave bill you will understand this illustration but enough of these things the contest now assumes a new form the president johnson has failed us i saw him often down to the day of leaving washington and i had every reason to suppose that there was the utmost harmony between us indeed he said to me there is no difference between us you and i are alike on this question but god is stronger than the president our cause cannot be lost there is present uncertainty and solicitude but we shall prevail of this be sure and what a country we shall then have good-bye ever sincerely yours charles sumner that sumner had privately pleaded against the proposed serfdom in louisiana no assurance was needed his leniency to lincoln in public no doubt appeared to him necessary to defeat the democratic pro-slavery candidate and the president was re-elected with andrew johnson as vice-president the man who in tennessee had pleaded that the only way to save their slaves was to come back into the union sumner's inopportune diatribe against england appears to me the greatest error of his life it came at a time when all england was coming to our side and when the moral unanimity was of practical importance i knew well the design of seward to supersede sumner as chairman of the senate committee of foreign affairs a removal that he would have patriotic as well as personal reasons to dread and could only explain the attack at that moment as made under a kind of duress the speech would have been fair enough when settlements were to be made but the ingenuities of professional advocacy were not yet in order the recognition of the confederacy by england as a belligerent was not in hostility president lincoln was by exchanges of prisoners and otherwise himself recognizing it as such and had not england recognized the belligerency it must have made itself an auxiliary in the war on the south dealing with them as pirates and outlaws senator sumner's own complaints at home of the repudiation by the administration of any anti-slavery purpose in the war and the assurance through minister adams that slavery would not be affected by the war were the official instructions of earl russell the case against england was good in law but it was unfair to bring in the count about slavery in eighteen sixty two the alabama escaped because of the sudden illness lunacy of the queen's advocate sir r p harding 
at the critical moment. After that, no privateer escaped. Two days before Sumner's attack on England, the rams were stopped. Lord John Russell's offensive dispatches were fair rejoinders to the efforts of Seward to foment trouble, of which Sumner himself informed me, see chapter 22, for Lord John I had no admiration, but he stopped four Confederate rams at a cost to England of nearly three million pounds, and under his neutrality the Union got a thousandfold more from England than the Confederacy. Before the war, Sumner, in an oration on the true grandeur of nations, said, War is known as the last reason of kings. Let it be no reason of our republic. Early in the war, October 1861, in his speech, Emancipation, Our Best Weapon, he proved that the sword could not conquer slavery. The president's refusal to recognize the belligerency of slavery was what prolonged the war. Sumner agreed with the rest of us in that, and his discovery, late in 1863, that it was all England's fault, sounded like Seward. In the above letter, speaking of Johnson, Sumner says, But God is stronger than the President. We shall prevail. And what a country we shall have. What a country! Poor Sumner presently found himself in a country that degraded him in the Senate, degraded him in his own state, and death alone saved him from witnessing the fulfillment of his worst fear, uttered beside the fresh grave of Lincoln, Alas for the dead who have given themselves so bravely to their country, alas for the living who have been left to mourn the dead. If any relic of slavery is allowed to continue, especially if this bloody impostor, defeated in the pretension of property in man, is allowed to perpetuate an oligarchy of the skin. While recognizing Abraham Lincoln's strong personality and high good qualities, I cannot participate in his canonization. The mass of mankind see in all great historic events the hand of God. Having no such faith, I see in the Union War a great catastrophe. President Lincoln, in disregard of the anti-coercion sentiment of press and pulpit, and without consulting Congress, assumed the individual responsibility of sending a half million men to their graves for the sake of a flag. Wilkes Booth assumed the individual responsibility of sending Lincoln to his grave for the sake of another flag. In accepting the challenge at Fort Sumter, as Sumner rightly phrased it, Abraham Lincoln decided that the fate of his country should be determined by powder and shot. In the canonization of Lincoln, there lurks a consecration of the sword. The method of slaughter is credited with having abolished slavery, but by the same method Booth placed in the presidential chair a tipsy tailor from Tennessee, who founded in the South a reign of terror over the Negro race, which has suffered more physically since the war began than under the previous century of slavery, and the white race has suffered in character to such an extent that our presidential father Abraham who persisted in sacrificing his Isaacs instead of the brute caught in the thicket by its horns, could he revisit his country and find us giving up colored citizens to be freely slain and burned, their blood and ashes still cementing the Union, would feel himself a pilgrim sojourning in a strange land on his way to seek the land of his promise. Alas, the promises of the sword are always broken. Always. End of chapter 32, part 2. Chapter 33, part 1 of Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret S. Bayat. Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, Volume 2 by Moncure Conway. Chapter 33, Part 1. Easter Sunday, April 1st, 1866. I traveled all night to witness Carlyle's installation as Lord Rector of Edinburgh University next day. The sleeping car was then unknown. 
The night was bitter and snowy, and the journey dismal. The first man I met in Edinburgh was Professor Tyndall, who said he believed we two and Huxley were the only men who had undertaken the hard journey to hear Carlyle. Taking my hand, he said, This is the real kind of tie between America and England. Carlyle belongs equally to both. No reader in the twentieth century can realize the impression made by Carlyle that day. There is no longer the clear historic background behind that figure, the weary trials, the poverty and want, the long lonely studies, through which the little boy of fourteen climbed on to a youthful condition still more rugged, and finally, despite his alienation of pulpit and populace, gained this height. As Carlyle entered the university theatre, there walked beside him the venerable Sir David Brewster, fourteen years his senior, who first recognized his ability and gave him literary employment. The one, now principal, the other Lord Rector, they moved forward in their gold-laced robes, while professors, students, ladies stood up cheering, waving hats, handkerchiefs, programs in ecstasy. Near me sat Huxley, and not far away Tyndall, in whose eyes I saw tears, unless my own dim eyes deceived me. Carlyle sat there during the preliminaries, scanning the faces before him, among which were a score that would bring to him memories of this or that quiet retreat in Scotland known in youth or boyhood. Before he began his address, Carlyle shook himself free of the gold lace gown and laid it on the back of a chair. This movement excited audible mirth in the audience, and the face of the old principal beamed. For myself I saw in the act the biographer of Cromwell saying, Take away that bauble. No stage actor could with more art have indicated that the conventionalities were about to be laid aside. I had, as I thought, seen and heard Carlyle in every mood and expression, but now discovered what immeasurable resources lay in this man. The grand sincerity, the drolleries, the auroral flashes of mystical intimation, the lightnings of scorn for things low and base, all of these severally taking on physiognomical expression in word, tone, movement of the head, color of the face, brought before us a being whose physical form was a transparency of his thought and feeling. When Carlyle sat down there was an audible motion, as of a breath long held, by all present, then a cry from the students, an exultation. They rose up, all arose, waving their arms excitedly. Some pressed forward, as if wishing to embrace him or to clasp his knees. Others were weeping. What had been heard that day was more than could be reported. It was the ineffable spirit that went forth from the deeps of a great heart and from the ages stored up in it, and deep answered unto deep. When Carlyle came out, a carriage was waiting to take him to the house of Mr. Erskine of Lynn Lathan, but he begged to be allowed to walk. Carlyle had known I was going to Edinburgh, and on arrival I found a note from him asking me to wait for him at the door of the theatre. I was there, and he desired me to see after the newspaper report. But as we started off to walk, he was identified by a delighted crowd who extemporized a demonstration. He found it best to take a cab, but before entering it gave a friendly look on those who were cheering him, saying, however, softly, as if to himself, Poor fellows, poor fellows. The scene I had witnessed was more phenomenal than I could at once take in. It was the revelation of a kind of eloquence and spiritual affluence which set me dreaming. What had the pulpit lost? by putting up dogmas that barred Carlyle away from the career in which he might have illumined all Christendom. The three men who chiefly molded the thought of their generation in England and America were all trained for the pulpit—Darwin, Carlyle, Emerson. They were all shut out of it by their intellectual honesty 
and the inability of the churches to recognize the superiority of a great living oracle to the creeds of defunct crania. I find the following in my notebook. April 4th, evening at Erskine's dinner. Present, Thomas Carlyle and Dr. John Carlyle, Mr. Dundas, lawyer and antiquarian, Dr. John Brown, author of Rab, etc., Professor Lushington of Glasgow University, whose wife, Tennyson's sister, came in after dinner, and one or two other gentlemen and ladies. When we followed the ladies to the drawing-room, they all wished to be introduced to Carlyle. Presently he came to the far end of the room where I was, and said, Oh, dear, I haven't any rest at all. I wish I was through with it. But, I said, you are looking better than usual. Yes, well... It may make me better in the end, but it's tedious work. I am always in company, and see nobody preferable to vacuity. Please, sir, please, madam, might I exchange you for nothing at all? A laugh that seemed to do him good. I'm going up to a smoking-room they've provided me with. Will you come with me? At the top of the house, the long pipe lighted. Carlyle stretched himself in his favorite home position on the floor, and began a slow-running talk. "'Go over the path to Stirling, Dundee, if possible, St. Andrews. You will come down the coast by Kirkaldy. Ah, uh, a long time since I taught school in that place.' Presently, after some interval of silence, every trace of care and weariness in his face passed away. With a sweet, childlike expression, he looked at me, and knowing well the affection as well as the literary enthusiasm that brought to his side a young friend of emerson he took me into his confidence in the following report of his talk i enclose in brackets paragraphs that were recorded at somewhat later dates it seems very strange as i look back over it all now so far away and the faces that grew aged and then vanished a greater debt I owe to my father than he lived long enough to have fully paid to him. He was a very thoughtful and earnest kind of man, even to sternness. He was fond of reading, too, particularly the reading of theology. Old John Owen of the seventeenth century was his favorite author. He could not tolerate anything fictitious in books, and sternly forbade us to spend our time over the Arabian Nights, those downright lies, he called them. He was grimly religious. I remember him going into the kitchen, where some servants were dancing, and reminding them very emphatically that they were dancing on the verge of a place which no politeness ever prevented his mentioning on fit occasion. He himself walked as a man in the full presence of heaven and hell, and the day of judgment. They were always imminent. One evening some people were playing cards in the kitchen when the bakehouse caught fire. The events were to him as cause and effect, and henceforth there was a flaming handwriting on our walls against all cards. All of which was the hard outside of a genuine veracity and earnestness of nature such as I have not found so common among men as to think of them in him without respect. My mother stands in my memory as beautiful in all that makes excellence of woman. Pious and gentle she was, with an unweariable devotedness to her family, a loftiness of moral aim and religious conviction which gave her presence in her humble home a certain graciousness and, even as I see it now, dignity, and with it, too, a good deal of wit and originality of mind. No man ever had better opportunities than I for comprehending, were they comprehensible. The great deeps of a mother's love for her children. Nearly my first profound impressions in this world are connected with the death of an infant sister, an event whose sorrowfulness was made known to me in the inconsolable grief of my mother. For a long time she seemed to dissolve in tears, only tears. For several months not one night passed 
but she dreamed of holding her babe in her arms and clasping it to her breast. At length one morning she related a change in her dream. While she held the child in her arms, it seemed to break up into small fragments, and so crumbled away and vanished. From that night her vision of the babe and dream of it clasping never returned. The only fault I can remember in my mother was her being too mild and peaceable for the planet she lived in. When I was sent to school, she piously enjoined on me that I should, under no conceivable circumstances, fight with any boy, nor resist evil done to me, and her instructions were so solemn that for a long time I was accustomed to submit to every kind of injustice simply for her sake. It was a sad mistake. When it was practically discovered that I would not defend myself, every kind of indignity was put upon me, and my life was made utterly miserable. Fortunately, the strain was too great. One day a big boy was annoying me, when it occurred to my mind that existence under such conditions was not supportable. So I slipped off my wooden clog, and therewith suddenly gave that boy a blow on the seat of honor which sent him sprawling on face and stomach in a convenient mass of mud and water. I shall never forget the burden that rolled off me at that moment. I never had a more heartfelt satisfaction than in witnessing the consternation of that contemporary. It proved to be a measure of peace also. From that time I was troubled by the boys no more. Ah, well, it would be a long story. As with every studious boy of that time and region, the destiny prepared for me was the inevitable Kirk, and so I came here to Edinburgh about fourteen and went to hard work, and still harder work it was when the university had been passed by, the hardest being to find work. Nearly the only companion I had was poor Edward Irving, then one of the most attractive of youths. We had been to the same Annan school but he was three years my senior. Here, and for a long time after, destiny threw us a good deal together. Very little help did I get from anybody in those years, and, as I may say, no sympathy at all in all this old town. And if there was any difference, it was found least where I might most have hoped for it. There was Professor Playfair. For years I attended his lectures, in all weathers and all hours. Many and many a time, when the class was called together, it was found to consist of one individual, to wit, of him now speaking, and still oftener, when others were present, the only person who had at all looked into the lesson assigned was the same humble individual. I remember no instance in which these facts elicited any note or comment from that instructor. He once requested me to translate a mathematical paper, and I worked through it the whole of one Sunday, and it was laid before him, and it was received without remark or thanks. After such long years I came to part with him, and to get my certificate. Without a word he wrote on a bit of paper, I certify that Mr. Thomas Carlyle has been in my class during his college course, and has made good progress in his studies. Then he rang a bell, and ordered a servant to open the front door for me. Not the slightest sign that I was a person whom he could have distinguished in any crowd, and so I parted from old Professor Playfair. It had become increasingly clear to me that I could not enter the ministry with any honesty of mind, and nothing else than offering, to say nothing of the utter mental confusion as to what thing was desired, I went away to that lonely straggling town on the Frith of Forth, Kirkaldy possessing then, as still, few objects interesting to any one not engaged in the fishing profession. Two years there of hermitage, loneliness, at the end of which something must be done. Back to Edinburgh, and for a time a small subsistence is obtained by teaching a few pupils, while the law is now the object aimed at. Then came the dreariest years, eating of the heart, misgivings as to whether there shall be presently anything else to eat, disappointment of the nearest and dearest as to the hoped-for entrance on the ministry, 
and steadily growing disappointment of self with the undertaken law profession. Above all, perhaps, wanderings through mazes of doubt, perpetual questionings unanswered. I had gradually become a devout reader in German literature, and even now began to feel a capacity for work, but heard no voice calling for just the kind of work I felt capable of doing. The first break of gray light in this kind was brought by my old friend David Brewster. He set me to work on the Edinburgh Encyclopedia. There was not much money in it, but a certain drill, and still better, a sense of accomplishing something, though far yet from what I was aiming at, as, indeed, it has always been far enough from that. And now things brightened a little. Edward Irving, then amid his worshippers in London, had made the acquaintance of a wealthy family, the Bullers, who had a son with whom all teachers had affected nothing. There were two boys, and he named me as likely to succeed with them. It was in this way that I came to take charge of Charles Buller, afterwards my dear friend, Thackeray's friend also, and I gradually managed to get him ready for Cambridge. Charles and I came to love each other dearly, and we all saw him with pride steadily rising in parliamentary distinction when he died. Poor Charles! He was one of the finest youths I ever knew. The engagement ended without regret, but while it lasted was the means of placing me in circumstances of pecuniary comfort beyond what I had previously known, and of thus giving me the means of doing more congenial work, such as the life of Schiller and Wilhelm Meister's van der Jahre. But one gaunt form had been brought to my side by the strain through which I had passed, who was not in a hurry to quit, ill health. The reviewers were not able to make much of Wilhelm. De Quincey and Geoffrey looked hard at us. I presently met De Quincey, and he looked pale and uneasy, possibly thinking that he was about to encounter some resentment from the individual whom he had been cutting up. But it had made the very smallest impression upon me, and I was quite prepared to listen respectfully to anything he had to say. And, as I remember, he made himself quite agreeable when his nervousness was gone. He had a melodious voice and an affable manner, and his powers of conversation were unusual. He had a soft, courteous way of taking up what you had said, and furthering it, apparently, and you presently discovered that he didn't agree with you at all, and was quietly upsetting your positions one after another. And now an event, which had been for a long time visible as a possibility, drew on to consummation. In the loneliest period of my later life here in Edinburgh, there was within reach one home and one family to which Irving, always glad to do me a good turn, had introduced me. At Haddington lived the Welshes, and there I had formed a friendship with Jane, now Mrs. Carlyle. She was characterized at that time by an earnest desire for knowledge, and I was for a long time aiding and directing her studies. The family were very grateful, and made it a kind of home for me. But when, further on, our marriage was spoken of, the family, not unnaturally, perhaps, mindful of their hereditary dignity, they were descended from John Knox, opposed us rather firmly. But Jane Welsh, having taken her resolution, showed further her ability to defend it against all comers, and she maintained it to the extent of our presently dwelling man and wife at Comley Bank, Edinburgh, and then at the old solitary farmhouse, Craig and Puttock, that is, Hill of the Hawk. The sketch of it in Goethe's translation of my Schiller was made by George Moyer, a lawyer here in Edinburgh, of whom I used to see something. The last time I saw old Craig and Puttock, it filled me with sadness, a kind of Valley of Jehoshaphat. Probably it was through both struggles of that time, the end of them being not yet, and the happy events with which it was associated, now buried and gone. It was there, and on our way there, that the greetings and gifts of Goethe overtook us, and it was there that Emerson found us. He came from Dumfries in an old rusty gig, came one day, and vanished the next. I had never heard of him, 
he gave us his brief biography and told us of his bereavement in loss of his wife. We took a walk while dinner was prepared. We gave him a welcome. We were glad to see him. Our house was homely, but she who presided there made it of neatness such as were at any moment suitable for a visit from any majesty. I did not then adequately recognize Emerson's genius, but my wife and I both thought him a beautiful transparent soul, and he was always a very pleasant object to us in the distance. Now and then a letter came from him, and amid all the smoke and mist of this world it is always as a window flung open to the azure. During all this last weary work of mine, his words have been nearly the only ones about the thing done. Friedrich, to which I have inwardly responded, Yes, 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 and much obliged to you for saying that same. The other day I was staying with some people who talked about the idols of the king, which seemed idle enough, so I took up Emerson's English traits, and soon found myself lost to everything else wandering amid all manner of sparkling crystals and wonderful luminous vistas, and it really appeared marvelous how many people can read what they sometimes do with such books on their shelves. Emerson has gone a different direction from any in which I can see my way to go, but words cannot tell how I prize the old friendship formed there on Craig and Puttock Hill, or how deeply I have felt in all he has written the same aspiring intelligence which shone about us when he came as a young man, and left with us a memory always cherished. After Emerson left us, gradually all determining interests drew us to London, and there the main work, such as it is, has been done, and now they have brought me down here, and got the talk out of me. I now quote again from my diary. April 5th. A pleasant smoke and chat with Dr. Carlyle. He told me much that was interesting about the Carlyle family. There are now living four brothers and two sisters. One brother and a sister, married, live in Canada. One lives at Annandale, in the middle dale of Dumfrieshire. He, Dr. Carlyle, is six years younger than Thomas. He was induced by a German, with whom he formed a friendship in Edinburgh in early years, to go to Munich to study in his profession. There were also no good medical schools here then. He went a great deal to see Schelling. He belonged to a choice club of German beer-drinkers, who drank, smoked, and gave one another their views on the universe, and it was from his accounts and stories of these men told to Thomas that the idea of Teufelsdruck came into his head. Dr. Carlyle was in Italy a great deal. He had a hard fever when twenty years of age, and his hair fell out. When it grew again, it was perfectly white as it is now, making him look older than his brother. The father, who died about 1832, was a worker who united the callings of mason and architect. He was remarkable for his religious feeling and shrewd proverbial wisdom his sayings being quite well known and often repeated in Annandale now. He afterwards became a farmer. The mother, who died 1853, was also a woman of character and beauty, in particular had fine, large, dark eyes. She read and understood all of Thomas's works, though the subjects were new to her, and even persisted in reading and re-reading the history of the French Revolution until she comprehended it entirely. She was at first disturbed by Carlyle's new religious views, but when she found he was steadfast and in earnest, she cared for no more. Dr. Carlyle is very remarkable, knows all languages, and has a fund of information of every kind. End of chapter 33, part 1《ハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッ
Chapter Thirty Three Part Two. I learned either from Doctor Carlyle or from Carlyle himself that the investments of the latter were many years before made in America, and that when the war broke out there he did not withdraw them. He had his reward and had just received six thousand pounds from Charles Butler, who attended to his affairs in New York. April sixth. Went to dinner at Erskine's. Present, Lord Neve, Sir David Dundas, once in Palmerston's ministry, Admiral Ramsay, Dr. Carlyle, Mr. and Mrs. Patterson, and Lady Blank, beside whom I sat, and who was clever. Carlyle appeared happier than I had ever seen him, and was hardly equaled by Lord Neve, most famous of table talkers. Dundas was a little pompous, reminding me of Edward Everett, whom he knew and admired, but had a goodly number of good anecdotes. After the ladies had left the table, the dignified Dundas became more free and easy, and told us of the epitaph of Pitcairn, the line in doctor. Prospicite virginis, retrospicite matronis, e lugite. Lord Neve laid on this an epitaph he professed to have found on a bibulous old Scotchman named Gladstone. Bacco et tobacco nimium indulgebat. Dundas told the story of old Dr. Parr's being unable to sleep part the night because awakened by a doubt whether the word but in a Latin epitaph should have been at or said. Lord Neve and Carlyle thought Parr was an ass, but Dundas told the story of his having said that somebody, I think Dr. Johnson, may have gone into Abraham's bosom, but if so, he would certainly kick that patriarch's guts out. Smollett was talked of, and Carlyle thinks Humphrey Clinker one of the greatest books ever written. Nothing by Dante or anybody else ever surpassed the scene where Humphrey goes into the smithy made for him in an old house, and whilst beating the iron, the woman, who has lost her husband and become deranged, comes forward and talks to him as her husband, and says, "'John, they told me you were dead. How glad I am you have come!' and his tears fall down and bubble on the hot iron. Carlyle said he remembers no happier day than when, as a boy, he went off into the fields and read Roderick Random, and how inconsolable he was that he could not get the second volume. Lord Neve said it was difficult to know what to do or say about great books that contain impurities, or how to advise young women. Carlyle said he thought they should be encouraged to read, but not talk about them. Mr. Erskine himself said but little, evidently preoccupied with his desire to get the full music out of each guest. A descendant of the Earl of Mar, and kinsman of the famous Erskine, I have no doubt he was a finer man than either. Carlyle told me Erskine began life as a lawyer, but left that for religion. He wrote much on this subject, but lost his Calvinism by going to study in Germany. He was not now in public favor because of his skepticism, but Carlyle held him in high esteem. When we went into the drawing-room, we found there Lady Cirrus and Miss Dobson and others. Carlyle and Lord Neve kept up a grand conversation, surrounded by a half-dozen people. Carlyle, appealed to about the French emperor, said he thought him a swindler, an intensified pig. Lord Neve thought there was a swinish and asinine element in the human bosom, which naturally had its external response. Someone thought the emperor had done a great deal to rule over France so long. Carlyle said it only proved the length of ear of those who recognized a swindler as an emperor. All the men in place in France were such as a man would kick if they wished to black his boots. If the French of old times were alive, Louis Napoleon would long before have been beheaded. Matthew Arnold says that in France England had lost her prestige. It shows that Matthew is a good deal of a goose with considerable sense at bottom. 
the less prestige England has the better. Prestige is only another word for humbug. The Frenchmen say so and so of us. Very well, the fact us remains the same, whatever you say of that fact. Sir David Dundas spoke of a commission once appointed to select four statues to be placed in front of the British Museum, of which he was a member. Macaulay was on it. They were not confined to England or to any nation or age. They agreed upon Shakespeare at once, then on Newton. About Bacon there was a moment's hesitation, when Macaulay started forward and vehemently urged him as one of the greatest of mankind. Milton was the last chosen. Carlyle said it was a mistake to put Bacon before Milton. Sir David demurred a little. Carlyle thought, and Lord Neve rather agreed with him, that Bacon was much overrated. Whilst he was in full glory, the greatest discovery of his age was made at his very door, that of Kepler, and he had no eye to see it. Referring to the line, brightest, wisest, meanest of mankind, he thought it worthless. The qualities and defects named were impossible in the same individual. Carlyle found Dundas sensitive to Homeric criticism, and rather maliciously insisted that Homer was the name ultimately given to a joint stock company of ballad singers. Carlyle said, Clough was as fine a soul as England had produced of late, and would have come to something considerable had he not died. I was entertained at the house of Lady Anna Campbell, to whom I had been made known by the Duke and Duchess of Argyle. She was surrounded by guests, among them Lady Wynne and Sir Henry and Lady Moncrieff. There was no enthusiasm about Carlyle in the company. It was impossible not to remark the snobbery to which nature is easily turned by human selection, which evolves much more beauty in the high rank than beneath it. Nor is there any such compensation for this as proverbial Tupper thought when he connected superiority in a woman with plainness of face. These noble ladies, with their masses of auburn hair, rosy cheeks, and superb necks, were intellectual, well informed in political history, and sympathetically interested in the anti-slavery struggle in America. It was for me curious that a company so brilliant should break up as it did. A bell was rung, six liveried servants came in, and Sir Henry read a long chapter from the Bible and made a long prayer, which carried me back to my early days in Old Virginia. Sir Henry Moncrief himself was indeed a fair type of the gentleman of Scottish descent who had originally settled our neighborhood on the Rappahannock. I had three days before been taken by Dr. John Carlyle to the Signet's Library, where David Lang, the librarian, and Carlyle's university assessor, made some search about those families in Virginia. We finally reached the conclusion that they were transported after the Kenmore and Mar Rebellion, 1715 to 16. Sunday morning I preached at St. Mark's Unitarian Church. If Sir Henry's prayer had carried me to Old Virginia, the hymns and atmosphere at St. Mark's carried me back to Boston. Dr. William Smith, translator of Fichte, took me out to his country house to dine, and his daughter Lizzie, now the wife of Professor Kennedy of London, in singing for me the old Scotch songs, looked like the last to whom those of Burns were written. But she also carried me back to our Boston circle by her perfect interpretations of Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, and Mendelssohn. Carrying numerous letters of introduction, I visited Stirling Castle, then went on to the University of St. Andrews, where I was shown about by Lord Archibald Campbell, the Duke of Argyll's son. I dined with Robert Chambers, a hale old man dividing his interest between golf and spiritualism. He was hospitable and entertaining, but I made up my mind that he never wrote The Vestiges of Creation. The death of Mrs. Carlyle, April 21st, while her husband was still in Scotland, 
was an event which I felt would be so terrible to him that I feared he might not survive it. I gave him a note she had written to me at Edinburgh in response to some particulars I had sent her on the evening of Carlyle's address. It was, after Carlyle's death, returned to me by Froude, and is as follows. 5. Chain Row, Chelsea, 5th of April, 1866. My dear Mr. Conway, the disposition to write me a little note was a good inspiration, and I thank you for it or rather, accepting it as an inspiration, I thank Providence for it. Providence, immortal gods, superior powers, destinies, whichever be the name you like best. Indeed, by far the most agreeable part of this flare-up of success, to my feeling, has been the enthusiasm of personal affection and sympathy on the part of his friends. I haven't been so fond of everybody and so pleased with the world since I was a girl, as just in these days, when reading the letters of his friends, your own included. I am not very well, having done what I do at every opportunity, gone off my sleep, so I am preparing to spend a day and night at Windsor for a change of atmosphere, moral as well as material. I am in a hurry, but couldn't refrain from saying, Thank you, and all good be with you. Sincerely yours, Jane W. Carlyle. When I gave Carlyle the letter, he said it was the last she ever wrote except one to himself. He was distressed that she had not received his last letter. It was written at Scotbrig, the letter which, of all he had ever written, he would have wished her to read, but had been delayed beyond the one post necessary, and he found it on her table, there placed, while she lay dead in the hospital. He told me again of Edward Irving's introducing him to her, and of their marriage. We had a small patrimony, but I had taken up a standard of literature which was by no means the paying kind pecuniarily, and our means grew smaller daily whilst I worked. Well, well, we had heavy trials, trials of a kind different from those which commonly befall people, but in and through them all she never lost her bright smile and her faith. When she was herself ill and suffering severe pain, she was never gloomy. And so she went on through life, shielding me from all the sharp corners of everyday life. And now it is all gone. One instant, and all one's life is shown to be the merest gossamer which a breath may sweep away for ever. He then took me out to the gardens, where we smoked together. He said he must either get at some work or die. Only work could make life sufferable for him now. We then took a long walk in Hyde Park, where he asked me about American affairs, and talked in his usual way about universal suffrage. He said he did not see why votes should be given in America to all the white sots in creation, and not to the Negro. But it was a reductio ad absurdum. He spoke of the Catholic priest in Ireland, who had been the only man, beside Emerson, who made response to Sartor Resartus, when it was appearing in Fraser. Carlyle, when in Ireland, had visited the priest, and found him engaged in some religious exercise or penance in his garden, which required that he should not speak. So Carlyle had to wait for some time, and the conversation amounted to nothing though the priest was pleasant enough, and had a good head. Froude told me that when Carlyle returned from Scotland, he went around Hyde Park with the driver who had driven his wife there on the fatal day, making him show every point in the drive, the place where the dog had been run over, where he had been hailed and told that the lady was fainting, ending at the hospital, where he gazed on the couch where she was laid. Carlyle expressed his desire that I should come as often as I could to see him, and I did so. Occasionally Ruskin came, and it was pleasant to see how serene and beaming was his face, so worn and troubled in appearance, when he entered that room at Chelsea. "'Mr. Carlyle,' he said one evening, "'how few people I know who really can sit down at their own little table and pour out their cup of tea from their own little teapot,' 
and there think and say what is to them true without regard to the world's clamor. Carlyle said, That used to be the characteristic of the English people. Whenever you had an Englishman, you had a man with an opinion of his own. But one doesn't find it so now. The conversation fell upon the cruelty of sports, and Ruskin referred with enthusiasm to Emerson's lines entitled Forbearance. Hast thou named all the birds without a gun, loved the wood-rose, and left it on its stalk, at rich men's table eaten bread and pulse, unarmed, faced danger with a heart of trust, and loved so well a high behavior in man or maid, that thou from speech refrained, nobility more nobly to repay? O be my friend, and teach me to be thine. Ruskin's talk was eloquent, but I found it at times hazy. As I was this morning labeling some minerals, it occurred to me, why haven't you something better to do than labeling minerals? Were you the Duke of so-and-so, would you not be doing nobler work? Then he sped off to something different, indicating, however, that he felt somehow that a man ought to have some relation to the affairs of his country. Carlyle did not respond to this. One evening the conversation related to the clergy. I mentioned, when Charles Kingsley was spoken of, the large reputation he had in America through his books, Alton Locke and Yeast. Carlyle told us of Kingsley's father, a good old squire, and of his mother, a lady who once visited him, bringing her young son Charles. She was intelligent and of some beauty, serious and moist-eyed, looking as if she had emotions she did not care to utter. Probably Charles and Henry inherited their ability from her. When she came with young Charles, he sat in absolute silence during the conversation, and presently turned aside and wrote something. When Charles first preached his liberalism, some one eminent in the church denounced him for heresy. At that the elder Kingsley was much grieved, and Charles said to any doubter of his orthodoxy, Mentiris impudentissime. Thenceforth a decline. Ruskin thought there were some good things in Alton Locke, but the poor do not always communicate the smallpox, nor is it the greatest trouble of life not to be able to wed a dean's daughter. I objected to the falsity of making research end in a church rectorship. Ruskin and Carlyle then spoke at length of the troubles that outspoken clergymen like Colenso had suffered. Dean Stanley said Ruskin, got on more easily by consummate tact and uttering his heresies in the least startling manner, or even in a way that rendered them least visible at the time they were uttered. He honored Stanley for the high position he took in standing by Colenso. I think Carlyle outgrew some of his heroes. When Germany conferred the order of civil merit on him, he was rather irritated by it. When I mentioned it, he said he should have been as well satisfied if they had sent him a few pounds of good tobacco. He had said to Varnhagen von Ense, who called on him with thanks of all Germany for the life of Friedrich, I have had no satisfaction in it at all, only labor and sorrow. What the devil had I to do with your Friedrich anyhow? My first misgivings about Cromwell came from Carlyle. I had got high ideas of him from the last lecture on heroes and hero-worship, but when I said something in that vein it was plain that he had moderated, if not lost, his old enthusiasm for Cromwell. He spoke of Cromwell's power, of the strong nose buttressing the forehead of him, but the only other comment was that it was a grievous thing to break all of the ties binding men to an existing order, whatsoever its evils. In his lectures on heroes there is at every turn a ring of lingering Calvinism. 
the Cromwellian war was the struggle of men intent on the real essence of things against men intent on the semblances and forms of things. But when the discovery was made that Puritanism did not represent the real essence of things, but dogmatized on things of which it was most ignorant, Carlyle had more consideration for the semblances. We were once talking about John Calvin. About the burning of Servetus by Calvin, Carlyle said, Probably there is no greater proof of a man's real belief in a thing than that he is willing to burn his fellow man for the sake of it. I expressed satisfaction that there no longer existed any such real belief. He then went on to speak of the English church as the apotheosis of decency. Speaking of Swedenborg, he described the old inn in the city where Swedenborg had his first vision. I stopped there when I first came by coach to London. Swedenborg was just crazy enough to be unable to distinguish between inward and outward impressions. The nervous system is so mysterious that I would not assert that his alleged knowledge of the fire at Stockholm, when he was at a long distance, is impossible. But I have not seen sufficient evidence of it. Carlyle was very compassionate. I well remember the wrath with which he spoke one evening to Mr. Ruskin and myself, of seeing at the zoological gardens living mice put into the cages of snakes. He watched a rattlesnake, not yet hungry, but with its cruel, glittering eye fixed on the mouse, whose every limb was trembling with terror. Such laws of this universe, as the instinct of snakes to prey on mice, did not silence Carlyle's protests against cruelty. It was largely through his influence that vivisection was restricted. When John Burroughs, laureate of the American birds, went with me one evening to Chelsea, Carlyle astonished us by his knowledge of birds and love of them. The Mavis he thought next to the nightingale in song, and then came the blackbird, not of that species noted for his accomplishment in picking holes in things. The lark, though monotonous, is always pleasing. He found it a kind of welcomer wherever he went. The linnet was a pleasant bird. The London house sparrow was impudent as could be, and would hardly get out of one's path. He imitated its pert look and popping up of its head admirably. He remembered the dignified unconcern of a cat passing close by about five hundred of them chattering away about their affairs, and bethought him of the Arabian legend that Solomon's temple was erected under the chirping of thirty thousand sparrows, all met to give a joint disapproval of the project. Lee Hunt used to send him here and there to listen to the singing of the nightingale, but he could not hear one until on a certain day there came a song which he recognized by Goethe's description. He compared the poet to it, a voice sounding amid the din like the nightingale, touching and strong. These words told the whole thing. It was not sad, but pathetic and somewhat piercing. It is incomparable. He listened to it fifteen minutes, but never heard the nightingale again. It is passing away from about London. He heard of one lately singing in Green Park. It doesn't go farther north than the bottom of Yorkshire. It is said it cannot find farther up what it requires to eat. Alexander Ireland told me that, after visiting Carlisle in 1833 at Craig and Puttock, Emerson met him, Ireland, with the exclamation, What a wonderful child! Never was Carlyle better labeled, unless by Emerson's words after his friend's death. He was a trip-hammer with an Aeolian attachment. The child in Carlyle was wounded when, 1848, Emerson was in his house unable to share his reaction and even carrying off the whole Carlylean congregation. The child in him wept in secret but his biographer brought the ebullition to light to the distress of Emerson's friends in England. 
I knew them well, and was among them when Froude's work was published. Although I regretted that the private entry should appear without explanation, it was of too much historical interest to be suppressed. I reproduce it because long acquaintance with the English friends of Carlyle and Emerson made clear to me the circumstances which, for the memory of both and their fifty years of friendship, should now be related. The entry, dated February ninth, 1848, is as follows. Emerson is now in England, in the North, lecturing to mechanics institutes, etc. In fact, though he knows it not, to a band of intellectual canaille. Came here and stayed with us some days on his first arrival. Very exotic. Of smaller dimensions, too, and differed much from me as a gymnosophist sitting idle on a flowery bank may do from a wearied worker and wrestler passing that way with many of his bones broken. Good of him I could get none, except from his friendly looks and elevated, exotic, polite ways, and he would not let me sit silent for a minute. Solitary on that side, too, then? Be it so, if so it must be. But we will try a little further. Lonelier man is not in this world that I know of. It was a terrible trial for a man who, after slow years of toil and poverty, had gained the applause of the best heads in his country, to find himself in the position of a lost leader. But it was just that which Emerson's presence in England revealed to Carlyle. The overthrow of kings on the continent he welcomed with his adherents, because they were sham kings, and in his vision he beheld them succeeded by real kings, by Cromwells or Friedrichs, but his flock dreamed only of democracy filling their place, and to Carlyle that meant anarchy. Though John Stuart Mill said, Carlyle turned against all his friends, I think the friends had shaped in themselves out of his French Revolution, and his Cromwell, a Carlyle that never existed. In those works he merely cleared sham potentates from thrones they were usurping, that the real kings might sit on them. In their eagerness to find a new leader, they also shaped an Emerson that did not exist. For Emerson freely declared his distrust of masses, and his desire to see individuals developed out of them. Democracy in America meant a majority wielded by slavery. But while presenting no system of his own, Emerson refused to accept that of Carlyle. He did not believe that the ideal kingdom was at hand, nor lose his hopes of mankind. This was enough for the Carlylians amid the thunder of toppling thrones and breaking chains. Although Carlyle believed that Emerson's audiences in the provincial institutes were canaille, he knew that in and around London it was the best people who were carried away by the enthusiasm for Emerson, the Martineaus, Hennels, Marion Evans, George Eliot, Matthew Arnold, the Howitts, Sir Arthur Phelps, Sir A. Allison, W. E. Forrester, M. P., Richard Cobden, M. P., W. J. Fox, M. P., J. S. Mill, Arthur Clough, Monckton Milnes, Lord Houghton, the Carpenters, Dr. Chapman, and others. J. A. Froude met him at Oxford, and his life, he declared, was influenced by him. It was impossible for the childlike heart of Carlyle not to feel the pain of this break between himself and his circle. Mrs. Carlyle was in such distress that she complained to Espinas that he talked too much about Emerson. But, says Carlyle in his loneliness, we will try a little further. A resolution speedily justified. Emerson, surrounded by those whom Carlyle had awakened, was everywhere affirming his love and confidence in him, extolling his honesty and grandeur in uttering his thought even when unwelcome to his friends. Carlyle could hardly fail to know this. He never knew all that Emerson had done for him when he was in poverty. I heard him say that there was something material in the way America treated me, 
but he never knew that the money sent for him, for his first books, was got by Emerson and his friend Dr. LeBaron Russell, going from house to house, man to man, fairly compelling them to subscribe for the volumes. His love of Emerson was never really disturbed. He spoke of him as the cleanest intellect on this planet. In 1880 I called on him before a journey to America, and as I was leaving he said, Give my love to Emerson. I still think of his visit to us in Craig and Puttock as the most beautiful thing in my experiences there. When I returned from America in 1881, Carlyle had sunk very low. His mind was yet in fair strength, and he was reading over the German books which had influenced him in youth. His eightieth birthday had brought him many letters and telegrams of congratulation. It was one of the unpleasantest days I ever passed. Few people know how miserable a thing is life when the strength has gone out of it. Some of my friends lately sent for a doctor here, but it would have been just as useful to pour my ailments into the shaggy ear of a jackass. I said to him, the only benefit you could do me would be to mingle some arsenic with this cup of tea. But as the law forbids that, there is no reason for your remaining professionally. He was a sensible sort of man. End of chapter 33, part 2《Chapter 34 Part 1 of Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret Espayat. Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, Volume 2 by Moncure Conway. Chapter 34 Part 1 on one of those blissful mornings which pass the year insensibly from spring to summer, beneath whose glow England expands like a water-lily on her silver seas, I sat in the study of the most eminent art critic in the world. The house at Denmark Hill was embowered with trees, old patriarchs that had watched over the home for a hundred years. Everything betokened wealth, taste, and elegance. The halls ended in airy apartments, and these into conservatories lustrous with floral offerings from every zone. The luminous walls and tinted ceilings combined to give the best light to choicest works of art. As I waited in the library, gazing now at the pictures, and now at the fresh lawns stretching from the low windows, I seemed to be in the ideal home of a man elected by destiny to study the beautiful. He, Ruskin, was affable and kindly in manner, but with something retractile about him, as of one oversensitive and on guard over two quick sympathies. He had the look and voice of an idealist, but not the calmness of the optimist. He was emotional and nervous, and his voice, though rich and sweet, had a tendency to sink into a hopeless tone. His large light eye was soft and genial, his mouth thin and severe. The brow was prominent and suggested power, the chin was receding and weak. I felt at once a discrepancy between the man and his home. The home meant contentment and peace, the man meant restless striving, ideals unfulfilled. He showed me exquisite works of art by masters, but turned away from them one after another, as if a tantalus seeking fruits and finding only blossoms. He spoke eagerly of his American friends, especially of Charles E. Norton and his family. I do not remember his talk, except that he bewailed the mere mercantile conditions of domestic service, and thought the negro in a kindly southern home must be happier by the life contract that made him a member of the family. Ah, if the Southerners had all been Ruskins! My call was brief, and I went off with the sorrowful feeling that this charming man, so affectionate and appreciative of feminine beauty, 
should be alone in that mansion and its pretty gardens. One who had acted as Ruskin's secretary told me that though Ruskin was under fifty, any allusion to his divorced wife made him suddenly eighty. The affection between Ruskin and Carlyle was beautiful. Carlyle cared little for the arts, but loved any man who had mastered the art and mystery of any vocation. I felt it distressing when Ruskin, by a chivalrous blunder, put Carlyle into a false position requiring a public disclaimer. The facts were, as I had reason to believe, that as Carlyle was returning home from his afternoon walk, one or two rough lads observing his striking appearance called out to him. Whether Ruskin was with Carlyle or met him at his door, I do not recall, but he either witnessed the incident, or Carlyle mentioned it, and went on with some lamentation on the degeneracy of the time. However that may be, Ruskin, in hot resentment, proclaimed with bitterness that Carlyle could not walk about Chelsea without being jeered at. In fact, Chelsea was proud of Carlyle, who wrote to the Times gently that Ruskin's statement was the reverse of the fact. Carlyle was troubled at having to do this, which brought on Ruskin reproofs from the press, but said to me, The gods could not save Ruskin. It so happened that this flurry, June 1867, immediately preceded a lecture by Ruskin on contemporary art at the Royal Institution. Ruskin had not written any reply to Carlyle or to the attacks, but before beginning his lecture he said words nearly like these. It may be expected that I would say something concerning the matter which has been publicly discussed relating to a statement of mine, but I will only say here that there are reasons, quite apart from the question of my accuracy, which prevent me from saying anything on the subject. This was said so simply, so quietly, and Ruskin was so unconscious of their pathos, that there was a burst of applause. He then proceeded with his lecture. Sir Henry Holland was in the chair, with Earl Stanhope and Sir Roderick Murchison supporting him. In the audience were Sir John Millay, the artist, and his wife, formerly Mrs. Ruskin. Ruskin continued, I believe, to visit Mr. and Mrs. Millay. In enumerating the characteristics of contemporary art, Ruskin named first its compassionateness. Eugène Sue had said, If only the rich knew, and art did know the depths of truth and beauty among the poor. Ancient art honored the palace. That of today loves the cottage, prefers peasants to kings. It was significant that the compassionate art has its great representative in Edouard Frere, Edward the brother. Ruskin exhibited a painting by Frere of a cottage interior scantily furnished, its only occupant a little girl scraping carrots. You will observe, he said, the sympathetic touches of light and shade in this picture. Wherever there exists sensitiveness to human conditions, there is also a sensitiveness to light and shadow. The second characteristic of the art of the present day is its domesticity. Ancient art waited in the forum, ours lingers in the nursery. And this, he regretted to say, with all its advantages, was closely connected with its third characteristic, shallowness. For people to be entirely comfortable in their little nests implies some narrowness. Here occurred an incident unprecedented in the institution, whose audiences are the creme de la creme. An old gentleman who had taken something stronger than cream, now and then gave vent to his feelings by ejaculating, Quite right, that's so, and presently was so continuous that Ruskin stopped, Tyndall went to him and said mildly, "'Come, friend, leave.' "'I beg your pardon,' replied the old gentleman with a good humor that made the audience roar. "'I've come to hear Ruskin. I'll sit here.' Then Tyndall took hold of an arm, burned Jones of a leg, and the man was removed. Tyndall and Jones presently appeared near the lecturer, very warm, and were greeted with cheers. Ruskin, in proceeding, read from his notes sentences so oddly appropriate to the occurrence 
that we were excited to laughter, in which he joined. Sequent on the domesticity of art is its eccentricity. The sense of everything true is lost in a hubbub of voices. He went on to say that the art of the present day was injured by a straining after originality and the perpetual introduction of dramatic effects. As ancient art began to emphasize the dramatic element instead of form and color, it declined and at last became vapid. All that was valuable in modern art was a movement against this vapidity. At the head of these reformers he placed Rossetti. He exhibited a painting which he had snatched from Rossetti's studio. It was painted at the time Rossetti was bursting out into his passionate religious art. The painting represented the Passover in the house of Joseph while Jesus was a child. Mary, kneeling, sprinkles blood on the lintels of the door. Jesus in a pink gown looks on, while young John fastens a sandal on his foot, allusion to the words, the latchets of whose shoes I am not worthy to loose. The picture was wonderful for color, and the figure of Jesus beautiful. The incident, he said, might have happened in any Jewish home. Another of this school was Burne Jones, several of whose designs for tapestry were hung behind the lecturer. One of these was Love Leading Alcestis, and another the two wives of Jason, hand in hand, Medea and Hypsipyle. The beauty and refinement of these faces were felt by all. He also spoke of Burne Jones' fine picture of St. Dorothea. The leading figure of the picture is the angel bringing flowers from heaven. The saint's funeral is removed into a corner of the background. Domenichino, said Ruskin, would have put the angel into the corner and the corpse in front. But the English and Italian public had exchanged tastes, and London is now frescoed with the bill-poster's talking head to offset the street frescoes of Verona and Padua. This allusion to the poster of some exhibition at the Polytechnic excited much merriment. Wherever there was frivolity among the people, there was a disposition to gloat over horrible forms. When Robert le Diable was performed at the opera, it was not considered enough that the corpses should rise up in the abbey and become ballet dancers, but a great stroke was made by having a row of corpses holding candles while the others danced. He showed some grotesque figures by Doré, and it was a sad symptom that Burne Jones should have been almost derided while the British public called for Doré to illustrate its Bible. This wretchedness of the public taste rendered it impossible that high English art should exist at present, and as a national art must be produced from a nation's inner life, the real school of art must for a long time be our streets, our chief designs to make the people clean within and without. Baptism is the great sacrament to save the poor just now. When the rich were inwardly baptized, the poor would be outwardly cleansed. In 1880 the London Institution announced for St. Patrick's Day a lecture by Ruskin with a sensational title, A Caution to Snakes. It drew a crowd, but so little was this famous man known personally that he stood for some time near the desk chatting with friends without being recognized. When the applause came, he did not appear conscious of it, and went on chatting, and when he began his lecture it was as if he were simply continuing his conversation. He stood with a pictorial background of snakes, indeed framed in an arch of snakes. Alluding to a lecture on snakes, given there by Huxley, he expressed his affection for Darwin, and his sincere respect for Huxley. Professor Huxley knows all about the inside of snakes, and I know something about the outside of them, and that is what I mean to talk about. No paper reported this strange lecture, but I made notes, and quote some of them in a detached way. A snake is a lizard that has drawn in its legs, a duck that has lost its wings, a fish that has dropped its fins, a honeysuckle that has taken on a head. You will see at the top a representation of Giotto's design for a sculpture on the Campanile at Florence, the creation of Eve. 
that artist in his series of designs for the panels would not adopt the story of any fall or serpent. Eve rises up to meet her creator beneath a tree, and above her head ivy twines around the tree's trunk, a mere suggestion of danger. Beside this portrait of the spots of an English viper, I have placed a decorative design much used by the ancient Greeks. You will observe that the basis of the decoration is a spotted serpent, but it has a flower at the end instead of a head. The attitudes assumed by serpents are prefigured by the forms of vegetation. Here is a cranberry vine, which creeps along until it shoots up a stem which curves over to its flower, and you will see how like it is to the cobras there erect with curved necks. This eel-pie island of ours does not yet know how an eel swims up a waterfall. Imagine yourself with your feet tied together, and the whole of you tied up in a bag, trying to swim up a waterfall many times your own height. How does the eel manage it? God knows. The motion of a serpent, when the whole of his force is put forth, is a kind of skating on this side and that, himself being the ice. The snake whose bite is most fatal is that which the Portuguese call the cobra of death. It is only three or four inches long, it goes by leaps, but this little pipe-stem creature has only to touch a man with his tooth, and death surely follows. The colors of the fatal serpents are not bright or beautiful. They are dull, muddy, repulsive. Though twenty thousand of the queen's subjects annually die of snake-bites, there is no full treatise in the English language on the poison of serpents. The upturned face of this rattlesnake has something human about it. This may be partly accidental, and due to the artist, but really the interest which has in every country invested these reptiles has been due to the fact that it has seemed a type of degraded humanity. It has an expression of human cunning and malice. Although much has been said of the serpent's wisdom, it is not nearly so clever as a crab. At one point Ruskin caused amusement by persuading two reluctant officials to stand up on high chairs, about twenty feet apart, in order to display the skin of a boa constrictor. Ruskin himself then leaped nimbly up on the table before him, and stood at one side in order that the skin might be seen. In that prominent position he began describing the action of the boa, how, elastic as any small snake, it seized its prey by the action of a whiplash, but when the coil was once round the victim, the lash was as a watch-spring with the rigidity of iron. The action of the boa was described with appropriate gesture, the whole being so dramatic as to elicit applause. This appeared to surprise Ruskin, who, looking down, perceived that he was standing on top of his desk, and then leaped down with a boyish movement and smile. Of course, it could not have been a lecture by Ruskin if it had not closed with a moral discourse. He said that if, to illustrate the subject, he had then and there put serpent poison into the most worthless lout in England, they would have been filled with horror at the crime. Yet multitudes of poor louts in the country are poisoned in many ways daily. His own College of the Body of Christ, Corpus Christi, at Oxford, derived much of its revenue from a public-house which poisons a whole village with its adulterated drinks. Another moral was, that wise as the serpent was reputed to be, he was so silly as to swallow his blanket as real food. He was thus a type of educational cram. Thousands of youths supposed to be undergoing education were simply swallowing books, as the boa does his blanket, they swallow what is laid before them without tasting or knowing what they are eating. In this our youth ought to be wiser than serpents. Professor Huxley told me that some scientific men present declared the lecture wild. Perhaps that was its chief charm. There was a wild beauty about all the transfigurations before us of forms towards which our human horror has been bred into an instinct. There were many opinions of Ruskin, 
with which I could not agree, but I never read or heard a word of his that did not stimulate thought and suggest truth. He was an inspired egoist without egotism, a spirit at once lowly and aspiring, to whom any mistake is forgiven. Wonderful London! Amid the turmoil of fogs of the city, of a mercantile family was born and reared this hyper-aesthetic St. George, who encountered the dragon, and was devoured. It was at an early period in my London life that I met the Rossettis. Dante Gabriel Rossetti charmed me by his fine freedom of thought and feeling before I could thoroughly appreciate his works. He was a unique personality, free from prejudice, and absolutely dedicated to beauty, whether blessed or unblessed. His poems and paintings are so exquisitely exotic that one has to live up to them individually. They have conveyed to the world the impression of a somber spirit like the great Italian poet whose name he bore, but he was sociable and generous, and had a rich vein of humor. He gave pleasant dinners, at which William, his brother, Swinburne, W. B. Scott, Maddox Brown, Stillman, when in town, were generally present, and to which I was sometimes invited. He eagerly joined in the talk, he was a fine wrangler, and, indeed, I think some of his friends took pains to raise discussions that would bring out his wit and the colors of his sensibility. He loved to poke fun at familiar friends, and wrote nonsense verses about them, some of which I remember. One was on the artist and poet W. B. Scott, whose Year of the World Emerson so admired. Scott wore a wig. There is an old party called Scott, who seems to have hair but has not. He seems to have sense, a still grosser pretense, on the part of the party called Scott. Another victim was the academician Val Princep. There is a creator called God, whose creations are sometimes quite odd. I maintain, and I shall, the creation of Val reflects little credit on God. At a dinner given to Stillman, at which Whistler, a confederate, related with satisfaction his fisticuff with a Yankee on shipboard, William Rossetti remarked, I must say, Whistler, that your conduct was scandalous. Stillman and myself were silent. Dante Gabriel promptly wrote, There is a young artist called Whistler, who in every respect is a bristler, a tube of white lead or a punch in the head, come equally handy to Whistler. Another rhyme I remember. There's the Irishman Arthur O'Shaughnessy, on the chessboard of poets upon is he. Though bishop or king would rather the thing to the fancy of Arthur O'Shaughnessy. His quickness in rhyme-making once led his friends to challenge him with certain names, one that of a model named Olive. He instantly produced a verse of which I remember only two lines. There is a young female named Olive. When God made her, he made a doll live. The paintings of Rossetti were a revelation to me. In my earthward pilgrimage they gave me a movable oasis that went with me through every desert of negation, and preserved the beauty in every lost belief. I fancied in his paintings a pilgrimage of the same kind. His earlier ones had dealt with subjects traditionally holy, but the Madonna drew nearer, and dwelt on earth in the poetic nature of his sister Christina. I can never forget the emotion with which I saw his picture of Mary Virgin. The Virgin is a lovely maiden, a perfect portrait of Christina, seated beside St. Anna, her mother, Mrs. Rossetti, while their father, as St. Joachim, is trimming a vine that climbs above the window. Mary Virgin has before her embroidery. She is copying a lily on which two flowers have expanded, while above these is a bud not yet unfolded. The lily has grown high from a vase whose ornaments are symbolical. An angel is watering the stem, this angel being a portrait of his other sister, Maria. The details of the picture are very fine, but it was the general purport that I found so impressive. 
In 1856, Rossetti made a drawing of Mary Magdalene at the door of Simon the Pharisee. He never put this picture on canvas, but painted the head of Jesus, now in my possession. In 1867, he gave me a full-sized photograph of the original drawing, and this picture, which he retouched and inscribed, remains a source of happiness. What has become of the original, I know not. After his death, large photographs of his pictures were made by Frederick Collier, and issued to subscribers by his brother William, by whom each is signed, but the Mary Magdalene is not among them. End of chapter 34, part 1Chapter 34, Part 2 of Autobiography, Memories, and Experiences, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret S. Bayat. Autobiography, Memories, and Experiences, Volume 2 by Moncure Conway. Chapter 34, Part 2. A large company of merrymakers is passing along the narrow street with music, all in rich costumes and garlands, led by the fairest of them, Mary Magdalene. But as they pass, Mary sees at an open window a face that makes her pause. The eyes of Jesus have met hers. She is seen ascending the few steps that lead to the door, not heeding the youths trying to restrain her, tearing off her garlands. Her long, wavy hair floats back, and the pathetically beautiful face is stretched forward, forever turned away from her gay companions, who stand, stricken with wonder, to the one face. From her girdle hangs the antique round flagon of spikenard. The picture started me on a quest concerning the Magdalene, with the result of my discovery that the story of her immorality and her penitence was not only unauthorized by the New Testament, but inconsistent with it. Footnote. The late Bishop of London preached an eloquent sermon in St. Paul's Cathedral, in which he pictured Jesus as having around him all the types of human character. Among these types was Mary Magdalene, the penitent. Through the Westminster Gazette, I asked his lordship his reason for supposing that Mary Magdalene had any more reason for penitence than any other lady in Jerusalem. My note was printed under the heading, A Much Calumniated Lady. His lordship printed a respectful admission that there was no authority in the New Testament for the received story, but it was an ancient church tradition. In 1887 I was visited by the Rev. Dr. R. S. Storrs, who was much interested in this picture, and I afterwards read in the New York Independent the report of an address given by him, October 5, 1887, at Springfield, Massachusetts, in which he said, I saw, not a great while ago, in the house of a gentleman then living in Brooklyn, an etching by Gabriel Rossetti, of which I have never seen any other copy, and of which I doubt if any other copy exists. It pictured the Magdalene, riding through the streets of Jerusalem with a crowd around her. Her tumbled gold of hair fell upon her shoulders. Everything in her dress was wanton and lascivious. Everything in her face portrayed marvelous beauty, but with animal passion flaming through it. The traces of passion, however, were of the past. Even as she rode, with the attendants around her, with the crowd of her admirers, with the spangles on her dress and with the crown of flowers upon her head, she caught the eye of the Christ and saw his face looking from the window upon the street, and her face had blanched into a pallid hue, and she was tearing with trembling and swift hands the crown from her head and the ornaments from her dress, and flinging them into the street before the face and eye of the Son of God. I thought to myself, there is a type of the change in every heart, however sinful, when it sees the face of Christ. Self-rebuke, piercing pangs of remorse rising in it, but at the same time the wondering love, the adoration of the Spirit toward him by whom this marvelous 
an instantaneous change hath been wrought. The memory of Dr. Storrs was at fault in two details. She is not writing, and her face is refined. But no minister can easily see any Magdalene not voluptuous. This is the way the myth grew, and will grow, because her supposed sinfulness makes the charm of the romance. End of footnote. Rossetti's Mary Magdalene was drawn from Miss Siddle two years before she became his wife, and is, I believe, the only portrait of her at that early time. It is beautiful. It is probable that after her tragical death, February 1862, this portrait possessed too much sacredness for him to give the picture to the world. There was enough in the romance of Rossetti and his wife to recall that of Jules the sculptor in Browning's Pippa Passes. When Rossetti found her, she was a model. Holman Hunt painted from her his Sylvia, Millet his Ophelia, but Rossetti saw in her the possibility of a creation higher than pictorial art could produce. He taught her in art, and she became an able artist. After her death he collected all her pictures. Among them was a very striking one which she had called Shipwreck. A group of women on a cliff are endeavoring to rescue those wrecked. In showing us these pictures, Rossetti said, Had she lived, she would have done better work than I. In Mary Magdalene at the house of Simon the Pharisee, there are thirteen interesting faces. The youth with garlanded head, who seeks to restrain Mary, resembles the poet Swinburne. There has been this long time a discussion concerning the man who sat as a model for this wonderful head of Jesus. It is said by one party to have been Sir Edward Byrne Jones, by the other party George Meredith. The picture being celebrated, the claims have been rather warmly asserted. William Rossetti told me that his brother got Byrne Jones to sit for him, but once on receiving a call from George Meredith, who was not unlike Burne Jones, he took some traits from him. The painting, it is before me as I write, easily reminds me of both of those fine faces, but the hair and beard are drawn from the purely fictitious letter ascribed to Publius Lentulus. His beard, full, of an auburn color like his hair, not long, but parted. The most wonderful feature is the eye, luminous, clear, freighted with a serene strength drawing Mary to his feet. Rossetti had not the least interest in Christian dogmas, and never alluded to them, nor did he ever attend any church or chapel, but he had created out of the Christian legends and symbols a new set, and thus fashioned a poetic religion for himself. Everything had to be transmuted, he paints Mary holding the infant Jesus in leading strings. His little hand grasps at a passion flower. If he paints a subject from some poem, it must first fall into his mind as a seed and flower into a new poem. Such was the gate of memory which I purchased at Christie's. This beautiful picture was suggested by a poem of W. B. Scott entitled Mary Ann. My friend Scott as I note in his reminiscences, erroneously supposed that his idea was represented in the painting. The poem is of a betrayed woman wandering in London, where she sees a group of innocent children at play. Embittered by the recollection of her own former innocence and happiness, she curses the children. Rossetti told me what he had in mind when painting this picture. The betrayed woman looks through an arched gateway which is the mystical gate of memory. She sees there a vision of her childhood when, as a harvest queen, children and maidens joined hands and danced around her. She looks in, not with anger, but with patient sorrow. Her head is uncovered, save by its abundant hair. She gathers her shawl close around her, for she is in the cold street, and at her feet between her and the vision runs a rat, a symbol of the betrayer's lust, that separated her from that flower-crowned self. When I purchased these pictures, Rossetti asked me to lend them to him, 
and I did so. But my wife became anxious lest he might alter them seriously. So we went down to his studio, and he smilingly gave them back, admitting that he had thought of retouching them, but concluded like ourselves that they had best remain. Rossetti was an appreciative friend of my wife, and we generally went to his studio together. We witnessed the progress of some of his pictures, among these Love Leading Dante to Beatrice on the Day of Her Death. On the day when he told us of its completion we hastened to see it, and were there with him alone. He sat beside his work and read to us the poem he had translated from the Vita Nuova, now and then pausing at some line to look on us as if asking if we realized its depth. The lines especially related to the picture are these. Then, lifting up mine eyes, as the tears came, I saw the angels, like a rain of manna, in a long flight flying back heavenward, having a little cloud in front of them, after which they went and said, Hosanna. And if they had said more, you should have heard. Then love said, now shall all these things be made clear. Come and behold Our Lady where she lies. These wildering fantasies then carried me to see my lady dead. Even as I there was led, her ladies with a veil were covering her, and with her was such very humbleness that she appeared to say, I am at peace. When Rossetti read that the angels said Hosanna, and if they had said more you should have heard, he paused and said, That is quaint. And from that point his voice became lower and subtly sweet, even moving in the words, I am at peace. The portrait of his wife was on the wall just above his head. The genius of Dante Rossetti expressed itself in every least line of his countenance. It was as smooth in every part as if carved, but lights and shades passed over it, and sometimes shifting colors. The eyes now drooped, now expanded. That day when the painting he most loved was completed, he was himself a picture never to be forgotten. We comprehended the mystical meaning of that kiss of Eros. For the face of love was that of the young wife he had lost, and the Beatrice on whom love's lips were pressed was Mrs. William Morris. His wife, whom one night on entering their bedroom he had found seated at her toilet table dead, might well have leaned out of heaven to kiss Mrs. Morris, for it was she who had lifted the soul of Rossetti out of the grave. I have not in my long life known anything more quasi-miraculous than this reappearance in modern London of Dante and Beatrice. There was no slightest consciousness in it, no poetic posing. The superb lady, great-hearted and sincere, recognized the fine spirit to which she was related and responded to his visions and ideals. He painted from her many of his most high and spiritual pictorial poems. Happily she had a husband who could not only write poems, but appreciate the poem lived in his household. Mrs. William Morris had no levity about her. She was long our neighbor, and I had the pleasure of assisting the efforts of herself and her daughters to clear away some of the evils of Hammersmith. Earnest and serious as she was beautiful, her presence lent a charm to every company in which she appeared, and she was honored by all who knew her and Dante Rossetti as one who thought for herself and was great enough to live in accordance with her own heart. Intellectually, Dante Rossetti was a free thinker, though in a vague and untrained way. It was, I believe, because the Protestant dogmas had never touched him at all, and the Catholic creeds with which he was more familiar had faded away in the London atmosphere, that he was able to see so clearly whatever was poetic and picturesque in ancient legends and visions. Madonna, Magdalene, Damoiselle, Angel, they all became lovable and familiar phantoms to him, forms of feeling. But as life wore on, 
he more and more felt their unreality. And after the death of a youth he loved, Oliver Maddox Brown, in 1874, there was an increasing plaintiveness in his tone which made his friends feel anxious. In 1875 he wrote a sonnet, which his friend Dan Reuther set to music, and gave me leave to print it in a piece I was writing, The Angel of Death. Knowst thou not at the fall of the leaf how the heart feels a languid grief laid on it for covering, and how sleep seems a goodly thing in autumn at the fall of the leaf, and how the swift beat of the brain falters because it is in vain in autumn at the fall of the leaf knowest thou not and how the chief of joys seems not to suffer pain knowest thou not at the fall of the leaf how the soul feels like a dried sheaf bound up at last for harvesting and how death seems a comely thing in autumn at the fall of the leaf Rossetti had an affection for his pictures, they were his children, and every one surrounded with personal associations and cherished memories. His pigments were mixed with his heart's blood. After I had purchased two of his pictures, he wrote to me to come and dine with Maddox Brown and Dr. Gordon Hake, whose poetry we both admired, and begged me to bring the pictures. When I came, he received me as if I had become his kinsman, and handled the dear little things as if they were his long-lost children. He had not seen them for a good many years. One day I told him I was going north and would stop to see the collection of Mr. Ray near Liverpool, which contained some of Rossetti's works. Incidentally, I remarked that some of my friends in America were interested in him, and I hoped that some of his pictures would find their way over there. He perhaps supposed that the Ray collections might be sold, and some of its Rossettis secured by me for American friends. At any rate, in a letter about other matters came this paragraph. If we had been longer together the other day, I might have mentioned a point connected with the question as to Ray's collection. This is the fact, important only to myself, that I should really regret the transportation for life of some half-dozen pictures which I should like to be visible and attainable at need. Of course, I only mention this as a personal feeling, but you will perceive it could not well be otherwise. This struck me at the time as more peculiar than it seems now, 1904. Among all my pictures, those by Rossetti have given me the most constant delight. The head of Jesus has become to me mystically sacred, Memories of my beloved friend who painted it, of the great artist and the brilliant authors whose features are visible in it, of that dearest heart that found in it her ideal, enable me in my old age to interpret the innumerable personal associations which have gone to create that ideal being, to which human hearts tenderly sing, Lover of my soul. It is droll to think that in 1867, Ruskin could speak of Burne Jones as almost derided. The artist presently made D.C.L. by Oxford, and ultimately a baronet. One day I found Burne Jones at work on a saint, for some church window. And I, almost a nihilist, he said smilingly. It was precisely that which made him so happy in such work. When a mind gets entirely outside of all creeds and superstitions, he can see them all with an impartial eye as varied expressions of human nature. They become folklore, mythology, variegated fauna and flora of the human heart and imagination. The harmony of the world was set in his heart, and I associate his genius with the wonderful decoration he gave to a piano made for a wealthy friend of his. On the lid is a muse leaning from an oriel of the blue sky. Beneath stands a poet musing. Between them is a scroll inscribed with a bit of old French, n'oubliez pas, motto of the owner's family. At another end of the lid is painted amid bay leaves the page of a book with illuminated letters, 
the lines being those of one of Dante's minor poems, beginning Fresca Rosa Novella. But these beauties are surpassed when the lid is lifted. Amid the strings which are exposed there is a drift of roses, as if blown into little heaps at the corners by the breath of music. On the interior surface is terra omniparens. Between the thorns and roses sits this most beautiful mother, naked and serene, with many babes around her. Above, beneath, around, amid the foliaceous, they are seen. Impish, cherubic, some engaged in the ingenuities of mischief, others in deeds of kindliness and love. Greed, avarice, cruelty, affection, prayer, in all their varieties are represented by these little faces and forms. Some nestle around the mother. One has fallen asleep in her lap. The fair mother never smiles nor frowns. She is impartial as the all-nourishing, patient earth she typifies. All the discords turn to harmonies in her eternal generation. Her impartial love waits on the good and the evil. She is one with the art that shares with great creating nature. The paintings of Burne Jones fascinated me in an especial way. It seemed as if each subject he touched had taken possession of him and selected the pigments of itself. One of his pictures, which I saw on the easel, the Wheel of Fortune, with terrible contrasts between those at the top and those beneath, impressed me so much that I ventured to ask him if he had any particular description of the goddess in mind. He said he would think about that, and soon afterward I received a note in which he said, You asked me on what my version of fortune is made. It was a question not easy to answer, I remember, for the first impulse and vision of a picture is not easy to analyze. I think I saw the wheel chiefly, and that something terrible was connected with the thought of it, the sphere and the spokes and tire, and that dread connected with its form was paramount in the first conception. It was said into my hearing, O oh, wheel, do you remember? So the wheel got its spirit and its victims, the lucky and unlucky, and the onlooker. Pre-Raphaelism, in naming its short-lived periodical The Germ, was conscious that it was initiative. But in their varied developments the brothers generally showed a tendency to free thought. Holman Hunt, who painted Christ legends so devoutly that it was said some pious ladies took prayer books when they went to his exhibitions, had peculiar conceptions of the gospel narratives which he studied minutely. It was so rare to find a gentleman of culture in London who, unless in holy orders, believed those narratives without allegorical or rationalistic interpretations, that Holman Hunt's talk was original. I think he may have been influenced by the Muslim faith, in whose atmosphere he resided so much. Muslims accept the gospel miracles literally, and skepticism is unknown among them. He got near to the hearts of the Bedouins, and his conversation about them was profoundly interesting. He discovered that there existed in Palestine a secret sect of Bedouin spiritualists, and was invited to one of their secret seances. He attended, but on finding that it was to open with a prayer to Satan, Shaitan, he left at once. As a demonologist I had to deplore the loss of that prayer, and class the scholarly artist with a lady in Hampshire who said to my friend Mrs. Rose Mary Crochet, Do you make your children cross themselves when they say the word Satan? I do. I think it's safer. Notwithstanding all that Christian painting, Holman Hunt was not the artist chosen to decorate churches. Most of such work was done by Burne Jones and William Morris, skeptics. The history of the introduction of Christianity into England was painted on panels in Manchester Town Hall by Maddox Brown, who believed in no form of Christianity. The seal of the London County Council was designed by Walker Crane, freethinker and socialist, with Ford Maddox Brown I was on terms of particular intimacy because of his sympathy with my religious heresies. I assisted at the marriages of his daughters, 
one to Franz Heufner, the musical critic, another to William Rossetti, and I conducted the funerals of his son and of himself. His quaint house in Fitzroy Square was long the weekly salon of unconventional artists and writers. On a single evening I have met there Turgenev, the Rossettis, Blinds, Stillmans, Holman Hunts, Alma Tademas, William Morris and his wife, Arthur Hughes, Woolner, Garnett, Burne Jones and his wife, Whistler, Ralston, the poets Allingham, Swinburne, Goss, Marston. If French artists or authors were in London, they generally found their way to Maddox Brown, who, though of English parentage, was born in France and trained in French art schools. In the happy household, the only son was Oliver, whose death in his twentieth year filled us all with dismay. His precocious genius had already made its mark in art and literature, and the sweetness of his spirit made him the beloved of all. Dante Rossetti loved him as if he were a son, and I shall never forget the agony in his face when he talked to me of Oliver just before my address at the funeral. Ford Maddox Brown, in his letter requesting my services at the funeral, expressed to me his disbelief of all theologies. But although without any of those hopes of future life in which believers find consolation, I never knew in all my ministry, whether among Methodists or Unitarians, more courage than was displayed by this devoted father under unexpected and terrible affliction. Stricken as by a thunderbolt, he was yet not shattered. He set himself to soothe the bereaved ones around him. He sustained them on his great heart, and he never faltered in his devotion to his art. The noble and beautiful life went on until, nineteen years later, we laid him at Finchley beside his son and wife. All the artists in London were mourners at that grave. Ford Maddox Brown never had an enemy in his life. I used to watch Maddox Brown's pictures as they grew, his distinctively poetic pictures such as The Corsair, The Parting of Romeo and Juliet, and King Lear, all full of refined feeling and sincerity, and at length the fruitage of his poetic in his historical work, represented in those wonderful paintings that glorify the Manchester Town Hall. The knowledge implied in those paintings, dealing with early epochs of British history, the perception at once of the moral, the national, and the picturesque aspect of history, and the mastery of detail in form and color, make those Manchester panels a national treasure. They are also a monument of the literary combined with the artistic scholarship which alone could have produced them. They are unique, and they show the artist was not to be labeled as of this or that school, but one who developed a school of his own. End of chapter 34, part 2《ハッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッチプリッ Chapter 35, Part 1 Artemis the Delicious, as Charles Reed called him, came to London in June 1866 and gave his piece in Egyptian Hall. The refined, delicate, intellectual countenance, the sweet, grave mouth, from which one might have expected philosophical lectures, retained their seriousness while listeners were convulsed with laughter. There was something magical about it. Every sentence was a surprise. He played on his audience as Liszt did on a piano, most easily when most effectively. Who can ever forget his attempt to stop his Italian pianist, account in his own country, but not much account in this, who went on playing loudly while he was trying to tell us an affecting incident that occurred near a small clump of trees shown on his panorama of the far west. The music stormed on. We could see only lips and arms pathetically moving till the piano suddenly ceased, and we heard, it was all we heard, 
and she fainted in reginald's arms his tricks had been attempted in many theaters but artemis ward was inimitable and all the time the man was dying never was american in london so beloved the savage club founded in eighteen fifty seven consisted of some half dozen writers of the plays who dined together every week in an old convent garden inn tom robertson their chief poked fun at them in one of his plays until one evening someone brought artemis there then everybody wanted to belong and the club entered on its larger career he was the life and soul of it yet all those brilliant articles in punch all those unforgettable dinners lasted but six months and the entertainments in egyptian hall only seven weeks when it was learned that the most delightful of men was wasting away under rapid consumption even while he was charming us the grief was inexpressible i was requested by a committee of americans to conduct the funeral of charles f brown artemis ward and never had a more difficult and sorrowful task for his unexpected death was a tragedy that almost unnerved me the chapel in kensal green cemetery was filled to its utmost capacity all the chief actors and actresses writers of plays literary men and women were present and sorrow was in every face from that time i enjoyed the friendship of many connected with the stage and became a member of the savage club possibly i am the only survivor of those who belonged to the club at that time when it was a simple affair we used to dine at ashley's which gave us a fair dinner for half a crown we dined early in order to attend some theatre all open to savages among them were able men who were writing adapting translating the plays that amused the masses of london george gross smith senior andrew halliday charles millward and henry s lay were always present henry irving occasionally but the soul of the club was tom robertson how we all loved that handsome witty comrade and what a joy was the first night of any play of his i happened to be at the head of the table when the following note was handed to me to the chairman of the savage club dearest of friends whoever you may be please inform the savage club that they shall be welcome at the production of my new play school at the prince of wales theatre this evening full dress not required a simple muslin and a rose in the hair will be sufficient ever yours t w r of course we all went and i think it was on that evening that his sister madge robertson mrs kendall hardly out of her girlhood first appeared on the stage the theatre was crowded the success immense we all gathered around robertson with felicitations because of the play and because his sister had given fine promise this was in eighteen sixty nine yet it was with that same play that the sorrows of robertson began for he was accused of having plagiarized from the ashenbrodel of benedicts we who knew robertson personally and his scrupulous honor were also familiar with his previous plays society ours cast play etc and recognized him in every line of school but robertson wrote to us of the club to meet him there and we came in a troubled mood he told us that while on an excursion with his wife in germany they went to a theatre in berlin and saw a play in which the fairy tale of cinderella was travestied in a modern plot he never saw the libretto and did not take anything at all from benedicts except the suggestion of utilizing the plot of cinderella in a play of modern life he said he had now obtained from germany a copy of ashenbrodel and had placed it with the libretto of school in the hands of john hollingshead from whom he would obtain a judicial decision we all approved his course and had confidence in hollingshead but tom's particular friend andrew halliday a playwright of much experience said tom we all know that those pretty and thoroughly english situations are yours and every bit of those witty dialogues the only question that can possibly arise would be whether the previous use of cinderella as a modern heroine should have been mentioned in your program cinderella was such a familiar figure of the christmas pantomimes that robertson supposed that there being no question of originality in the case so far as plot was concerned he could hardly have credited benedicts without unfairness to his own play nevertheless it was an error of judgment not to mention benedicts and hollingshead so decided while vindicating the originality of robertson's treatment of the tale 
while everybody else regarded the incident as closed and never thought of any serious blame attaching to robertson it was not the same with himself when he dined with us at the club there was less of his old mirth it was pitiful that while school was having a magnificent run and madge robertson having her first success the admirable author who had evoked the beautiful scenes should be himself inwardly a sort of cinderella in ashes however the benedict's affair was forgotten by the public southern made a great thing of robertson's david garrick and he went on writing fine plays m p home dreams shadow tree shift the nightingale but war on which he had put much patient and excellent work proved a sort of failure it was his first failure and told upon him also his wife an accomplished lady of german birth died for some time we had observed that he was in poor health but his death february eighteen seventy one in his forty-second year was a shock it was a heavy bereavement in theatrical circles he was a noble-hearted man and few english dramatists achieved so much excellent work in such a short time one of my earliest friendships in london was formed with william allingham a poet of too fine a strain for popularity my first knowledge of him was through emerson who read his wonderful poem the touchstone in the town hall at concord to the citizens who had assembled at the hour when john brown was executed in virginia the poem was supposed to be by emerson and went the rounds of the press with his name allingham was on the staff of fraser's magazine to which i too was a contributor allingham was in every way a charming man and we became attached to him he was as thoroughly versed in Emerson and Hawthorne and Thoreau and Dr. Holmes as if he had grown up in Boston. He was a rationalist without aggressiveness, able to recognize every poetic legend in Catholicism. He was on terms of intimate friendship with the Carlyles, Tennysons, Brownings, Rossettis, and the Pre-Raphaelists, all drawn to him by his exquisite poems he was a bachelor for some years after our arrival and we often had him at our house and when he was appointed to the customs office at lymington we greatly missed his friendly face i visited him there and once had with him a two days ramble on the coast his new residence was not far from tennyson farringford with whom he used to take long walks when froude gave up fraser eighteen seventy four allingham became the editor and we enjoyed his society as of old he married in that year helen patterson a well-known and admirable artist it was an ideal marriage in carlyle's last years mrs allingham desired to paint his portrait and mrs alexander carlyle who resided with her uncle undertook to secure her the opportunity the artist went at the appointed time carlyle presently entered and greeted her kindly but when a sketch of him was suggested he turned to leave mrs allingham would have fled but carlyle stood between her and the door so she stood trembling until the niece gave her an encouraging look the niece then persuaded him to come back and sit down and read his book which he did with a quiet growl or two he then appeared to forget the presence of the two ladies at the end of the hour he took a look at her watercolor sketch and when he saw his face so deftly drawn he became interested and invited her to come again she did so again and again perhaps a dozen times and he enjoyed these visits while she took the sketches he read or talked or dozed and this lady with her fine tact met all of his moods adding a pleasing episode in his declining life and painted many excellent portraits of him one of these i secured and it was the picture that brought me nearest to the last vision of my great friend on november second eighteen sixty seven a dinner was given in freemason hall to charles dickens about to visit america most of the men who were carrying on the literary dramatic and artistic work of london were present the ladies alas including miss dickens who strikingly resembled her father and her aunt miss hogarth were put off into a gallery after the fashion then lingering when dickens entered arm in arm with bulwer there was wild enthusiasm behind them walked lord chief justice cockburn small and pale and lord mayor with royal air lord houghton and sir charles russell next the royal academicians 
when lord leighton the chairman arose it was really the novelist bulwer we beheld figurehead of a past generation there was power in every line of his face but still something phantasmal he was curiously awkward in speech at the beginning a long drawl terminated by a jerk at which his head was bent forward till the back of it was seen his gesture in emphasizing anything was to stretch his hand straight out clasp the fingers tightly to the palm then draw it in under his arm lord leighton had not been selected by any snobbish sentiment it would have been difficult thackeray being dead to find any man more historically fit for the chairmanship than bulwer it stands pleasantly in my memory that i saw the old author at his best for as his speech proceeded his shining thought was unsheathed from the ungainly form and the queer gestures appeared expressive of individuality a score of times bulwer's speech was interrupted by cheers but when dickens arose he had to stand long while the shouts stormed upon him men leaped on chairs tossed up napkins waved glasses and decanters over their heads and there was a pressing up from the lower tables until dickens was girt about by a solid wall of friends as he stood there silent i watched his face it was flushed with excitement and those wonderful eyes flamed around like a searchlight had tennyson been there a poem might have been written more pathetic than the address of ulysses to his brave companions who had toiled and wrought with him when his purpose held to sail beyond the sunset dickens saw before him authors actors artists with whom in early days he had partaken humblest fare horace mayhew mark lemon walter thornbury westland marston tom taylor buckstone edmund yates g h lewes the sons of gerald and tom hood his own sons stood near as if witnesses to the career whose victories they had followed from the lowly beginning to this culmination when the storm of enthusiasm had quieted dickens tried to speak but could not the tears streamed down his face as he stood there looking on us in silence color and pallor alternating on his face sympathetic emotion passed through the hall when he presently began to say something though still faltering we gave our cheers but felt that the real eloquence of the evening had reached its climax in the silent tears of dickens there was much talk in the anteroom and it was late before the company left but outside a very large crowd of humble people were waiting to catch a glimpse of the great author and i remarked one aged woman who pressed forward and bowed her face upon his hand End of chapter 35, part 1chapter thirty five part two of autobiography memories and experiences volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana autobiography memories and experiences volume two by moncure conway chapter thirty five part two in eighteen seventy two the announcement that mark twain was to lecture in st george's hall caused a flutter of curiosity his reputation was wide in england but it appeared singular that instead of appearing like artemus ward and other american entertainers at egyptian hall or some popular place he should select the most fashionable hall in london and charge high prices for admission the hall was crowded with fashionable people in evening dress of whom few if any had ever seen mark he came on the platform in full dress with the air of a manager announcing a disappointment and stammered out apologies mr clemens had landed at liverpool and had fully hoped to reach london in time but etc the murmurs were deep and threatened to be loud when mark added that he was happy to say that mark twain was present and would now give his lecture loud applause and laughter greeted him and he proceeded to mention several subjects he had thought of for his lecture Quote, but since my arrival i have found the english people so frantic in their interest in the sandwich islands the sentence was cut short by an explosion of laughter Quote, but before describing the sandwich islands he resumed 
and that was the last we heard of the islands the lecture was brimful of amusing inventions of far western life given with admirable gravity and action after telling about a wild game of poker he suddenly became unctuous and added all that was long ago i never gamble now sotto voce unless i can make something by it so after a narrative about a duel he said in an exalted tone but i never fight duels now if a man insults me do i challenge that man oh no uplifting his eyes piously i take that man by the hand and with soft persuasive words lead him to a dimly lighted apartment and kill him the audience was in an ecstasy of delight and laughter from first to last our savage club gave mark a grand dinner it was not usual for us to come in evening dress and mark who was in full dress began with pardon these clothes after speaking of hyde park he got off a satire so bold that it quite escaped the englishman i admired that magnificent monument i e to the prince consort which will stand in all its beauty when the name it bears has crumbled into dust the impression was that this was a tribute to albert the good and i had my laugh arrested by the solemnity of those around me indeed one or two americans present with whom i spoke considered it a mere slip and that mark meant to say that the prince's fame would last after the monument had crumbled the death of mrs clemens at the villa di quarto florence announced as i write june nineteen o four brings to me cherished memories of my long friendship with her and mark twain i first really knew them in their beautiful home in hartford connecticut where i passed some happy days in eighteen seventy six the grounds with their gardens trees flowers were such as one might look for in surrey england as a result of centuries of culture but the house they surrounded represented the consummate american taste and art in showing me to my dainty room mark pointed out the various tubes for calling up servants coachmen firemen etc there's one somewhere for the police i believe he said peering around one morning when i was writing in my room mark walked softly in holding a letter Quote, here's a fellow who has for some time been trying to get my autograph under the pretense of business i have to answer his notes but am playing a game mrs clemens has been writing my replies but just for a change we want you to write one the brief note being dictated and signed s l clemens per m d c then directed mark went out with a triumphant smile in the afternoon when we were at billiards a boy of ten years came in with his autograph book and mark laid down his cue and carefully wrote his contribution every day we saw charles dudley warner and his wife near neighbors and in the evening rev dr twitchell came in in no country have i met a more delightful man in conversation than twitchell and his ministerial adventures if printed would add a rich volume to the library of american humor mrs clemens was not only beautiful but a gracious hostess her clear candid eyes saw everything her tact was perfect and if she entered the great strong mark in his stormiest mood would alight as if a gentle bird in her hand in eighteen seventy mark twain's reputation was mainly western and when he proposed to marry the daughter of mr jarvis langdon of elmira new york this gentleman as i have heard desired to know something about his personal character according to my informant mark sent mr langdon a long list of names and addresses adding Quote, any of these persons will certify that i have committed all the known crimes of course i do not vouch for the exactness of this anecdote mrs harriet beecher stowe was residing in hartford and one evening perhaps her birthday some young people made up a group of jarley waxworks for her amusement mark agreed to be the showman and we called on her under the pretext of my desire to have a talk with her the old lady was in fine spirits and glad to hear from me about the argyles and other english friends when she was startled by the invasion of costumed figures mark well advised concerning each character he was to introduce began with a knight in full armor saying as if aside bring on that tin shop then proceeded with a romance of this knight's gallant achievements 
it was all charming and i never forget the evident affection for mark felt by his neighbors when i sailed for england i carried with me for his london publishers the manuscript of tom sawyer i read it on the ship and then recognized that mark twain had entered on a larger literary field two or three years later clemens and his wife came to london and charles flower of avonbank mayor of stratford on avon begged me to bring them there for a visit mrs clemens was an ardent shakespearean and mark twain determined to give her a surprise he told her that we were going on a journey to epworth and persuaded me to connive with the joke by writing to charles flower not to meet us himself but send his carriage on arrival at the station we directed the driver to take us straight to the church when we entered and mrs clemens read on shakespeare's grave good friend for jesus sake forbear she started back exclaiming heavens where am i mark received her reproaches with an affluence of guilt but never did lady enjoy a visit more than that to avonbank mrs charles flower nee martineau took mrs clemens to her heart and contrived that every social or other attraction of that region should surround her at a dinner company given to these dear friends at inglewood our house in london mrs crashaw brought out a toy leaping frog which she had found in paris mark was more amused than i had ever seen him he got down on his hands and knees and followed the leaping automaton all about the room early in eighteen seventy nine i think i was in paris and when strolling along the champs elysees overtook mark twain we were both going to call on the american minister i asked mark what he was writing well he began it's about this a man sets out from home on a long journey to do some particular thing but he does everything except what he set out to do he and his family were at the hotel normandy to which i at once transferred my lodgings mark was working steadily indeed hard on a tramp abroad and i had the happiness of making myself useful to his wife in seeing paris in the evening he read us passages he had written and the tact and insight displayed by his wife in her comments were admirable he worked in the evening and could not go with us to theatres but on mardi gras about midnight he and i started out in a voiture and looked in on a dozen fancy balls bret hart i met now and then and we gave a large dinner party at hamlet house in his honour froude regarded him as the finest product of the far west and william black was always seeking to have him in his house or on his yacht bret hart's consulship at glasgow was a sort of joke william black told me that once when he was returning from a tour with hart as they slowly entered a city bret said what huge ugly place is this it is said black the city in which you have been council four years bret hart told my wife that he was coming to her next monday afternoon and she probably mentioned it to some friends but he did not come and when chancing to meet him i alluded to the disappointment he asked forgiveness and said i will come next monday even though i promise when i first made acquaintance with the london theatres eighteen sixty three buckstone was still holding the foremost place in that kind of transitional drama between farce and comedy of which warren in boston was the chief representative of course i could not tolerate the notion that anybody could equal warren my first love but i could not help admitting that buckstone was fairly the peer of burton indeed i think that he brought out more fully than burton the whole sense as well as fun of the serious family there were in london some half dozen clergymen that is of the english church who were theatre-goers and were troubled at the alienation of the stage from their profession they made a gallant effort to bridge the chasm by founding the church and stage guild i gladly responded to an invitation to unite in this movement and attended several of the reunions held in a hall in westminster a special effort was made to secure the attendance of those who might suppose themselves especially ostracized such as the ballet girls these all came dressed with a certain prudishness which amusingly contrasted with the decolletage of the clergyman's ladies but this did not prevent edmund yates from printing in the world a satire entitled virtue in tights 
i do not remember meeting any of the leading actors there and this may have had no more significance than the fact that they had no evenings for their dinner companies except sundays i think however there was among dramatists and leading actors fear of any such alliance at any rate i myself soon gave up my connection with the movement for fear of stage puritanization already the english theatre had none too much freedom the finest french plays had much of their pith removed to suit london and in fact the separation between church and state superficial under catholicism is a birthmark of protestantism the theatre by all dogmatic logic is the devil's pulpit but it is ethically valuable as the very organ by long evolution of that human nature which protestantism pronounces accursed the english theatre instead of suffering under the evil eye of religion had steadily developed human sympathies and principles it was worth going to the cheap theatres sadler's wells adelphi victoria shoreditch grand if only to see the villain joyous under his hurricane of hisses and the virtuous hero encouraged by exclamations recalling the methodist conventicle but in the higher ranks of dramatic art there had been developed a sort of composite character a mixture of drollery and pathos whose supreme expression is in our beloved joseph jefferson the master however had his forerunners and among these might be placed charles matthews he was a wonderful artist even in the old-fashioned comedies replete with cynicism he could here and there by an accent a look a slight gesture give a far-reaching touch of feeling at times one might almost suspect him of putting in gags to the old plays this however he never did there had grown up a public sentiment about charles matthews something like that felt about joseph jefferson in the fall of eighteen seventy two his engagement at the gaiety theatre in london was memorable although some of us went at first mainly from homage to the most venerable comedian of the time we continued to attend every play in his repertoire by fascination instead of being in decline he had matured like old wine his movement on the stage was like that of a youth the engagement was a continuous ovation it was supposed that it must have made him a millionaire and he had to issue a card which began mr charles matthews presents his compliments to the whole human race and begs to state that much as he loves his fellow creatures he finds it impossible to provide for the necessities of even the small population of london alone j l toole i knew personally and in his own home he was an amiable gentleman of general culture and in him one might recognize the many qualities of head and heart that went to the making of a unique comedian toole drew out tears of sympathy and of laughter simultaneously whatever the deficiencies of a piece he brought out all that was potential in his part with such finish that the figure remained with us as a new creation his success showed that in the line of art that touches every shade of fun-making from high comedy to fantastic farce perfect delicacy of both word and suggestion is necessary for the truest effect no actor in london was more beloved than toole i think the elegant drollery of toole did much to train londoners for recognition eighteen seventy seven of the exquisite touches of joseph jefferson in such pieces as lend me five shillings and the cricket on the hearth one afternoon i met robert browning on the street and he said i do not remember having had greater delight in a theatre than last night lady carnarvon sent me a request to share her box and see an american actor and i went without any expectation the play was rip van winkle and i found myself completely captivated by his acting the charm was of a kind entirely new to me william winter had accompanied jefferson to london his reputation as a dramatic critic led to his being given a dinner a number of americans being present towards the close of the dinner while the wines were still freely circulating a loud discussion sprang up at one end of the long table and being at the other end i could not hear what was said but observed winter gesticulating and some english journalists around him similarly excited i went up to find what was the matter and an englishman said 
mr winter spoke of the third act in rip van winkle in which jefferson alone appears confronting the specters in the mountains he said that the acting of jefferson in that act is the finest ever known on the stage and that none of us denied but then mr winter went on to declare that it was finer than any acting that ever would be seen on the stage through all time and because some of us hesitate to accept that forecast he thinks us all donkeys any further results from this curious issue were escaped by our getting a telling speech from winter and adjourning to see jefferson's corroboration of his friend's uncompromising dictum i had for some time written occasionally for the london daily news and in eighteen sixty eight was invited by the editor mr afterwards sir thomas walker to join his editorial staff i began this regular work in august eighteen sixty eight and usually wrote twice every week i was not restricted to any class of subjects but it was expected that i would keep the paper abreast of american thought and politics soon after i began work on the daily news a serious incident occurred the united states minister reverdy johnson having accepted an invitation to the sheffield cutler's feast sat at the same table with roebuck who after dinner made a venomous speech against the united states the general opinion among americans was that their minister should have left the room roebuck said that politics in america had been relegated to buccaneers and that the best citizens had withdrawn from all connection with politics this he repeated in a letter to the times when i had controverted this a worse incident occurred the city of liverpool offered the american minister a grand banquet which he accepted among the preparations for this function it was announced that among the guests was to appear mr laird the man who built the confederate cruiser alabama my article october eighteenth eighteen sixty eight though severe on roebuck was tender towards johnson and was genuinely meant to save him and the treaty he had made with the english government in settlement of the alabama matter the article raised a storm the london standard said shrewdly that their contemporary had exactly caught the accent of the worst examples of western journalism the liverpool papers declared that the dinner was to be politically neutral the misstep was made the result did not fall heavily on reverdy johnson for his ministerial career was doomed in any case along with the presidency of andrew johnson who appointed him nor did it fall upon laird and roebuck it fell upon england the treaty concluded with reverdy johnson was angrily rejected by the senate in april eighteen sixty nine i had the pleasure of writing in the daily news a hearty welcome for the new minister john lothrop motley no appointment could have been happier americans walked proudly no other american was more honored among serious readers and thinkers than motley in presence manners social accomplishments he was the ideal minister the misgivings about grant and they were many were cleared away by this one appointment we were now to have a new and nobler america during my life in london there were ten different american ministers to england and i knew them all concerning mr hay's career there i cannot speak for i returned to america soon after his arrival but surely none of the rest were received with such welcome as motley or parted with so sorrowfully the reputation of the united states never received a more damaging blow than that which humiliated and ultimately proved fatal to motley his wife and daughters were the finest types of american womanhood no receptions in europe were more elegant than those of the noble minister and his family and motley was assiduous as he was polite in all the functions of his office one morning when his removal was announced by cable i went to see him i found him alone in his office and his pallor frightened me his voice however was calm and when i desired to know whether he could name a time for some conversation with me on the removal he asked me to remain then but he could not understand the event he was left to amazement and conjecture he was not conscious of the slightest deviation from his instructions and could not readily bring himself to believe that the president was capable of sacrificing him because he was the friend of sumner who had defeated his grant's cuban scheme in my biographical introduction to motley's history of the dutch republic 
g. bell and sons i gave with the assistance of his daughters a careful sketch of motley and must resist the temptation to repeat it here among the pleasantest of my pilgrimages was one to the regions of shelley to his monument in christ church and the relics of him in boscombe house the great charm however of this excursion was due not to the dead poet but to one living sir henry taylor whose philippe van artevelde had excited enthusiasm among us at harvard he still held his position in the colonial office but passed half the year in his pretty cottage the roost at bournemouth one could hardly imagine a fitter environment for a poet lady taylor daughter of lord monteagle had wit as well as beauty and was rich in memories of the eminent people of her time there were also several daughters they were all gratified by responses from america to sir henry's works and had just been delighted by a visit from charles eliot norton lady taylor in her girlhood was a pet of wordsworth and the intimacy continued to the end of his life wordsworth she said rarely made a pleasant impression on visitors if a gentleman had come all the way from america to see him and he chanced at the time to be interested in the mending of an old glove he would go on for an hour about that glove he was very plain in appearance once when talking to his wife he said casually that was when as you know my dear i was better looking but my dear replied mrs wordsworth you were always very ugly a lady who took his portrait said she thought lichens were beginning to grow in his wrinkles lady taylor said that wordsworth had so long lived among the rocks and woods that his naturally rough visage gradually acquired the color of wood and stone and he might be almost mistaken for a part of the scenery there was a warm friendship between the taylors and the tennysons lady taylor told me several anecdotes about the laureate at a grand naval review she and a few other ladies had persuaded tennyson to go despite his dread of being observed in public when they were off on a boat tennyson turned to her and said with apparent distress i knew how it would be see that company on that yacht looking at us and we are looking at them returned lady taylor tennyson smiled and for the rest of the day enjoyed the scene sir henry walked with me to boscombe house several miles away it was a beautiful and soft autumnal afternoon and the way was through a pleasant landscape i never saw a man who had so much the look of the poet he was then about seventy but save for the white locks that fell around his handsome face the years had touched him gently he had entered the colonial office in eighteen twenty four and told me he had served under twenty-two foreign secretaries the one he liked best being lord aberdeen the first thing he remembered to have done in office was to prepare the materials for a speech by canning he had never gained money by his literary work and never thought of receiving any his six volumes were labors of love among the many typographical errors in the first edition of carlyle's autobiographical essays one amazed the old friends of sir henry taylor who was described as a man of masked vivacity no phrase could be more ludicrously inappropriate and none more appropriate than what carlyle really wrote marked veracity his grave and noble face snowy beard and fine figure had attracted the artists and i once saw a beautiful painting representing him as king lear beside cordelia sir henry had a warm friendship for carlyle and said he was the only living man of his acquaintance whose conversation equaled that of coleridge whom he had also known well sir henry's own conversation was i am sure quite equal to that of coleridge he spoke in a gentle tone and had no views to urge with reference to the agitations of the time occasionally he spoke as if all these contemporary affairs impressed him as distant dissolving views Quote, how few of those who at one time seemed to spread themselves over the country have now any sway at all over it i remember when the one power seemed to be scott no two met but to speak of the wizard of the north i knew several people who thought him greater than shakespeare seriously but now the young people read thackeray and dickens and think scott dull even byron has become tedious to the people with their tennyson and browning and coleridge lamb southey well they last better but their day of doom is coming wordsworth is one of the few who has gained with posterity 
his ode to immortality however is not so great as coleridge's on dejection but i am not a good reader i find my office occupation keeps off ill health better than anything else End quote. F. W. Newman, the guardian of John Sterling's children, informed me in 1863 that he had been told on good authority that the influence which carried Sterling into the clerical order was love. The kinsfolk of his bride elect demanded that he should be in some profession. He hated all professions and was not in health for any. Newman was convinced that Archdeacon Hare reconciled Sterling temporarily to the idea of a liberal Christianity, but when he, Sterling, first came to Clifton, quote, he was secretly already gone far beyond, end quote. These were Newman's words. A good many young skeptics have been led into holy orders by filial affection, and among these was a poet who seemed almost a reappearance of Sterling, namely Wathen Mark Wilkes Call. With him I enjoyed a certain intimacy, and he told me that, although he was a devotee of Shelley at the time of his graduation at Cambridge University, Coleridge opened for him a mystical vestibule into the church, 1843, by which the hopes of his parents were fulfilled. Call's particular difficulty had been the dogma of eternal punishment, but once inside, he found that he had been misled by Mr. Smoothed Away Coleridge in supposing that the odious doctrine was no longer insisted upon in the church. The story of Aquinas wrestling all night in prayer for the salvation of Satan gave birth to Call's Aquinas, one of the miraculous poems. The picture of the monk sitting all day as if stone till the sun went out, then flinging himself on the bare floor, is all touched with pigments of his own heart's blood. The grapple with that one dogma was followed by a revision of all, with the result that Call quietly retired from the English church. But he was to learn that the church of that period, though unable to make a man believe in a future hell, could do something towards inflicting anguish upon him in this life. He had a sister with whom he had enjoyed perfect intimacy, and who was sympathetic with his thoughts. She bequeathed to him guardianship of her two children, who loved and were beloved by him. When the testamentary nomination was made in the court of chancery, there was introduced a postscript from a private letter he had written indicating his descent from the creeds of the churches. The children of his sister, herself unorthodox, were thus given over to strange hands. This incident, profoundly mortifying in itself, was the means of spreading abroad his heresies, alienating friends and relatives, and causing sorrow to many. The retreat which he had hoped might be quiet was turned into a violent rupture with a past sweet in associations. But there followed the compensation. His spiritual and intellectual kindred sought him out. He enjoyed the friendship of the finest spirits of his time. Above all, he made the acquaintance of the one lady perhaps then living whom a very heretical providence might have trained to be his wife. It was indeed an ideal marriage. Mrs. Call was the daughter of the eminent Dr. Brabant of Bath, financial founder of the Westminster Review. That admirable and learned gentleman, whom I had the happiness of knowing, had taken the utmost care for the education of this beautiful daughter. Beautiful she was, even in advanced age. She was learned in Hebrew, Greek, German, and French. She and her father, as she told me, read together Strauss's Leben Jesu when it appeared, and Dr. Brabant resolved that it should be translated into English. She had made the acquaintance of Marion Evans, afterwards George Eliot. Miss Evans did not know ancient languages, but had studied German, and Miss Brabant invited her to work with her on the life of Jesus. While these two were thus in collaboration, Miss Brabant became the wife of C. C. Hennell, author of The Inquiry into the Origin of Christianity, which so influenced Theodore Parker. The translation of the Leban Jesu was then more than half finished, and the remainder was given over to Miss Evans, except that Mrs. Hennell continued to assist in notes requiring knowledge of Greek and Hebrew. Mrs. Hennell was happy and well-to-do, and by her private direction, the life of Jesus appeared with the name of Marion Evans alone, to the surprise of the latter. Mrs. Call thus had the intellectual training of being a wife of the two most scholarly freethinkers of England of that time, 
and while her opinion or criticism on grave themes carried weight with serious thinkers her womanly sentiment and delicate humor charmed them mrs call's first husband had two sisters one was sarah hannell who wrote many mystical religious works the other married charles bray of coventry they resided at rose hill coventry mr bray was the author of a work on the philosophy of necessity which had much interested emerson mrs bray wrote a little book for children on conduct manners and duties a book that ought to be in every home and school i know of no other book of the kind i remember well the happiness of my first visit to rose hill i went up on saturday morning and stayed over sunday on sunday after breakfast i was present at the usual religious service of the family whose members were mr and mrs bray and sarah hannell this service consisted of the rendering on the piano of handel's messiah the whole without words or singing it was a beautiful day the low windows opened on the flower garden and the landscape dressed in living green and blossoming trees there we sat souls who had passed through an era of storm and stress and left all prophetic and messianic beliefs but found in the oratorio hymns of an earth in travail after the triumphal close of handel's music had died away we all walked out and passing through the streets of old coventry visited the house where marion evans lived in loneliness till she was discovered by the braes the house was still named bird grove and the sweetest songster in that little grove had been emerson the braes told me much about her early life whose pathos and sorrow make the melancholy undertone of george eliot's works when we returned mrs bray showed me a sentence written by emerson in her notebook quote, if the law of love and justice have once entered our heart why need we seek any other End quote. to this she had added quote, emerson as he sat in the drawing-room window july twelfth eighteen forty eight end quote. sarah hannell brought out for me to copy a letter written to her by her sister immediately after emerson's visit yes we have had the great spirit amongst us and i feel as you do how much greater his thoughts which we had before have become from the corroboration they have received from his presence I have quite a grateful feeling that he has been under this roof though only for a few hours but alas we shall see his face no more he is rolling on the waves now towards home he said his wife insisted on being on the shore to meet him though they live twenty miles inland he was taking a rocking horse for his two little girls and a crossbow for his son and his eyes quite sparkled when he spoke of how much they would be grown in nine months my head was full of the preparations for our great juvenile fete on thursday when emerson's letter came to say he should be here at midnight to stay only till wednesday afternoon so i ran upstairs to put the best room in order and directly after in came mr and mrs flower and kate martineau of course they wanted to see emerson above all things and had invited him to stratford charles went to meet him at the station he looked around the drawing-room and said quote, coventry is a very nice place end quote. and the next morning was so very easy and pleasant that i wondered where all my awe had gone to he talked about indian mythology and stonehenge after breakfast in walked the flowers again they had set off at five and came to propose taking him back with them to stratford as they had found a note from him on reaching home expressing a wish to see shakespeare we were rather disconcerted as mary ann miss evans had just come and we meant to have a nice quiet day all to ourselves but it was plain emerson wished to see stratford and we thought it right he should so we all set off by train to leamington then in cars to stratford and had a most delightful ride we four in an open carriage from stratford again this was the pleasantest part of the day to us and he talked as if we had been old friends he was much struck with mary ann miss evans expressed his admiration many times to charles quote, that young lady has a calm serious soul End quote. he regretted very much he had no more time to stay among us he came home to tea with us and so he departed with much warmth pressing charles to go and see him in america 
it is well for us a great benign soul does not often come to disgust us with common life no that's a very false sentiment common life would not be common then it was a comfort the next day to find that hannah had been providing the needful for common life while we had been soaring aloft and that the cakes were made ready for the children at night the fete was most successful we had a fiddle and flute to make music and they danced on the grass end of chapter thirty five part two Chapter 35, Part 3 of Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Autobiography, Memories and Experiences, Volume 2 by Moncure Conway chapter thirty five part three i found that both emerson and george eliot cherished the remembrance of that bright day when emerson had talked a few moments with her while they were driving he suddenly said what one book do you value most she instantly answered rousseau's confessions he started then said so do i there is a point of sympathy between us at rose hill our evensong was that of the nightingale once more i wondered how any of the poets came to report its strain as melancholy shakespeare of course saw into this juliet finds the song of the lark melancholy for with the dawn romeo must leave glad is the note of the nightingale for it holds him by her side happy and merry were the larks when we walked to bird grove sunday but sad were they on monday when i parted from those friends if ever there was a cock crow over yesterday's sunrise it was mrs humphrey ward's robert ellesmere the plot is interesting enough but even that sadly provincial and as far as religious statements with their air of paradox they are the commonplaces of two generations before her romance was born i was glad to see on the new york stage a play made of the story better than the book the preaching was omitted Mrs. Robert Ellesmere turns her back on her ritualistic adviser, as any sensible English lady who loved her husband would do. Robert Ellesmere is seen out on the lawn recovering health from the sunshine, especially that of his wife's affection and sympathy, and everybody was happy except the author, indignant that her gospel should be made a play. In Robert Ellesmere, there is one piece of originality, the country squire. Until Mrs. Ward's time, i had not seen nor had it entered into the heart of man to conceive of an infidel spending many years writing a treatise on st john's gospel persuading a skeptical clergyman to continue preaching the dogmas they both hate and also treating his tenants with brutality what is a double-headed girl and a sideshow to that it is evident that mrs humphrey ward had never really known a free thinker and it is marvelous that she could have evolved such a chimera from her inner consciousness when around her were refined and scholarly free thinkers like call mill frederick harrison leslie stephen john morley the sensation produced by the book was largely caused by the fact that the writer was a granddaughter of the great dr arnold that she was the daughter of the reverend thomas arnold who had journeyed to romanism and that she was the niece of matthew arnold she was therefore the completion of a picturesque family career and we could all read between the lines revelations in accordance with our arnold theories mrs humphrey ward's other novels i valued highly but on listening to her lecture to the unitarians some years ago i concluded that in religious matters she had become the victim first of her heredity and secondly of her robert ellesmere among the americans whom i used to meet occasionally was william james stillman as consul at rome and at crete and as the hero of the romantic expedition to hungary to secure for kossuth the crown jewels hid by the king stillman had a peculiar reputation in london especially in the circle of the rossettis who combined radical ideas about european affairs with artistic ideas of which this american was a cultured and critical interpreter 
when in london he attended the weekly receptions of maddox brown i used to feel proud that harvard's literary men should be represented in the capitals of europe by a high-minded gentleman who at the same time was an enthusiast in art studies and a master of english stillman was a thorough american his tall slender form his pale and delicate face his eager movement were those of the well-bred american and though he was intellectually a unique product of our country he was one of our few foreign agents who had carried republican ideas into his official relations i had a little controversy with stillman in the pall mall gazette in which appeared a serious editorial article appreciating highly my little book entitled republican superstitions i had opposed the bicameral legislative system and maintained that it had not worked well in the united states stillman vindicated the senate and for once in his life took the conventional view it was however all amicable although we were always friendly i did not find him much given to conversation he had many interesting incidents and adventures to tell drawn from his own experience rarely from books and was not so entertaining when drawn into argument my wife and i knew the beautiful greek lady who became the second mrs stillman all that survived of artistic and classic greece had found its way to london and there was something picturesque in the fact that the flower of that fine circle should become the prize of the scholar who so thoroughly appreciated the art and literature of that race among my pleasant recollections were entertainments at the house of dr harley in harley street my friend mrs alec tweedy well known by her brilliant writings has written a sketch of her father's life george harley f r s or the life of a london physician mrs tweedy developed her wit when she was hardly out of girlhood when we were invited to the harleys we felt sure of witnessing some pretty play got up by this youthful dame who possessed varieties of talent assisted by the large ideas of her father the admirable physician understood human nature spiritual and physical in a way that amounted to genius at the harley entertainments the guests passed from the play and mirth of the drawing-rooms to gather at the top of the house where the doctor and his microscopes were revealing wonders dr harley's information about the scientific men and his appreciation of precisely what each had contributed to knowledge was marvellous he smiled at the way in which my friend alexander ireland had accepted the rumour that robert chambers wrote the vestiges of creation let him go to the chambers publishing house in edinburgh and ask to see the manuscripts of that book he will find it all there and in the handwriting of mr page w s gilbert seemed to me the only english writer who could surprise and delight both cultured and uncultured people with absurdities full of sense and coquetries without vulgarity i remember william froude saying after witnessing the pirates of penzance that the charm was the way in which our moral notions were mixed up gilbert's fresh blond face and frank expression were pleasant to meet i first met him at west house the residence of our american-born academician george boughton where he was lionized more than he liked he was quick in his movements and talk and i remember hearing from him a double d d when some friend told him that pinafore was running at a half dozen theaters in new york from that pactolus streaming to the managerial pirates in america not even a silver sand grain had reached gilbert we used to have a good deal of talk about gilbert at the savage club the real founder of our club our beloved tom robertson had also founded the dramatic career of gilbert he had recognized gilbert's genius before the briefless barrister had any ambition beyond writing for magazines and persuaded him to undertake a christmas piece for st james's theatre wanted in two weeks a privately circulated pamphlet concerning gilbert written by henrietta hodson excited much amusement in theatrical circles the witty and pretty actress was a universal favorite she had shown herself a real artist in various characters among others as ariel when along with her brilliant interpretation she invented the scene of swimming through artistically contrived blue waves that was at the new royalty theatre i think that after her marriage with henry labouchere she became lessee of that theatre and her quarrel with gilbert led to the pamphlet 
the wit and humor of it were so exquisite the delicate caricature of gilbert so amusing without bitterness that her husband was credited with it by a good many but those best acquainted with her did not believe la Bruchere equal to the charming exaggeration she had learned she said that gilbert had quarreled with every actor and actress he had anything to do with and when she was about to work with him resolved to be the exception to that rule when he complained that a statue had just been set up for shakespeare while none yet existed for himself she had declared that the stupid world would presently awaken to his merits when he told her that he had recently sent madge robertson weeping to her room she said that it was a proof of the weakness of the human mind that anybody should oppose him in anything i have not the pamphlet and but vaguely remember its artistic raillery nobody took it au pied de la lettre and gilbert was not harmed by it i had a great delight of being present at the first night of the sorcerer at the opera comique the main importance of that event in the anticipations of the savage club was that our youthful george grossmith was to make his professional debut in the title role nothing ever produced even by that combination gilbert sullivan george grossmith jr surpassed the effect of that evening i have found good critics who think with me that the sorcerer is the best of the gilbert sullivan operettas and yet it had not the long runs of pinafore and patience perhaps it was because grossmith acquired such fame that Dorley cart could not keep him and no other sorcerer was possible ah what exquisite theatrical evenings we had in those days with buckstone tool lionel bro the melons Vizens, bancrofts kendall's terry's the mrs hodson oliver everard farron to name only a few the number of brilliant actresses in those days not only on the stage but performing in private convinced me that there is a potential actress in nearly every well-bred english woman i was among the early members of the urban club which used to meet in st john's gate also of the savage seville century london pen and pencil new vagabonds bedford park and browning clubs and my wife and i were among the founders of the club for ladies and gentlemen which developed into the albemarle club but the club that most interested me was the omar khayyam to which i still belong it would require many pages to tell my delightful memories of my brother omarites to whom is dedicated my book on solomon and solomonic literature edward clodd the admirable banker who began his literary career with a book on the childhood of the world grew rapidly into the leadership in such studies which he now occupies although i must omit much a pilgrimage we made to the grave of edward fitzgerald cannot be forgotten our beloved artist simpson being in persia traveled a long journey to visit the tomb of omar khayyam at nayashapur the poet's hope was that he might be buried where the north wind might scatter rose leaves on his grave and there simpson found the rose tree often replanted in the centuries and brought slips of it to london Thistleton Dyer grafted them on an English stock in Kew Gardens, and we planted two little shoots on the grave of Fitzgerald at Bulge, Suffolk. Claude Simpson, Clement Shorter, and Edmund Goss were of the party. The rector of Debach and of Bulge, Reverend Charles Hume, wrote to Claude, quote, I should much prefer the proposed plate of inscription having no reference to a heathen philosopher which i cannot but think out of place in a christian churchyard End quote. despite these italics the plate was carried and the rev mr doughty a neighboring rector executor of fitzgerald met us and made an excellent speech he spoke for miss holm white of bulge hall who was present with several other lovely young ladies who undertook to take care of our rose trees standing out there near the old church october seventh eighteen ninety three beside the grave of the poet on whose mind was grafted the quatrains of omar we planted the grafts simpson told us the story of his pilgrimage to nashapur goss read a poem and all of us made speeches then we went over to claude's country homestead at aldeburgh strafford house and remained from that saturday till monday 
fill in from your imagination o oh my reader the charm and beauty of this function and of our symposia at stratford and yet something will remain for any laureate who can see the mystical beauty of the persian rosa centifolia now annually flowering in bulg churchyard few dissenting ministers in england avowed unorthodox beliefs and in eighteen seventy six the ablest of them j allinson picton even suffered persecution he was of gentle birth in the english sense possessed some means and being more interested in national than in theological questions left the pulpit for parliament picton's particular friend edward clodd began about that time inviting some of us to sunday evening symposia at his house in london rosemont we usually had eslin carpenter now professor in oxford manchester college rev mark wilkes and always picton i remember those evenings at rosemont as a time when we grew in after years picton gave us some admirable discourses at south place chapel which indeed became for several able men the only place in london in which they could find perfect freedom and an intelligent audience in eighteen ninety three when we opened the thomas paine exhibition in our chapel picton made a striking address he told us that his attention was first called to Payne by Disraeli. He, Picton, had made a speech in the House of Commons, and Disraeli arose and said the speech was all taken from Thomas Paine's Rights of Man, whereupon he concluded that Paine must have been a man of sense, and began reading him, and with satisfaction. He alluded to a bit of Paine's brain exhibited, now in my possession and spoke of the thought that once flashed through that substance darkened by time and influenced the political history and conditions of europe and america picton is a writer of power but singularly unambitious and has published little sunday evening was also the time when george eliot and g h lewes received their friends their residence the priory was a quaint old house inside a pleasant little garden through which one passed to the door the library of mr lewes on the ground floor was suggestive of work the sitting-room where their friends were received though elegant was not richly furnished i was not intimate in the house and went but rarely i had told robert browning that i would like to see george eliot and a general invitation for sunday evening came she received me pleasantly and we had some conversation about emerson whom she held in warm remembrance but i think it was the man rather than the author she esteemed although george henry lewes did much to further my literary aims printing my articles in his fortnightly review and engaging me on the pall mall gazette with which he was at first connected i did not find him personally attractive i can never consider a countenance homely if there is in it both sweetness and light but with all his talent lewes did not have a pleasing voice nor any look of sensibility there was however always a quick attention on his part and deference whenever george eliot said anything on my first evening at the priory those present were all leading positivists with the exception of john morley who was a cautious sympathizer with them once or twice herbert spencer was present but i was disappointed in not finding there robert browning probably they arranged for private talks with browning the only woman i ever met at the priory was madame bodichon whose acquaintance i had made in cincinnati she was english though her deceased husband was a foreigner a friend of mrs browning and very attractive i was told that after the social disfavor with which george eliot's irregular marriage was received was put to confusion by her literary renown a number of ladies of high position had sought her acquaintance without success she maintained her old friendship with mrs bray of coventry and mrs call whether george eliot suffered much by separation from general society i do not know but i always feel that her writings suffered by it strong and interesting as her female characters are few seem drawn from living models although much was said after charles reed's death of his unqualified faith in conventional dogmas i can hardly suppress a suspicion that it was a sort of hoax 
i met him occasionally at the sunday evening companies of actors and actresses where he was a lion and seemingly a thorough man of the world he was ruddy but had the look of a preoccupied man and rarely smiled i called on him once at his house nabbath's vineyard at the desire of my friend mrs lander nay davenport in connection with a theatrical project of hers he sat at a table in the corner of a large dingy room before him the big brown sheets of a play he was writing our matter was discussed in a business-like way but i could not harmonize the man with his novels which indicate so much humor and delicate sentiment several times he was with us at our special savage club dinners when we entertained mark twain i sat near reed and when mark began his speech in his humorous drawling way the novelist said to those around him oh that accent that accent he presently listened with interest but did not laugh with the rest i never met him in the house of any literary men and have an impression that the enthusiasm with which americans read christy johnson peg wolfington and some of reed's larger novels was unknown in london winwood reed cousin of charles was much more talked of among men of letters the little i saw of him enabled me to understand why he was so greatly beloved by all who enjoyed his friendship his last work the outcast was felt by those who saw the admirable man wasting away with rapid consumption to be a fearful tragedy depicted by a fine genius from his own agonies winwood reed was only thirty-seven when he died eighteen seventy five but few at twice that age have known so much of life and of the world his wide travels were an accompaniment of his pilgrimage through the creeds to his religion of theologic nihilism all efforts of friends relatives publishers to induce him not to publish his religious views were in vain because the views were religious he believed that the real civilization and the development of man were impossible until the beliefs in christianity in a personal god and in personal immortality had ceased such beliefs he declared bound the human mind and energies to a system that consecrated the evils of nature which could not possibly be the work of a benevolent deity and mankind could not put forth their genius in perfect freedom while the present life was regarded as subordinate to another in all this i am impressed by two things first the closeness with which winwood followed the greek myth that when prometheus brought heavenly fire to man that he might be a god and creator of his own world he first of all took away man's belief in immortality it is said prometheus left man the hope but perhaps that was a later addition the second thing i find striking is that the whole enthusiasm of winwood's siege against the fundamental beliefs is based on his perfect faith in progress but faith in progress is fundamentally belief in god winwood reed's two books impressed me with the belief that but for the ghoul consumption he might have proved heir to the scepter of carlyle and humanized it with more art his fine personality was revealed to me by my dear friends dr and mrs humphrey sandwith members of my congregation in whose house winwood died dr sandwith who had known him at college and his wife persuaded him when his illness began to reside in their villa at wimbledon there he had all the alleviations that medical science could bring there endowed with trees the invalid seated on the veranda looked forth on the golden gorse of the common listened to the merry laughter of children and was soothed by songs of the nightingale and the skylark but one unpleasant incident marred the passing of winwood reed his two loving friends could not leave him when he got very low but nursed him themselves the pain had ceased his mind was serene and clear one afternoon when he was sweetly sleeping they strolled into the garden for a few moments and what was their horror on their return to find a fanatical woman at winwood's bedside exhorting the helpless man to flee from the wrath to come dr sandwith and his wife told me that they managed to eject the wretched creature without trouble but the incident gave them their first glimpse into the salvationist insanity probably the experience did not harm winwood who had especially studied the varieties of pious fanaticism in africa and the east 
i do not blame those poor creatures who disregard all decency in trying to save souls from hell these doctrinal nightmares are to them frightful realities sir james stephen told me that the last time he visited carlisle not long before his death the aged man looked into the large coal fire and said how would it feel for a man to be put into a vast fire like that for all eternity my father who had as strong a brain as any man i ever knew believed with absolute certitude that the greater number of human beings will suffer in literal fire without any end at all sir james said that he wondered whether at last the old man's intellect was giving away and merely said that he regarded such notions of the future as having sprung up in ages of frightful tortures and punishments by savage governments my own belief was that the remark was but a continuation by carlyle of the general revision of his past that went on in his last years when he had ceased to write he used to read over the german and other works which had influenced his mind and when he could no longer read and was not being read to his tenacious memory travelled over his early days when peter ibbotson and trilby appeared the world was astonished by the appearance of a new genius but those who knew du maurier personally were not surprised he was a beautiful kind of man dainty in even common talk so evidently a poetic being that his sketches in punch always appeared to me to suggest further resources everybody loved him he passed years in those delineations of english society whose satire was so sweet that it never made an enemy while the french blood was sufficiently evident in his personal appearance and in the extraordinary quickness of his perceptions one could not converse with him without being struck by the purity of his english his complexion was fresh and fair but without the english ruddiness with his frankness there was a charming finesse and one felt in him a refinement rare even in the great english writers it may be doubted whether any of du maurier's english or american contemporaries could have written a defence of nudity in art so plain spoken as that in trilby without calling mrs grundy to her guns as this exquisite artist put it the statement hardly appeared paradoxical dr maurier was fortunate in his marriage but his income was not large they had a pretty home in hampstead the interior being harmoniously beautiful there was nothing that i can recall in the decorations indicating that he or his wife had caught the fancy of his friends for queen anne furniture or morris wallpapers my personal knowledge of du maurier was really derived from occasional entertainments of small companies in his house and especially from a memorable one in which he spontaneously gave us an artistic diversion he brought out a large easel covered with layers of paper and with a stick of charcoal in his hand began in his humorously grave way to tell us some incident now and then he made a mark on the paper as if by unconscious gesture hardly looking at it but little by little we saw coming out of these accumulated strokes a face that evoked a burst of laughter i regret my inability to remember du maurier's delicious little fable of which i find no written note my impression is that we first saw a despairing and disheveled artist without work an untouched canvas before him next a matron with flourishing gown and bonnet attended by a young addition of herself whose portrait she desired presently unless i'm mistaken the shrinking maiden and the artist making eyes at each other while the work is going on i rather think to the distress of the wealthy matron who means her daughter to marry a lord though my impressions are vague about the tale i remember well the delight and laughter of all present and the charm of the man as well as the fascination of the story-teller with the subtle surprises touched in here and there as if unintentionally the only wonder is that from such an imagination the incomparable novels did not flower long before end of chapter thirty five part three